Section One of The Medici, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in May 2020. The Medici, Volume Two by G. F. Young. Chapter 19. Catherine de Medici, Part One. Born 1519. Married, 1533. Died, 1589. 1. The first forty years of her life. Modern history has requirements of which former generations seldom dreamt. In former days, the method which as a rule commended itself to both writer and reader was one by which characters in history were labelled as bad or good, and little attempt made at any further discrimination. The fact was lost sight of that, since real characters are more complex than this, such a method produces figures unlike any men or women who ever lived, and so gives us distorted views of history. Again, while much more information is available now than formerly, it is also coming to be seen that actions belonging to a bygone age must be judged upon a different principle to that hitherto en vogue. Thus, a writer of our time has pointed out that, while with a former generation it was natural to lavish indiscriminate condemnation upon all characters in history who took a different course to that which would now be taken by any one, Modern conceptions of the proper attitude of mind in one who deals with history require him to strive to enter impartially to the feelings of all his characters. In order to avoid that tendency to create impossible figures which is so severely condemned by the modern view of the matter, and arrive at that more discriminate estimate of historical characters now deemed imperative, Probably no requirement is more essential than that we should put ourselves mentally into the atmosphere of the time, and carefully guard against judging such characters by the standards of our own age, in which persons live and act under totally different conditions, instead of in relation to the opinions and conditions of their day. Looked at in the latter way, those who were in advance of the moral standard of their time, and those who were behind it, will both be correctly judged, but neither of them will be so if the standard employed is that of our own age. The foregoing considerations are more important in the case of Catherine de' Medici than perhaps of any other figure in history, for we have in her case an exceptional combination of incentives to the production of a fictitious character. In the first place, the marriage arranged for her by Clement the Seventh in his scheme for outwitting Charles the Fifth produced a rooted prejudice against her from the very first in the minds of the French, who felt that in her person the honour of the nation had received a grievous insult, it being a galling wound to French amour propre that the son of their king should marry one of bourgeois extraction. This feeling steadily increased among the French people, whose favourite name for her was the Italian woman, growing from prejudice into hatred, and causing the contemporary French writers to credit her with numberless crimes, so that in fact, says a modern French writer, it would seem from them that scarcely any crime could be committed in any part of France without it being attributed in some way to Catherine de' Medici. The result has been to make any reliable account of her actions practically unobtainable from them. But this is not all. The intense prejudice caused by this wound to national pride would alone have sufficed to furnish us with a record from the contemporary French writers, calculated to produce a very false picture of the person concerned but to this were subsequently added two other influences tending in the same direction, that is, the effects of a bitter religious conflict calling forth animosities which knew no bounds in attributing every crime and evil motive to religious opponents, and the delight in tales of crime felt to an unusual degree by the people of that age. 
seldom have three such powerful inducements for the production of a fictitious character be combined in connection with one individual and this combination of national prejudice religious animosity and appetite for sensation produced a result in the case of catherine de medici surpassing anything of the kind to be seen elsewhere the consequence has been that a character has been presented to us which was a radical impossibility we were asked to believe that it was possible for a woman to have governed an important state for nearly thirty years enacted many excellent measures for the better administration of justice intervened constantly between enemies anxious to destroy each other been throughout life a peacemaker saved the lives of persons who were her opponents been greatly liked by various persons of unimpeachable character and been at the end of her life sufficiently respected by the people of paris even when they were in a state of violent rebellion to be able to pass unprotected through the barricaded streets when no one else could do so and yet at the same time to have been a prodigy of duplicity and crime committing murders wholesale and such a combination being so completely incongruous it is not surprising that we find a modern french writer saying catherine de medici has been so greatly disfigured as to make her so to say unrecognizable a phantasmagoric personage the gradual publication however of the state papers of various countries including catherine's own voluminous correspondence is slowly dispelling the errors which this cloud of misrepresentation has gathered round her with the result that the traditional view about her is slowly giving place to a more correct estimate of her character and actions three things are necessary in order to estimate the character of catherine de medici correctly first to measure sixteenth-century actions by sixteenth-century standards of thought and opinion and not by those of the twentieth century second to give the same weight to facts which tell in her favour as to those which tell against her as would be done in a court of law third to look with very close scrutiny at any argument which urges that some action of hers in itself praiseworthy should not be held to be so in her case since it was merely an artifice of duplicity and to require corroborative testimony of facts in support of all such statements the course commonly adopted has been the exact reverse of this it has been that of measuring her actions by the standard not of her time but of ours of giving full weight to and even exaggerating all that tells against her while giving little weight to actions telling in her favour on the ground that she was a mass of indifference or in some other way devoid of the feelings which ordinarily prompt such actions all of which is pure assumption and lastly where this course is inapplicable of declaring such actions to be due to duplicity all this has been done in order to avoid a certain dilemma which occurs in catherine's case caused by the fact that a person whom it is considered necessary to portray as a villain has to be credited with a number of actions incompatible with that hypothesis so that unless these are explained away there is produced a figure which is palpably an impossible one and yet after all this dilemma has not been avoided again and again by writer after writer we find catherine called an enigma a paradox a mystery or declared to unite in her character the most discordant and contradictory qualities and even writers who have been most painstaking in investigating the details of her life have none the less felt themselves impelled to use these terms in an endeavour to escape from this dilemma but an impossible character is not made less impossible by calling it an enigma so that this still leaves the dilemma unremoved catherine de medici is an enigma only to those who start from the basis that she was a villain and having taken that as an axiom then find however much is explained away that there remain various qualities in her and actions done by her 
which fits so ill with that axiom that all attempt to reconcile the two has to be abandoned. But those who, divesting their minds of the preconceived ideas implanted by the biased writers of a time of abnormally bitter conflict, judge Catherine's character as it is now revealed in the fuller light available from the state papers of various countries, who measure her actions in due relation to the conditions and standards of her time, and lastly, who take equally into consideration the light shades with the dark, will find Catherine de' Medici no enigma at all, but a character remarkable indeed for energy, ability, and other striking qualities, but yet thoroughly harmonious and easy to understand. Not perhaps so well adapted for sensational methods of treatment, but at all events real, a living character, not an impossible phantom. It is remarkable to see in how many ways Catherine shows herself a true representative of the family of whose elder branch she was the last descendant. The abnormal ability and energy, the love of learning, fondness for field sports, artistic taste, common sense, power to sway those brought into contact with her, and love of ruling, due to the conscious possession of superior powers, all these characteristics which had been prominent in her ancestors appear again in fullest strength in her. It is also evident that she had much of that same many-sided character which we have seen recorded of in her great-grandfather Lorenzo the Magnificent, and seen described as so difficult for the northern races of Europe to understand, and as often causing him, too, to be styled by them, with as little reason, an enigma and a mystery. Coming to other points more strictly personal to herself, the first we notice is that she was undoubtedly cold and unimpassioned. And she had need to be so, if she was to survive to the age of seventy in a position of authority in such a stormy time as was hers. In this she is the counterpart of two other prominent women of her age, Queen Elizabeth of England and Jeanne d'Albret, Queen of Navarre. At the same time it may be doubted whether Catherine had as much of this quality as either of the other two, and whether a great part of the appearance which she presented, of a cold and unimpassioned nature, was not due to her abnormal power of self-control. It is admitted by all authorities that her love for her husband, Henry II, was intense, and that his indifference to her was the great grief of her life, while her affection, in her youth for the nuns of the Murate convent, in middle age for her son Henry, and in old age for her daughter-in-law Louise de Vaudemont, and her granddaughter Christine of Lorraine, shows that she was not incapable of such feelings. Many accounts credit her with marked love for her children, but, with the exception of her son Henry, it may be doubted whether these statements are not mere courtly flatteries. She was exceedingly careful of her children's health and training, but there it would seem to have ended, and she at times treated them with great harshness. But most prominent of all the features in Catherine's character were the allied qualities of prudence and self-control. This self-control was in her developed to a degree which bordered upon the marvellous, being such as has been seen in few other individuals. It is constantly referred to as amazing all around her. With it was combined a no less frequently mentioned prudence, by which term the writers of that day implied a good deal more than the meaning which we now attach to it. But in her it was, so to say, a prudence run mad, a prudence which had been allowed to absorb all other faculties. All thoughts, all feelings, all desires were, with an iron will, drilled into subjection to this prudence, this unsleeping, incessant care at all times, in all places, under all circumstances, to look, to do, and to speak only that which would advance the matter in hand. Her daughter, the Princess Marguerite, who stood in much awe of her, speaks of her as, she from whose soul prudence was never parted, 
who moderated her actions according to her desire, demonstrating plainly that the discreet person doeth nothing he willeth not to do. This feature in Catherine's character was the outcome, as will be seen, of an unusually severe trial, lasting for many years. She was not always like this, but she grew to be so under the peculiar conditions of her life from the age of twenty to that of forty. And it is this rigid prudence and self-control which makes us feel her to be so unhuman. She appears to have, in one sense, neither faults nor virtues, and to be as flawless and as unattractive as a bar of finely tempered steel. As has been said, it was the force of dire conditions which fashioned Catherine the emotional girl, possessed of sweetness of disposition and amiable ways, into Catherine the prudent and icy woman. But though it was her misfortune, not her fault, it gave her a characteristic which is perhaps most of all resented by mankind. It is, however, a mistake to imagine that Catherine was a person of stone. The best judges of her conduct were not the French, but the ambassadors of other powers living at the court of France, especially those of Venice, and from the recently published Venetian state papers and the very full reports which the Venetian ambassadors in succession furnished to their government of all these events, we obtain invaluable information by which to judge of all such points. Thus, for instance, on this point of her outward appearance of indifference and want of feeling, the Venetian ambassador, Giovanni Correr, in one of his reports to his government, writes, I know that she hath often been found weeping in her chamber, but she at once dried her eyes and dissembled her sadness, and in order to mislead those who estimated the state of affairs by the expression of her countenance, she wore a calm and joyous aspect when abroad. Although we find some, even among those Protestant writers who hated her with a rancorous hatred, speaking of her astonishing evenness of temper, she had in reality a hot, though not revengeful, temper. But her abnormal power of self-control never suffered this to appear when it would interfere in any way with her object. When, however, this was not the case, her wrath could show itself in a manner terrifying to those around her. The Princess Marguerite, describing one of these outbursts, says, Elle jetait feu, et disait tout ce qu'une colère au trait et démesuré peut jeter dehors. Another trait in Catherine, inherited from ancestors who were Florentine citizens, among whom this quality was, and still is, greatly prized, was a never-failing bonhomie, a spirit always ready with a laugh, a joke, and a cheerful countenance, even in the midst of hardships and misfortunes. Her attainments were of a high order. She was well-read and accomplished, she brought to France that love of learning and art inherent in her family, she took a special interest in science, while evidence of her innate artistic taste was, in after years, furnished by Fontainebleau, Chenonceau, the Louvre, the Tuileries, and every other palace which she occupied. Other qualities which we find constantly mentioned are her great personal courage, power of enduring physical pain without showing any sign, and agreeable manners. The remaining features of her character will be more conveniently considered when we come to look at her as ruler of France. As regards her appearance, the chief points which we find noted by contemporary historians are her broad forehead, fine hair, fine eyes, beautiful hands, and tall, graceful figure. Her life divides itself into three well-marked periods, that is, fourteen years of girlhood, twenty-six years of married life, and thirty years of widowhood, during the greater part of which she was the all-powerful Queen Regent of France. End of section one. Section two of The Medici, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in May 2020. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 19. Catherine de' Medici, Part 2. First Period, 1519-1533. Catherine, the only child of Lorenzo, Duke of Urbino, and his young wife, Madeleine de la Tour d'Auvergne, was born in the Medici Palace on the 13th April 1519, and at her baptism was given the names of Catherine Maria Romola. She is well called in history Catherine de' Medici, for while she was the last of that elder branch of the Medici which had had such a great career, in her all the mental capacity of her family, which her father and grandfather had failed to show, reappeared as strongly as ever, and in this its latest descendant Cosimo's branch showed no smallest sign of deterioration. When Catherine was born, her father, her mother, her grandmother, Alfonsina Orsini, and her father's aunt, Maddalena Cibo, all lay dying the two former at the Medici Palace, and the two latter at the villa of Careggi. Catherine's mother died a fortnight after her daughter's birth, and her father six days later, while Maddalena Cibo and Alfonsina Orsini both died shortly afterwards. The orphan baby was thus left without any near relations, except her aunt, Clarice Strozzi, who was in Rome, and she remained in charge of servants, a solitary little scion of the nearly extinguished family in that Medici palace, which had again become too large a house for so small a family. Ariosto, touched by the friendless condition of this lonely little flower, round which so many rough winds blew, wrote at this time regarding her, speaking as for Florence, Verdeggia un ramo sol con poca foglia, e fratema e speranza to sospesa se lo milanschi verno no lo mi taglia. Being the sole heiress of the possessions and claims of the Medici family, this baby girl was a small person of much importance. On her father's death, her distant relative, Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, came to Florence to take charge of the government and of herself. We have seen the far-reaching schemes which he formed regarding her future and that of the family, and the use that he would make of this orphan girl to advance the latter. And we have seen in what some of those schemes resulted. But we have now to look at Catherine herself, and at her life from the time when she first looked on the world from the windows of the Medici Palace in the Via Larga, Florence. Her childhood was passed in the midst of stormy episodes, the rage of furious mobs, the clash of arms and the sound of guns. When she was six months old she was taken to Rome, a difficult journey for a baby in those days, and performed by her probably in a pannier on a mule's back, and was placed by her grand-uncle, Leo X, in the charge of her aunt, Clarice Strozzi. She remained at Rome till she was six, by which time Cardinal Giulio had become Pope Clement VII, and the commotions were beginning which ended in the sack of the Vatican. As, therefore, Rome was becoming too disturbed a residence, she was, in 1525, sent back to Florence to her home in the Medici Palace, where she was placed under the charge of Cardinal Passerini, at that time governing Florence in the Medici interest, and in whose charge were also the two boys of sixteen and fourteen, Ippolito and Alessandro, the former much liked, but the latter cordially detested, by the six-year-old Catherine. For the next two years Catherine remained amidst these surroundings. Lessons in the various subjects then considered necessary for every well-born girl, occupying most of her time, varied by frequent battles with Alessandro, the quarrels between the two becoming at last so pronounced that Alessandro was sent away to live at the villa of Poggio a Cajano. Then, when Catherine was eight years old, there took place in Rome the catastrophe of 1527, 
and news reached florence that the papal city had been taken and sacked and awful horrors perpetrated and that the pope was being besieged in the castle of saint angelo the consternation in the medici palace was great especially as it was soon known that the signoria had assembled and were debating whether florence should revolt from pope clement and banish the medici family and that might mean death or at least much danger and hardship and the palace would almost certainly be plundered of everything by the mob as it was and to what city could they go since both rome and all places in the papal dominions and in the tuscan state would be barred to them these questions cardinal passerini sat discussing in much distress of mind with ippolito and alessandro on the nineteenth may fifteen twenty seven and catherine certainly listened and then their deliberations were broken in upon by catherine's capable and loud-voiced aunt clarice in the manner which we saw and they were bidden to depart without delay from florence but not the little duchessina as catherine was called for while the rest with their retainers in the utmost confusion and terror packed a few necessary things and made a hurried departure by the exit at the back of the palace into the via dei cinori and while the mob which had been for several hours collected in the via larga began to pour in two and plunder the palace she was ordered by the government to remain behind to be kept as a prisoner of the republic who intended to use her as a valuable hostage in the case of future difficulties with pope clement the terror suffered by a child of eight thus kept behind in the midst of such a scene of confusion in order to be immured amongst strangers as a prisoner was naturally great and we see what an impression it made upon catherine by her conduct three years later when bidden to leave the convent of the murate thus did catherine begin at an early age her apprenticeship to a trouble-tossed life she was first sent to the convent of Ognisanti and was kept there for six months. Thence she was removed suddenly by night, on the 7th December 1527, to the convent of Le Murate, on the opposite side of Florence, at the far end of the long Via Ghibellina, close under the walls of the city. The plague was at that time raging in Florence, and we read how this change of prison entailed on Catherine a long walk by night through the plague-stricken streets the convent of le murate the walled-up ones was the most important convent in florence being that patronized by all those ladies of the principal florentine families who took the veil and here catherine remained for nearly three years until she was eleven years old the chief points insisted upon in regard to her were that she was to be kept in safe custody that there was to be no communication allowed between her and any friends of her family in the city and that her education was to be duly attended to this point of catherine's education is one much discussed in the correspondence of the time and the nuns of the murate certainly appear to have done their part well in this respect for catherine though she left all compulsory education behind her at fourteen was one of the most highly educated women of her day the murate also prided itself on its teaching of deportment and polite behavior and in this respect no less than in learning catherine in her after-life did the nuns credit for almost every historian enlarges upon her pleasing and agreeable manners it is in this time spent at the murate that we have the first indications of catherine's character we are told by various writers who deal with her life as a girl of her kind and amiable ways and this seems borne out by the fact that the nuns of the murate a convent where there were notably many discords became extremely fond of her and long afterwards we find catherine on her side still cherishing kindly remembrances of them and writing to them constantly in the most affectionate terms in her letters written more than forty years later when she was queen regent of france she delights to recall the daily life of the convent and the beautiful garden with the arno flowing near it which she has not seen for all those years 
and lapses into poetry as she speaks of the view looking up the river saying monti superbi la cui fronte alpina fa di se contro i venti argini e sponda valle beate per cui donda in onda l'arno con passo signoril cammina here catherine spent the most peaceful time of her life though even during it there were rough winds blowing round her outside the walls of the murate for it was felt that her death as the last legitimate offspring of the elder branch of the medici was eminently desirable in the interests of the republic during nearly the whole of her last year at the convent the city was being besieged by the army which her relative the pope had sent against it fighting took place almost daily and as men's passions grew more inflamed in this fierce struggle between the republic and its enemies there were not wanting those who made various disgraceful proposals for getting rid of this heiress of the medici family and she was aware that her death was at any moment possible once during this period a member of the republican government proposed that she should be suspended in a basket from the walls as a target for the enemy's bullets while another member furious at clement's conduct suggested an even worse method of disposing of her at last in the summer of fifteen thirty the government considered that catherine was growing too popular at the murate and that through her presence there a feeling favourable to the medici was growing up in this important convent which might become a cause of inconvenient intrigues they therefore decided to remove her to another abode accordingly on the twentieth july in the middle of the night the convent was aroused by a loud knocking at the main entrance with a summons to open in the name of the republic the door being opened there appeared three senators the senior of whom salvestro aldo prandini presented an order to the frightened nuns to make over to them the girl catherine de medici a long parley followed catherine feeling certain that this meant that she was going to be put somewhere where her death could be effected and protesting with all her might against being given up to them at last it was urged by the nuns that she should at any rate be left alone until the morning and this was at length conceded as soon as the senators were gone catherine cut off all her hair put on a dress of a nun of the murate and going to the mother superior of the convent said will they dare now to remove me when they come in the morning and to appear before the eyes of the people in the streets employed in the crime of forcibly carrying off a nun from her convent in the morning therefore when the senators again arrived with a horse for her to ride catherine appeared thus dressed before them dared them to take her away and refused to take off the dress she had assumed for hours they argued and every persuasion was tried without avail catherine was adamant the horse brought for her remained standing at the door in the street the struggle of wills continued within at last they got her as far as the door of the convent but there the senators said they could not take her thus dressed and she declared that if she went at all she would go thus and that nothing should induce her to change her dress she refused says nicolini with wonderful firmness and resolution declaring that all the world should see that she was a nun being taken forcibly from her convent in the end she prevailed and they had to take her with them dressed as she was they escorted her presumably by the least frequented streets to the convent of santa lucia in the via san gallo and this they informed her was to be her new abode the fact must have been a great relief to catherine's mind the first recorded action of catherine's life showed that she was no ordinary child of a girl who could exhibit such force of character at the age of eleven it might safely be predicted that if she ever came to a position of independent power she would manifest an ability and strength of character equal to that possessed by any of her ancestors in connection with the same episode we are also given a second indication of her character for we are told that she felt lasting gratitude to salvestro aldo brandini for his behaviour on this occasion 
and the manner in which though firm to his purpose he had treated her with politeness and consideration this she never forgot more than twenty years afterwards when their positions were reversed she being then the powerful queen of france and aldo brandini a proscribed heretic and outlaw sentenced to death by the pope she exerted her influence and saved his life we are told he escaped death through the intercession of the grateful duchessina gratitude preserved so long and acted upon in this fashion is rare the murate still stands though long since abolished as a convent and still bears out its name by sheltering walled-up ones for it is now the great prison of tuscany its forbidding door in the centre of the high grim wall remains as when catherine and the senators of the republic had there that contest of wills and recalls the strange scene the horse which had been waiting before the door for so many hours the weeping nuns within the doorway afraid that their little charge was being taken away to be murdered the three senators striving to induce the latter to doff her offending attire and in the midst the small figure in her black dress with pale determined face whom not all their endeavours could shake catherine remained at the convent in the via san gallo during the remaining month of the siege until in august fifteen thirty the city surrendered to the pope it does not appear that in the terms of capitulation the republican government made any use of the possession of this valuable prisoner or if they did so the result became a dead letter like so many other provisions of the treaty as soon as she thus regained her liberty catherine flew back to her beloved nuns at the murate and remained there until the spring of the following year fifteen thirty one when it being obvious that she had better not continue to reside in a city to which alessandro was going to be sent as supreme ruler clement the seventh sent for her again to rome which city she had left as a child of six there catherine again met her cousin ippolito by this time a general favourite in rome and an attachment began to grow up between the girl of twelve and the young man of twenty-two which might in time have become something stronger had circumstances permitted it describing catherine at this time in his reports the venetian ambassador at rome antonio suriano says this child has a very lively disposition and displays a charming wit she owes her education to the care of the nuns of the murate convent at florence the subject of catherine's marriage now began to be debated at the papal court among the aspirants were the king of scotland the duke of mantua and the duke of milan while the mutual regard between catherine and her cousin ippolito also led some to talk of this as the best marriage for her infinitely better would it have been for catherine had this been the alliance chosen but as already noted clement the seventh had other views and by december fifteen thirty two he had privately concluded an arrangement with francis i that catherine should be married to that king's second son henry of orleans her appearance at this time when she was nearly fourteen is described by the venetian ambassador at rome as small and slender with fair hair thin and not pretty in face but with the fine eyes peculiar to all the medici and he adds she has a remarkably kind gentle and cordial manner the marriage being thus settled all the arrangements for it were pushed on by the pope as fast as possible catherine was allowed to return for a short time to florence where she stayed again at the murate convent the medici palace being occupied by alessandro and was told to be ready to leave there at the end of august to meet the pope at nice and accompany him thence to marseilles where the marriage was to take place in october at this time we have an interesting glimpse of her from the contemporary painter and historian vasari who when she was about to leave florence never to see it again writes thus she well deserves that we should wish to keep her portrait among us on account of her kind and amiable ways her sweetness of disposition cannot be painted and of that my brush can secure us no memorial 
these words will seem strange to those who have no other mental picture of catherine de medici than the traditional one but they are written by vasari in a private letter to an intimate friend and she who is thus spoken of was removing permanently to a distant country where it was not probable that she would ever meet vasari again so that there is practically no doubt that these praises attributing to her a character universally and deservedly liked represent the truth these words of vasari written under such circumstances together with the reports of the venetian ambassador at rome and the estimation in which she was held at the murate where she had so long been intimately known leave no question as to what catherine's character was like at the time when she arrived in france to be married to henry of orleans catherine left florence on the second september fifteen thirty three after giving a farewell banquet at the medici palace to all the noble ladies of florence at which as a parting gift they presented her with some splendid embroideries of pearls on cloth of gold the banquet being over she left the city at three o'clock and rode to poggio a caiano where the party slept the first night she was accompanied to marseilles by maria salviati her father's first cousin caterina cibo filippo strozzi and palla Ruccellai. the next day they rode on to pistoia and thence travelled to porto venere on the gulf of spezia where they embarked by sea for marseilles touching at nice where they met the pope and reaching marseilles on the twelfth october the fleet as it approached the harbour of marseilles was a picturesque sight it consisted of sixty ships that conveying catherine having sails of purple cloth embroidered with gold and being followed by that bearing the pope which was covered with a tent of cloth of gold the deck being carpeted with crimson satin on landing a procession of unusual splendour took place through the city it was headed by a white horse with white trappings bearing the host and led by two equerries also dressed in white then followed the pope conveyed in his chair borne on men's shoulders and succeeded by a long procession of bishops and cardinals on horseback wearing their robes and lastly catherine herself dressed in a robe of gold brocade and riding by the side of her uncle-in-law john stuart duke of albany who had married her mother's sister anne from every balcony hung costly draperies of velvet and embroidery while across the streets were festooned countless garlands of the deep-coloured damask roses of provence mingled with the lilies of france the two palaces occupied by the pope and the king of france were separated by a street over which was thrown a covered bridge uniting the palaces and made to form a large hall which was hung with costly tapestries in the galleria degli arazzi at florence are to be seen three rooms hung with rich tapestries depicting the festivities held on the occasion of this marriage of catherine these furnish an interesting record of the costumes worn on this occasion the marriage of catherine de medici and henry of orleans took place on the twenty eighth of october fifteen thirty three in the cathedral of marseilles the pope himself performed the ceremony and catherine who wore a dress of white silk embroidered with precious stones and ornaments of florentine gold filigree work had round her all the few relations she possessed that is the pope ippolito lately returned from hungary and dignified and courteous as ever though clouded by that permanent sadness which had come over him maria salviati and caterina cibo catherine was at this time in her fifteenth year and henry of orleans sixteen the latter was a dull taciturn youth the long and severe imprisonment which he and his elder brother had undergone in spain while it had ruined his brother's health appeared in henry to have had the effect of clouding his brains and he was a complete contrast to his brilliant and energetic father francis i to whom his second son's heavy and inert character was a constant cause of irritation and contempt at this marriage pope clement presented two notable gifts both of which have had a remarkable history 
to Catherine herself he gave seven splendid pearls of most unusual size, and these appear in her picture in the front of her crown. Twenty-five years afterwards, Catherine gave these pearls to her daughter-in-law, Mary, Queen of Scots, when the latter married her eldest son, and Mr. Cochrane mentions that Mary is represented with them round her neck in a picture at Holroad Palace. When Elizabeth put Mary to death, she not only took her life, but also stole her jewels, seizing upon these celebrated pearls which she had always coveted. They thus became part of the English crown jewels. And after having assisted at many great historic functions, their last public appearance was in the year 1901, when at his coronation His Majesty King Edward the Seventh wore in his crown the celebrated pearls which Catherine de' Medici had worn in hers. Clement's other present was given to the bride's father-in-law, Francis I, and was the well-known casket, made by Valerio Vicentino, assisted by his daughter, and carved from transparent rock crystal, depicting twenty-four scenes from the life of Christ, and lined with silver, so as to give an appearance of relief to the engraving. It contained the pyx, in which the Holy Sacrament was placed on the Thursday of Holy Week, the pyx being of fine enamel set with rubies. This casket was one of the most valuable presents given on that occasion, and Vicentino was paid two thousand gold crowns for it, while its value is now priceless. In the seventeenth century it found its way back to Florence, and now stands amongst other gems which belonged to the Medici in the gem room of the Uffizi Gallery, though how it got back to Italy is a mystery. It was placed by Catherine, during her son Charles the Ninth's reign, in a cabinet in the Louvre. Apparently it was stolen from the Louvre during the commotions in Paris after the death of Henry the Third, and the robber, feeling it unsafe to retain so remarkable an object in France, took it to Italy, where, after lying hidden for some forty years, it must have been bought by one of the Medici Grand Dukes, most probably by Ferdinand II, as it suddenly appears in the catalogue of the Medici gems in 1635, but without any record of when or how it had been obtained. Having thus followed Catherine's history during the fourteen years of her girlhood, we have next to look at her during the fourteen years that she was the wife of the French king's son, and the twelve years following them, during which her husband and herself were king and queen of France. End of section 2 Section 3 of The Medici, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in May 2020. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 19. Catherine de' Medici, Part 2. Second Period, 1533-1559. Francis I had many matters of diplomacy to discuss with the Pope, while there were also various grand festivities to be gone through before either of them could leave Marseilles, so that it was a whole month before the King and the Pope parted. Then Clement VII, with all those who had accompanied him, again set sail for Italy, and Francis I, with his brilliant court and his new daughter-in-law, started by road for Avignon to return to his palace at Fontainebleau. Catherine now found herself in an entirely new kind of life. It was Francis's custom to be continually changing his residences, and the Venetian ambassador, Marino Giustiniano, who was ambassador to France from 1532 to 1535, says, Never during my embassy did the court remain in the same place for more than fifteen consecutive days. Catherine shared in these constant flittings, and by these journeyings from city to city, performed always on horseback, she, in a very short time, saw a large part of France. We now obtain accounts of what Catherine was like, both in appearance and character, from a new group of observers, 
that is, from a fresh set of Venetian ambassadors, those accredited to the court of France, and from those French writers who saw her at the court at this time. The former describe her as full of vivacity, affable, and distinguished in her manners, while the French writer Brantome, who was then at the court, describing the new bride, says, Her appearance is dignified, but at the same time gracious. Her expression is pleasing, and her taste in dress excellent. She has a fine figure, a white complexion, small feet, very well-shaped hands, and a particularly beautiful voice. We are also told that she rode remarkably well, was fond of an outdoor life, and had unusually good health. Francis I was himself brilliant and cultivated. Of him the Venetian ambassador Marino Cavalli says, Listening to him one recognizes that there is neither study nor art which he cannot discuss with much knowledge. His attainments are not limited to war, but include also literature, painting, and the languages. Francis soon discovered that his new daughter-in-law was of a livelier wit and more highly educated than most of the ladies of his court, and that her bonhomie and cleverness made her an agreeable companion, while her love of hunting and other field sports chimed in with his own strong passion for the chase. So he insisted on her accompanying him on all occasions, and Catherine was soon admitted into the charmed circle of his petite bond, those sparkling and joyous spirits who, like a corps of feminine aide-de-camp, accompanied Francis in his progresses from palace to palace, from forest-encircled Fontainebleau to his proud castle of Ambois by the Silvery Loire, where Catherine's father and mother had been married soon after Francis succeeded to the throne, and from his sumptuous palace of Les Tournelles in Paris to what is now to us tragedy-haunted Blois, but whose richly decorated chambers then resounded with the laughter and espiellerie of the petite bande. This friendship on the part of the king, though a valuable help to Catherine in her new and difficult position, and especially when three years later her enemies found a heavy charge to bring against her, naturally tended to arouse court jealousy. However, Catherine was wise enough to bear herself with proper humility, knowing well how many causes for dissatisfaction the French had against her. We see a glimpse of these latter in the report of the Venetian ambassador Justiniano about this time, which says, Monsieur d'Orléans is married to Madame Catherine de' Medici, which dissatisfies the entire nation. It is thought that Pope Clement deceived the king in this alliance. However, his niece is very submissive. But except for the French king himself, Catherine had not a friend in France, and her position was most difficult. Not only was the marriage highly unpopular with both nobles and people, and she herself hated as a bourgeois Italian long before the French had even seen her, but added to this her relative Pope Clement had increased the feeling against her by failing to keep his promises. At Marseille, Catherine had been talked of as bringing to the French crown three rings, Genoa, Milan, and Naples. But Clement, when once the marriage was effected and he had got back to Italy, had done nothing to assist the French crown to gain any one of these dominions. And when in the following year, 1534, the Pope died and Catherine was left without even such support as he afforded her, the feeling against her became intensified. Nor was this all. To these misfortunes on public grounds was added a more private one. Catherine's husband, Henry, at that time a dull, sheepish, and gloomy youth of whom his father could make nothing, and who on his return from his captivity in Spain three years before had forgotten his own language, disliked her from the first, her brilliancy and cleverness only making his own want of ability the more noticeable so that the prospect before Catherine was not a bright one, in a foreign country, disliked by her husband, hated by the French nation, despised as a low-born foreigner, and with enemies all around watching for an opportunity of bringing some charge against her which would enable France to get rid of her. In 1535, two years after her marriage, Catherine heard of the tragic death of her cousin Ippolito, 
basely poisoned by the hated Alessandro. It must have been a severe blow to her, as he was not only a cousin to whom she was much attached, but also almost her last living relative. Seldom has any one been left at her age so absolutely alone in the world. Her aunt Clarice, her father's only sister, was long since dead, her distant relative Pope Clement had died in the previous year, and now her only cousin, Ippolito, being also gone, she had no living relations at all, except her father's first cousin, Maria Salviati, who after Catherine's marriage had practically retired from the world. Catherine's isolated state in this respect naturally much increased the difficulty of her position, as she was thus without that powerful support of influential relations which others in like cases have generally possessed. So that this girl of sixteen, confronted by so many adverse conditions, had nothing but her own ability and strength of character upon which to depend. In August 1536, when she had been married nearly three years, her husband's elder brother, the Dauphin Francis, who, ever since his harsh confinement in Spain as a boy, had continued in weak health, died suddenly at Tournon. This death of his eldest son was a terrible blow to Francis I, all whose affection was centred on the Dauphin. On hearing at Lyon that he was ill, the king at once prepared to go to him, when, just as he was starting, came the news of his death. And we have a vivid picture drawn of the king's grief, and of how on receiving the terrible news he knelt at the window of his palace before the whole people who deeply sympathized with him and prayed for his son, for his people, and for himself. It was of course immediately said by almost the whole nation that the Dauphin Francis had been poisoned by the Italian woman in order that her husband might become the heir to the throne. There has never been found a single particle of foundation for the charge, and every historian considers it was simply due to the national prejudice against Catherine. The accusation was not even based on unpopularity arising from any conduct of her own, for she had been too short a time in France, and too little prominent publicly to be much known by the people. However, the charge was investigated. The Dauphin's cup-bearer, Montecuculli, was accused of having been the agent, and was tortured to make him reveal by whom he had been employed to commit the crime asserted, and under torture, so far from implicating Catherine in any way, he declared the Emperor Charles V to have been the author of the crime, and adhered to this even at his execution. It is, however, believed that this was almost certainly equally untrue, and it has been pointed out that a dubious testimony uttered under the anguish of torture is far less credible than the cause assigned by the most unprejudiced historians, that is, that the Dauphin, who was of a sickly constitution, died of having drunk too freely of cold water after overheating himself at tennis, and not of poison at all. In any case, there is admitted to have been no ground for the accusation against Catherine. But when a prejudice once exists, everything that occurs strengthens it, and even the result of Montecuculli's trial did not cause the people to lay aside their suspicion against her. Francis I, however, in spite of his grief, did not share this view, and after the death of the Dauphin lavished every kindness upon her, as though desiring to compensate for the unjust suspicion of his subjects. This event changed very materially Catherine's position and prospects. Hitherto, she and her husband had had no higher destiny to anticipate than that of becoming Duke and Duchess of Milan or some similar state, whenever the contest between Francis I and Charles V should come to an end. Now, however, they would in due course become king and queen of France. But this, though it promoted Catherine to a higher dignity and greater importance at the French court than hitherto, by no means improved her position in other ways. For the wound given to the French by her marriage, grievous when she was merely marrying the second son of their king, was greatly increased by her now becoming the Dauphine, wife of the heir to the throne. Each year seemed to bring some fresh increase to the difficulties of Catherine's position and the sorrow of her lot. 
when in the first year after the marriage pope clement her chief bulwark against french disfavour died when again in the following year the cousin she had been fond of was murdered and she was left alone in the world and when again in the third year the french people persisted in accusing her of having poisoned her brother-in-law notwithstanding every evidence of her innocence each of these things added yet another drop to a cup which was an unusually bitter one to be drunk by a girl of seventeen and now there began a still harder trial one which was to last for twenty years about the year fifteen forty when he was twenty-two her taciturn young husband henry fell completely under the dominion of diane de poitiers the beautiful widow of the seneschal of normandy she ruled him entirely becoming the leader of the party of the dauphin at the court in opposition to the party of the king which was led by the duchesse de Tempes, while catherine had to stand aside and see herself put in every way in the background openly insulted by diane de poitiers who took every opportunity of showing her affronts and neglected by henry who spent most of his time at diane's great estate of Anne. catherine bore it in silence and with excellent tact which was remarked upon with approval even by francis i who was greatly irritated by his son's treatment of her but the way the iron entered into her soul is disclosed by her letters long afterwards to her favourite daughter in one or two touching allusions to this sorrow borne for years in silence about this time a fashionable craze for protestantism set in at the french court one outcome of this was a passion for marot's french psalms and each person was to be heard singing his or her favourite one on all occasions we are told that catherine took a particular affection for the one beginning vers l'éternel des oppressés le père which was for ever on her lips and no doubt appealed to her in consequence of her husband's coldness and neglect and the prejudice against her evinced by the french people the portrait of catherine painted at this time when she was twenty-one years of age is that which has always been the picture of her preserved in her own family though not possessing beauty she has a fine intelligent face with the medici eyes a broad forehead and fair hair the picture thus agreeing exactly with the descriptions of her given by Suriano, Vasari, and others at this time. This portrait of her was permanently kept by the Medici family, with their other family portraits, in their principal villa of Poggio a Cajano, where it and they still hang. The villa and its contents passed from the Medici Grand Dukes to their successors, the Austrian Grand Dukes, and from the latter to the King of Italy being now the royal villa in tuscany although the painter's name has been lost the crown the historic pearls the agreement with the descriptions of contemporary writers and above all the locality in which the portrait has always been preserved leave no doubt as to its authentic character painted for catherine in france by an italian artist it was most probably sent by her as a present to her relative cosimo the first at the time of his marriage in 1539 to Eleonora di Toledo. In 1542 another trouble came upon Catherine. Now twenty-three, she had been married for nine years and had no children. This was not only the sorrow it would in any case have been, but also it increased very materially the opportunity of those who had always desired to see her put away, and to slur upon the honour of France removed. Diane de Poitiers did not fail to find here another occasion for wounding the neglected wife whom she hated. This she did by making a sneering allusion to Francis I on the subject, in the hearing of those who, she knew, would repeat it to Catherine. This was followed by a sort of family conclave at which the matter was formally discussed, and at this Diane, strange to say, was also present, and deliberately urged upon the king that Catherine ought to be divorced, to which Francis I was reported to have agreed as being inevitable. At this time only one person showed any kindness to Catherine. Moved by pity for the many things she had to bear, Marguerite of Angoulême, Queen of Navarre, Francis I's deservedly beloved sister, wrote to Catherine to comfort her, telling her, 
my brother will never allow this repudiation as evil tongues pretend reassured by this sympathy catherine went to francis i and offered to resign her husband and enter a convent if he willed it the venetian ambassador lorenzo contarini in his report says she went to the king and with many tears told him she had heard it was his majesty's intention to give his son another wife and as it had not yet pleased god to bestow on her the grace of having children it was proper that as soon as his majesty found it undesirable to wait longer he should provide for the succession to so great a throne that for her part considering the great obligation she was under to his majesty who had deigned to accept her as a daughter-in-law she was much more disposed to endure this affliction than to attempt to oppose his will francis bade her have no fear and assured her that he would not allow her to be put away and in the following year this particular trouble was removed from catherine by the birth of a son born at fontainebleau who was named francis after his grandfather between fifteen forty three and fifteen fifty five she had ten children three of these died in infancy but of the remaining seven four were sons three of whom francis charles and henry in turn sat on the throne of france and three daughters elizabeth who married philip the second of spain claude who married the duke of lorraine and marguerite who married henry of navarre end of section three section four of the medici volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by avai in may two thousand twenty the medici volume two by g f young chapter nineteen catherine de medici part four in fifteen forty seven when catherine was twenty-eight and had been married fourteen years francis i died and her husband became henry the second of france this intensified for catherine both of the evils which she had borne so long in prudent and dignified silence but with an aching heart the supposed insult to france in her person great at her marriage and greater still when she became the dauphine seemed to the french greatest of all now that she was queen of france consequently her unpopularity with the people became more pronounced than ever but still more than this did henry's exaltation to the throne increase that which was the chief sorrow of catherine's life henry was now twenty-nine and no longer dull and stupid as he had been as a youth though often given to depression and fonder of hunting and pleasure than of attending to the affairs of his kingdom his character had strengthened and improved and catherine secretly loved him intensely though he did not in the least return her affection it is the opinion of all authorities that the one real passion of catherine's life was for henry but he himself stated by one of the protestant writers of the time to be intoxicated by that baggage diane never either appreciated it or was even aware of it and his accession began the great triumph of diane de poitiers the beautiful huntress she whom jean goujon has sculptured nude and triumphant embracing with marble arms a mysterious stag enamoured like leda's swan Diane de Poitiers, the wondrous woman of eternal youth, the elderly Alcina, who, to charm a youthful Roger, has discovered the fountain of youth. Diane de Poitiers, whom Primaticcio's frescoes at Fontainebleau sometimes represent as the luminous queen of night, and sometimes as a sombre Hecate surrounded by eternal fires henry's accession to the throne gave opportunity to diane to show all her power over him and this in a manner which in no other age or country would have been possible though she was forty-eight and henry only twenty-nine his infatuation for her was such that he entirely resigned to her both himself and his kingdom 
a surrender so complete that his contemporaries credited Diane with the possession of an enchanted ring or some other magic power. We are not in a natural world. This is an enchantment, and it can only be carried out by violent spells and dramatic strokes. The Armida of fifty years who holds a king of thirty in bonds must daily use her magic wand. Henry exalted fidelity to her into a virtue. All his leisure hours were spent with her and at her estate at Anne, in thickets of myrtle and roses, amidst statues, fountains, and gushing springs, in the depths of dark and game-abounding forests, the king leads an enchanted existence. Catherine had none of those attractions which her rival so potently possessed. Her charms were those of intellect only, and though these had been strong enough to greatly please her husband's capable father, Francis I, they had no power to attract the duller nature of Henry. Thus there now began for Catherine a twelve years' torment, self-repression being her hourly task. Diane de Poitiers, created by Henry, Duchess of Volontinois, practically ruled all things. At Henry's coronation she occupied the chief place, even the special taxes levied on the accession of a new king were bestowed upon her. She disposed of all offices, both secular and ecclesiastical. She absorbed lands and wealth in every direction. While Catherine was left to live at the gloomy castle of Chaumont, Diane's splendid residences of Anne and Chenonceau were made by her almost regal in magnificence. The Guises, the six sons of Claude, Duke of Guise, at this time her faithful vassals were promoted to all the chief offices in the kingdom, and no meeting of his council was attended by Henry until he had first discussed with Diane the matters to be brought before it. While such was the position with regard to Henry and Diane, Catherine the Queen had to lead a retired, self-contained existence, making herself as little obtrusive as possible, careful over every word and look, lest she should give opportunity to those who watched for grounds on which she might be accused of some crime and got rid of. She had to see her ability shrouded and given no opportunity for exercise, her rightful position usurped by a woman twenty years older than herself, and far less talented, her birth and family scorned and ridiculed, her advice never sought by her husband, and herself despised and insulted by a court and people who took their cue from him. Moreover, Diane de Poitiers, delighted in devising constant slights and veiled insults against the Italian woman, while perhaps more galling still was her insisting, when Catherine's children were born, in installing herself as head nurse, and, as M. Georges Giffray says, monopolizing the candles and setting all questions regarding the newly born, taking entire management of everything, nursing Catherine, receiving letters from the court physicians complimenting her upon her care over the queen, and from Henry a salary on account of the good, praiseworthy, and agreeable services she hath rendered to our dear and much-loved companion, the queen. And yet, when Catherine's son Charles was born, 1550, Henry left the Queen three days after his son's birth and went to stay at Anne with Diane, an act which even in those days was considered an unexampled breach of royal etiquette. The above shows us a state of things such as could have occurred only in France and at that period. At first sight we are inclined to wonder how Catherine could have endured all this, but that which caused its chief bitterness was at the same time that which enabled her to endure it, that is, that through it all she had a strong passion of love for her husband. It was this which caused Catherine to endure all these things without showing a sign. Strange as this fact may seem, we have it vouched for by two unimpeachable witnesses, that is, by those observant onlookers, the Venetian ambassadors, and by her own letters years afterwards. The ambassador Contarini writes, At the opening of the reign, the queen could not endure this love of the king for the duchess, but later, by reason of the urgent prayers of the king, she resigned herself, 
and now she bears it with patience. It was because Catherine loved Henry so strongly, and knew that the only way by which she could retain even such small portion of his regard as she possessed, was to endure uncomplainingly all that such a position entailed, that she patiently, and without ever once reproaching him, bore for twelve years a combination of exasperating mortifications such as would have driven most women into furious resentment. In the latter case the court would have been turned into the same state of disgraceful turmoil as resulted when, about sixty years later, the same conditions caused Marie de Medici to resent the conduct of her husband, Henry IV. The behaviour of a weak character, when placed in such circumstances, is exemplified by Marie, that of a strong one by Catherine, and severe though the trial was, the latter reaped her reward, not only in the respect which she earned from many for the manner in which she bore it, as well as the satisfaction to herself in preserving the court from scenes similar to those afterwards witnessed in Marie's case, but also in retaining a certain portion of her husband's regard. And there is considerable dignity in the way in which, years afterwards, she makes, in writing to her eldest daughter Elizabeth, then Queen of Spain, the only direct mention of this trial which she ever permitted to pass her lips, as well as in the terms in which on another occasion she wrote to reprove her son-in-law, Henry of Navarre, for his infidelities to his wife. At the time when the regency of the kingdom had just devolved upon her, and when she was oppressed by many heavy cares, she writes to her daughter Elizabeth about two years after the latter's marriage as follows. Mami, commend yourself very much to God, for you have seen me in former days as contented as you are now, and believing that I should never have any trouble but this one that I was not loved in the way I wished by the king, your father, who doubtless honoured me beyond my deserts, but I loved him so much that I was always afraid of offending him, as you know well enough. And now God has taken him from me. Therefore think of me, and let me serve as a warning to you not to trust too much in the love of your husband. Writing towards the end of her life to Henry of Navarre, she says, My son, I was never in my life so dumbfounded as when I heard the words which Frontenac has been reporting everywhere as being those which you ordered him to convey to your wife. You are not, I know, the first husband who is young and not too wise in such matters, but I believe that you are the first and the only one who after such events would venture on such language to his wife. I had the honour of marrying the king, my lord and your sovereign, whose daughter you have married, but the thing which vexed him most in the world was after he found out that I knew about such doings. These letters shed a flood of light on Catherine's character, but apart from this, the two allusions to Henry the Second which they contain show very plainly why it was that Catherine deliberately endured in silence for twelve years the heavy trial which has been mentioned, and at the same time how deeply she felt it, since the memory of it remained with her so many years afterwards. But Jeanne de Poitiers did not confine herself to affronts in connection with private matters. From 1552 to 1558 France was at war both in Germany and Italy, and when Henry proceeded on the German campaign, Diane contrived a severe public indignity to Catherine by persuading him not to give the regency during his absence to the Queen, though this course had always been the usual in such cases. The insult was the more severe in that Catherine was by far the most capable person at the court, that she felt it severely we know both from her letters and her speech on the occasion, while it did her the greatest harm with the people, lowering her greatly in their estimation and increasing their long-standing contempt for her. Nevertheless, when, on Henry's departure to the war, the order communicating this decision was read to her, we are informed by a letter from a friend at the court to the constable Montmorency that she only smiled and said that though it had pleased the king not to give her this authority which his majesty Francis I gave on a similar occasion to his mother, Louise, 
and though she would have used it well had he done so, yet it was not her intention to ask him to redress the wrong. Only, she said, she would prefer not to have the order published, lest it should lower her reputation with the people. No wonder that those who heard her words and saw her receive such an affront in such a manner marvelled openly at her wonderful self-control. Such, then, was the trial which lasted through so large a portion of Catherine's life. And it was this severe ordeal, involving through so many years a daily and almost hourly exercise of self-control, which both tested and formed her character. She was only twenty when this trial began, and had shown by her history as a girl that she possessed her full share of that tendency to emotion natural to one of Italian blood. Thus for her to learn self-control was more difficult than for women of northern race, like Elizabeth of England or Jeanne d'Albret of France. Nevertheless, through the long discipline of twenty years, she grew from an emotional girl into a woman in whom the power of self-control was so developed that it amazed all who saw it in exercise. Those who looked merely on the surface saw only indifference, or in some cases duplicity, while it is, of course, possible to argue that all self-control is duplicity. But to those who saw deeper, as it is plain from their reports that some of the Venetian ambassadors did, the real character was evident enough. And the combination of the endurance displayed, the motive for which the trial was submitted to, and the dignified manner in which the burden was borne, irresistibly impress us. It is necessary to notice, in view of the traditional idea regarding her, that during the whole of this portion of her life, that is, up to the age of forty, there are no tales of crimes alleged against Catherine de' Medici. Ground for such a charge was the very thing for which her numerous enemies watched in order to get her divorced, but they never were able to produce any. All the charges of that kind relate to the period of her life after she was forty. At last, in August 1557, when Catherine was thirty-eight, she had her first opportunity of showing her abilities. During the absence of the king in Champagne, the main French army under the constable Montmorency was totally defeated at the Battle of Saint Quentin by Emmanuel Philibert, who in 1553 has succeeded his father as Duke of Savoy. Montmorency himself was taken prisoner, northern France was left completely defenceless, Spain was jubilant at this crushing defeat of the French arms, and the general panic took place in Paris. In this time of national emergency it was not Diane de Poitiers, though her ascendancy over all affairs of the kingdom was still continuing, who came to the front, but Catherine, Diane being as helpless in the crisis as everyone else. The disaster was stupendous. History has related what were our losses, immense, unheard of since Pavia. The first shock of the news was overwhelming. France was stunned by the blow. Already Paris believed the enemy within the walls and the realm captured. In the capital the citizens packed their possessions and fled, some to Orléans, some to Bourges, some still further. To stop the flight, to rouse energy, to sound in the ears of France those words able to arouse the dead, the country in danger, this was the imperative duty of whoever governed. But the king was absent, only the queen was in Paris. What did the queen? I leave the Venetian ambassador to reply. Giacomo Soranzo, the Venetian ambassador at that time, in his report of the 14th August 1557, relates that Catherine at once went to the Parlement, urged on them not to lose heart, as they were ready to do, but to vigorously prosecute the war and to vote large subsidies for the defence of the kingdom, and she showed so much courage, wisdom and ability that she was not only completely successful, but received an immense ovation from the members of the Parlement. She expressed herself with so much eloquence and feeling that she touched all hearts, and the assembly concluded amidst such applause for Her Majesty, 
and such lively marks of satisfaction at her conduct as cannot be described in words. All over the city nothing is talked about but the queen's prudence, and the happy way in which she acted in this undertaking. Thus did Catherine, on the first occasion in which she had an opportunity of showing her powers, overcome, for a time at all events, the prejudice which the French people had nourished against her for so many years. Her action gave all the more surprise because it was so little expected. Catherine de' Medici, by this act, raised the veil of unconcern with politics to which the force of circumstances had until now condemned her. It was the first hour of her initiative, the first evidence of that personality which she was later on to raise to so high a degree. She revealed herself as queen and gave evidence to the Parisians that the blood of the nation had become her own blood. Nor was it only in the French people that Catherine, by the qualities which she showed in this her first public action, produced a change of opinion regarding herself. Henry was greatly impressed with her conduct on this occasion, and after the episode entirely changed his mode of behaviour towards her, henceforth during the remaining two years of his life, treating her on all occasions with marked respect. During the twelve years of her life as queen, Catherine, shut out from state affairs, found her main occupation in the education of her children. This she undertook almost entirely herself, and the manner in which she performed it was considered by those around her to show a laudable example of devoted attention and good sense. Her sons, who all inherited, in a more pronounced degree, their father's want of ability, soon passed under other instructors, but her three daughters, Elizabeth, born 1545, Claude, born 1547, and Marguerite, born 1553, were taught entirely by Catherine herself. With her three young daughters, Catherine also brought up Mary, Queen of Scots, who, born in 1542 and brought to France at the age of five, was the eldest of the four girls. The list of the various translations, essays and exercises set them by Catherine is still to be seen, and shows how thorough was her teaching and how wide its range. To the little Mary she dictates the following to be translated by her into Latin. The true grandeur and excellence of a prince, my very dear sister, does not consist in honours, in gold, in purple and other luxuries of fortune, but in prudence, wisdom, and knowledge. And by so much as the prince wishes to differ from his people in his mode and fashion of living, by so much should he be removed from the foolish opinions of the vulgar. Adieu, and love me as much as you can. It is strange to remember that at the very time that Catherine was teaching Mary these principles, Diane de Poitiers was taking every opportunity to teach the latter to despise her as la fille de marchand catherine's daughters were brought up with exceeding strictness catherine being all her life a very great stickler for les convenances it is extraordinary to note from their letters how greatly her children admired her and how much they thought of it when they won her praise this was not confined to one but is common to them all her favourite daughter was the eldest elizabeth the youngest marguerite she who afterwards proved such a thorn to her husband, was the most troublesome even at that age, and in her letters she tells us so, and that at times she had even to be beaten. But she admired her mother just as much as did the rest. The last year of Henry the Second's reign was a time of important marriages and festivities, pageants and fêtes in connection therewith such as Henry loved. On the 24th April 1558, Catherine's eldest son Francis was married to Mary, Queen of Scots, both of them being fifteen years of age. This wedding was arranged on the grandest scale, with every accessory that could aid picturesque effect. A gallery hung with vine branches laden with grapes was constructed from the bishop's palace to the door of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, in front of which was placed the royal dais, and, as the brilliant cortege approached the dais, 
heralds flung gold and silver among the crowd until they had to desist owing to the scramble for it creating so great a disturbance the young bride dressed all in white and looking like a lily and wearing a crown blazing with diamonds sapphires and emeralds took her place under the portico where the marriage ceremony was performed by the archbishop of rouen the wedding ring being handed to him by the king who drew it from his own finger after which mass was celebrated inside the cathedral the bride and bridegroom occupying a throne under a canopy of cloth of gold in the evening there was a ball at the palace of les tournelles combined with masks and mummeries in the palais de justice at which the children of the dukes of guise and aumale rode on artificial horses caparisoned with gold and silver trappings and drawing coaches filled with gorgeously dressed pilgrims these were followed by six ships covered with crimson velvet and imitating as they moved the rolling motion of the sea in the foremost of which embarked the king and the young bride in the next the dauphin and catherine in the third the duke of lorraine and the princess claude and so on the ships then sailing round the great hall which was illuminated as much by the blaze of jewels worn by the company as by the torches and cressets this was followed a year later by the two marriages in june fifteen fifty nine of henry's sister marguerite to emmanuel philibert duke of savoy and of his and catherine's eldest daughter elizabeth then fourteen to philip the second of spain this later marriage being by proxy the pageants and fetes in connection with these two marriages went on for many days and concluded with a grand tournament held in front of the palace of les tournelles on the thirtieth of june in which the king himself took part and which was witnessed by four queens catherine her daughter elizabeth mary queen of scots and marguerite catherine's celebrated astrologer gaurico had some time before predicted that henry would be fatally wounded in a duel at the age of forty and had repeated this prediction a week before the tournament and catherine had grave fears about henry's taking part in the contest and endeavoured to dissuade him from doing so but he was bent upon it as he rode into the lists a boy in the crowd cried out sire do not tilt but no one paid any attention to it nor did the boy himself when afterwards interrogated know why he had been moved to cry out after several courses in which henry was victorious he sent catherine a message that he would try one more bout for love of her he did so his opponent montgomery's lace pierced henry's eye and to the horror of the whole assemblage the king fell from his horse mortally wounded he was at once carried into the tournelle palace lingered for ten days in great agony and then died on this terrible conclusion to the tournament the greatest confusion pervaded the court while as soon as it was known that the king was in a dying state all public affairs were thrown into the utmost disorder in this emergency the queen came forward as alone having the right to assume the management of affairs and her first exercise of authority was to order the duchess of valentinois to depart to her own house but catherine never at any time during her life showed a revengeful spirit and upon henry's death she allowed diane de poitiers to retain possession of her magnificent chateau of Anne, contenting herself with forbidding her the court and requiring diane to resign her other chateau of chenonceau in exchange for that castle of chaumont which catherine never desired to see again catherine's grief at henry's death was immense for several days she would not speak and when the munition ambassador came to condole with her he says that she received him in a room of which both walls and floor were all covered with black as well as everything in the room while she herself could scarcely speak to him from this time forth she always wore heavy mourning and a widow's veil and adopted a new motto la cremaille hinc hinc dolor nor was this grief simulated all writers have considered that in these various signs of grief there was no pretence 
she who for so many years had so hidden her feelings that many declared her to have none could not hide them now she had lost the one love of her life a blow felt all the more because the man whom she thus mourned had never known how much she loved him nor returned her affection and for a time she shut herself up with her grief in an impenetrable silence thus ended catherine's married life at the age of forty we have now to see her in a new role one in which the powers and abilities which had so long been allowed no exercise were at last to have full scope end of section four section five of the medici volume two this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 20. Catherine de' Medici, Part 1. Born 1519, married 1533, died 1589. The last thirty years of her life the period on which we now enter is a strange one full of the most violent contrasts the latter half of the sixteenth century in france is a time when all the elements of a tragic drama are at their height only the music of a wagner could do it justice rivers of blood flow lives are thrown away for a bagatelle balls alternate with massacres at one moment thunder lightning and dark clouds at the next a blue sky the soft sound of music and sunshine amidst gardens of roses stilettos ornamented with pearls french gaiety and wit even in the midst of terror and death one thing only stable a universal courage such are the characteristics of an epoch in which two streams the barbarism of the middle ages and the refinement of more modern times met in a conflict of tossing waves before the former was finally overcome by the latter the women of this period are peculiar to their time differing entirely from those of any other century and properly to appreciate any one of them we have to realize the exceptional atmosphere in which they lived and of which they formed so prominent a part fearless capable learned vivacious full of energy and common sense half pagan and half christian deeply religious at one moment and at another consulting astrologers and purchasing love potions riding like amazons fond of danger and dressing music and love assisting at tournaments accustomed to bloody sights and cruel sufferings at a period when all held their lives by a very slender thread a mixture of laughter and tears and stoicism they are full of contrasts and surprises while yet at times intensely human and intensely interesting and where such women found themselves placed in positions in which in an age of fierce conflict and violent passions they were called upon to govern states they perforce developed the qualities necessary to such conditions thus of jeanne d'albret niece of francis i and mother of henry of navarre it has been said that she was a queen in whom nothing was woman but her sex a soul wholly given to manly things a mind capable of great affairs a heart invincible by adversities and the same might have been said of either catherine de medici or elizabeth of england all three of them were like women of iron and had need to be so it was an age in which in addition to the greatest ability the qualities required in order to obtain for those over whom they ruled the one blessing which is the greatest of all to a country the blessing of peace were a will of adamant a rigid impassibility a steadfastness unconquerable and it is to misunderstand the whole epoch to condemn them for not possessing those qualities which we admire in women rulers in our age and for possessing those sterner characteristics which were the need of their time if they were to preserve those over whom they were set from the most grievous evils 
such a character for instance as that of our deservedly honoured queen victoria would in that age have been simply crushed and would have been of no use to poor passion-tossed france in stormy weather ships anchors must be made of iron not of gold and in coming to this third period of catherine's life we reach a stormy time indeed m imbert de st amand referring to the dangers which lay before her on coming to power says never had a more overwhelming burden rested on a woman's shoulders a blanche of castile's force of soul would not have been great enough to struggle against the tempests about to be let loose on france the period of catherine's life which now begins the thirty years from fifteen fifty nine to fifteen eighty nine is that of the reigns of her three sons who in turn succeeded each other her eldest son francis the second coming to the throne at sixteen only reigned for a year and a half fifteen fifty nine to fifteen sixty her second son charles the ninth succeeded his brother at the age of ten and reigned for fourteen years fifteen sixty to fifteen seventy four her third son henry the third succeeding his brother at the age of twenty-three reigned for fifteen years fifteen seventy four to fifteen eighty nine during the seventeen months of her eldest son's reign catherine had a little more power than before her husband's death francis the second being entirely ruled by her opponents the guise but during nearly the whole of her second son's reign catherine was queen regent of france while during her third son's reign she was though not regent the most important of his advisers striving to keep his indolent and foolish character from bringing his throne to disaster thus during nearly thirty years she was the most important person in france before coming to the detailed history of those years it will be well to glance at the task by which she was confronted the qualities she possessed for coping with it and the general characteristics of this the most important of the three periods of her life and although during the first seventeen months of this period she did not obtain the control of affairs yet this space of time being so short we may disregard it for the moment and look at these thirty years as a whole first then as to the evidence on which we have to rely controversy has raged for three centuries over the events of this period with the result that the evidence by which we have to judge of catherine's character and conduct during this portion of her life is to the last degree conflicting by some she is represented as without ability discernment or breadth of view full of vacillations and shifty compromises walking is the moment prompted one whose only motive was a lust for sovereignty an intriguer working out the tangled schemes of a changeable and baleful policy and caught in her own snares according to others she was endowed with an ability and power of discernment seldom seen upon a throne one who brought to the cause of a distracted country a power of endurance in adhering to a wise but difficult course an intelligence and a strength of character worthy of the highest praise thus she is by some represented as the ruin and by others as the salvation of france but while the writers of the former class are steadily tending to become less credited as fuller information becomes available they also frequently refute each other thus those who have held her responsible for the massacre on st bartholomew's day are contradicted by so great an authority as the historian michelet who in his antipathy to the italian woman will not allow to her ability or importance of any kind treating her with cold disdain calling her a non-entity and saying never had she either the idea or the courage required for such a massacre her admirer tavan overrates her i consider and exaggerates in attributing to her the idea of coligny's death to this a later writer m armand bachet nourishing an almost equally strong feeling against catherine vigorously responds desiring to be more than true you are worse than false to listen to you one would think catherine de medici knew not even the first word about politics 
pointing out that in thus acquitting catherine of having caused coligny's death michelet destroys his own argument by acquitting her of that which is the chief charge against her honore de balzac on the other hand while he praises her living chastely in the midst of the most licentious court in europe considers that the enormous crimes and destruction which were being committed throughout france by the protestants justified even such a massacre as that of st bartholomew's day thus exonerating catherine on grounds which admit all that her worst enemies have said a fourth authority brantome who lived in the midst of all these events remarks she has been strongly accused of the paris massacre there are at least three or four others who might be more justly accused of it than she while he is never tired of praising her goodness her wisdom her peacemaking endeavors and her grief at seeing so many nobles and people perish in these bitter contests which were rending france lastly a recent writer of her life after admitting her freedom from prejudice her tolerance patience and self-control and that she gave no cause for scandal asserts that none of these qualities in her were deserving of any praise but were all due to bad motives adding we shall follow her in these pages with admiration but with hatred the above afford an example of the conflicting opinions on the subject of catherine's conduct during these thirty years as before however our safest guides will be those dispassionate onlookers the venetian ambassadors who one after another were accredited to the court of france their secret reports to their own government those actions of hers which are admitted by all and lastly her own letters will together form a more reliable guide to the truth regarding catherine de medici than the writers of any other authorities that could be produced catherine was now at the age of forty at the full maturity of her mental powers and with an ample sphere for their exercise at last opening before her the long years of obscurity and repression had disciplined and matured her character her abilities were at their zenith and her knowledge and experience had been ripened by her having stood as an onlooker watching the movement of the political world of france during twenty-six years with the discernment which she so abundantly possessed there is ample proof in her letters that she intended to undo the harm which incapacity during the previous twelve years had produced to pacify the passions which had been aroused by unjust and short-sighted methods of government to bring the country to peace advance its prosperity and raise it high in the estimation of other countries the crest and motto which she had adopted at her marriage was a rainbow with the words i bring light and serenity and it is admitted on all hands that on coming to power she strove earnestly to carry out this motto but unfortunately for catherine a widespread movement was sweeping over europe which made all such achievements for the time impossible the great conflict over religion which had so long been tearing germany to pieces was now spreading to france geneva and rome were beginning to make that country their battleground already during the latter part of henry the second's reign under the influence of dion de portier an ardent opponent of the new religion there had been cruel persecutions and executions on account of religion by the time that catherine became queen regent the two hostile forces had become ranged against each other and soon a religious war that most vindictive of all wars raged over france tearing the country to pieces devastating its cities maddening its people and making permanent peace unattainable even by the wisest administrator until such time as the force of religious animosity had spent itself by the sacrifice of a hecatomb of noble lives throughout the whole period covered by the reigns of catherine's second and third sons did this contest last and for five years beyond it thus it was her ill fate to have to rule france just during that period which the effects of the reformation would have caused to be the most tempestuous time in that country's history whoever had been on the throne however when catherine began her task these things were hidden in the future 
and the manner in which she endeavoured to cope with it has won praise from numberless high authorities the difficulties were immense france was torn by a furious conflict between the protestants called in france the huguenots and the roman catholics who plotted and warred ceaselessly against each other while each endeavoured to get the throne on their side even by force if in no other way in this state of things catherine's determined policy was to refuse to take either side and to endeavour to create peace between these implacable foes by compelling them to learn mutual toleration and by holding an equal balance between them when about eighty years later the same sort of struggle took place in england the king took a side with results which were disastrous to both throne and country it was just this which catherine foresaw and struggled all the years of her power to avoid and she shows considerable statesmanship in having set this endeavour before her catherine more successful than charles i saved her son's throne and again and again wrought peace between the two parties by her policy but she did so at the price which was inevitable that both parties in turn abused her as double-minded every concession or even bare measure of justice to one side was immediately seized upon by the other as an offence and asserted to be a departure from some previous concession to themselves and to show dissimulation on her part nevertheless catherine steadfastly maintained her course though opposed by every sort of difficulty she had the wisdom to choose as her chancellor and chief adviser the enlightened and temperate protestant michel de l'hopital and with his assistance she was enabled to steer the course which she had elected to follow with at times considerable success though under the conditions in which france then was no peace brought about could be lasting that she was not understood goes without saying the course she was trying to carry out was many years in advance of her time she was endeavouring to act as a constitutional sovereign would in these days and to follow a policy of equal toleration to all which did not come into fashion among the nations of europe until some two hundred years afterwards catherine exhausted every method of reconciliation she passed measures favouring one side as much as the other she gave appointments to protestants as well as to roman catholics she made mortal enemies like the duke of guise and the prince of conde embrace each other she had as many protestant ladies in waiting as she had roman catholic whereas in fifteen fifty five there had been only one protestant church in france six years later there were two thousand but when a country is in the state in which france was moderate courses are out of favour the people at such times consider those who act thus to be lukewarm and france was too wild with religious hatred the fires of which were steadily fanned from geneva and rome to be able to appreciate a tolerant course of action how little the age was to understand or value a policy of toleration we may see both from the reports of the unbiased venetian ambassadors and from those of the strongly biased spanish ambassador chantenay the venetian ambassador sodiano writes it is well known that several of the women who are most intimate with the queen are suspected of heresy and bad conduct and everybody is aware that the chancellor in whom she trusts is an enemy of the roman church and of the pope we saw too how lukewarm were her efforts to protect the catholic party while the spanish ambassador chantenay writes to his master philip the second take into consideration that whatever is lawful at geneva as to sermons administration of the sacraments and similar things may be done with impunity throughout the kingdom beginning in the king's house to this policy catherine adhered in spite of obstacles which to most would have appeared insurmountable even sustaining war from spain rather than abandon it and it is very significant in connection with the degree of responsibility to be attached to her on account of the massacre on st bartholomew's day in fifteen seventy two 
to find that during the whole of the previous twelve years it was for her moderation and tolerance that she was abused by the french not for conduct of the opposite kind and that it was contemptuously said of her that she had the olive branch always in her hand nor do catherine's own letters reticent as they are about herself fail to give corroborative testimony as to what was her endeavour and what her difficulties writing after her son francis the second's death to her ambassador in spain she says that her endeavour as queen regent will be to rehabilitate by degrees all that the malice of the times has destroyed in this kingdom while to her daughter elizabeth she writes that god has taken her brother and has left me with three little children and a kingdom so divided that there is not a single person in whom i can wholly trust and who is not swayed by party passion there is no doubt that catherine possessed all the qualities for a just and wise government of france if only the religious strife could have been put down or had never arisen and we have numerous instances given us of the many improvements even distracted as the country was which she introduced into the administration like all who have greater abilities than their fellows she had a joy in ruling un affetto di signoreggiare as the venetian ambassador cavalli calls it it is a mistake to style this as some have done a lust for power it is a quality which all possess who are fitted to rule and so far from being a defect in catherine it would have shown a culpable want of energy if endowed as she was with unusual abilities she had not manifested this love of ruling End of section five. section six of the medici volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the medici volume two by g f young chapter twenty catherine de medici part two during this third portion of her life after she had reached the age of forty catherine suddenly becomes charged with the wholesale commission of crimes of murder regarding this all that need be said here is that the accusation specifies no particular individuals and that as it begins simultaneously with the religious conflict it is presumable that there is some connection between the two matters it may also be noted that it has been held by some well qualified to form an opinion on such a point that the ignorance of the science of medicine at that time precludes the possibility of knowledge of the subtle poisons which are presupposed in all these cases and that on that ground alone these stories should be rejected undoubtedly the people of that age imagined that they possessed subtle poisons and were therefore ready to attribute death to such methods just as they thoroughly believed in witchcraft and the possibility of causing the death of a person by means of a wax figure transfixed with pins and just as they believed in incantations horoscopes and the various mysteries of their imaginary science of astrology but they deceived themselves in the one case as much as in the other murders by poison in that age when they did occur generally show the use of poison by no means subtle and any such murders if committed by catherine would have been able to be definitely specified in connection with this general accusation almost an entire literature has gathered around catherine de medici of stories based on no foundation repudiated by historians and often directly contradicted by the circumstances of poisoned gloves handkerchiefs bouquets and other things of the same kind this literature has been preferred to sober history but it has been pointed out by creighton that such stories gathered round many prominent characters of that day and are a proof not of the guilt of the person concerned but of the low morality of the age these stories while they gratified an appetite for sensation assisted the endeavours of political opponents to blacken the character of the italian woman among them is the well-known fable of the secret cupboards in the suite of the apartments occupied by catherine at the chateau of blois which a later age in search of sensation felt sure must have been intended for keeping her poisons 
a story which once passed for history but has now been exploded as entirely apocryphal these ingeniously contrived cupboards were almost certainly intended for keeping the huge mass of secret correspondence which so prolific a letter-writer as catherine collected round her and the copies of those letters which now fill so many volumes of the secret records of various countries there was also another use to which a portion of these cupboards may have been put astrology was the fashion of the day and in connection with it a large paraphernalia of minerals drugs and magic substances of many kinds were considered indispensable catherine was an ardent votary of this cult and these cupboards may also have been partly used for this purpose this taste for astrology surrounded catherine with an atmosphere of mystery which much assisted the growth round her personality of a literature of the kind mentioned apart however from these stories looked upon by historians in the light of fables and showing merely the low morality of the age and the bitterness of the religious conflict there are two murders and only two with which catherine has been definitely charged one that of coligny and the other that of lignerolles an objectionable associate of her third son henry who mysteriously disappeared and was presumably murdered the former of these cases may be left to be considered when we come to that point in catherine's history but the latter may well be mentioned here since it shows an example of the kind of foundation upon which accusations of this nature were credited in that age and have been handed down to our own the charge is founded on a single sentence in a contemporary diary the anonymous writer of which speaking of lignerolles disappearance curtly states the queen mother with the full consent of her children had him killed knowing as we do that the two parties in france at that time were ready to believe and propagate the wildest stories without any proof and stuck at nothing in their abuse of a religious opponent it is impossible to credit any statement of this nature made by either party unless it has independent corroboration from state papers or other similar sources and a single bald statement like this certainly requires it in no ordinary degree yet not only is none such forthcoming but also the statement itself contains its own refutation for knowing what we do of catherine de medici who is there that will believe that she was the sort of person who intending to commit such a crime would discuss it beforehand with those daughters for she could not under the circumstances discuss it with her son henry himself about whose character and training she was so abnormally strict still less that she would obtain from them a full consent to this secret murder yet this preposterous as it is is that which is involved by the statement on which alone this charge rests astrology did not by any means exhaust all catherine's scientific tastes she was interested in all branches of science while both mathematics and mechanics had especially great attractions for her another branch of knowledge in which her sound sense is very conspicuous was that of hygiene in which she was altogether in advance of her time in opposition to the ideas then prevailing on the subject she was a strong advocate for plenty of air and exercise and in her letters to her daughters is found giving them unlimited good advice on this point she was also much opposed to the conservatism of the day in medical matters constantly urging the desirability of inquiring into new methods in medicine and surgery and of taking note of new discoveries in medical science made in other countries catherine was a most indefatigable letter-writer her letters deal with every imaginable subject from the most important affairs of internal politics down to pleadings on behalf of innumerable proteges for whom she desired benefits and the most minute directions about her children's health and how their clothes were to be made and all her letters breathe a profound common sense m armand bachet says a just and veracious history of catherine de medici would be impossible without studying her private letters her ability her penetration her astonishing facility in overcoming all difficulties show themselves in all her expressions 
and michelet himself has said at the head of the lobespin the pinard the villeroys and other french secretaries at the head of the gondis the biragus and other italian secretaries must be placed that untiring female scribe catherine de medici if there is no dispatch to draw up she makes up for it by writing letters of politeness compliment or condolence even to private persons reading of this indefatigable letter-writing which occupied so many hours of each day of catherine's life we look with renewed interest at the small cabinet vert in her chateau of chenonceau with her initials carved on the ceiling which was her boudoir and writing-room and the place in which the greater part of her mass of letters and minutes on state affairs were written her labours were incessant and the venetian ambassador sigismondo cavalli says at table or while walking she is unceasingly conversing with someone on affairs her mind is bent not merely on political matters but on so many others that i do not know how she can endure and go through so much m batifol states that she was the most extravagant of all the queens of france but he adds that she was the one who owing to her immense dowry had the richest personal property her chief amusement was hunting of which she was passionately fond not merely when young but throughout her life she had many accidents on one occasion she broke her leg out hunting and another time by a severe fall fractured her skull necessitating the operation of trepanning but she continued to hunt until nearly sixty years of age after one of these accidents she writes you ask for news of my fall so i will tell you that it was a bad and heavy one but thank god i was not much hurt and am only marked on my nose like the sheep of berry she was the inventress of the side saddle and it must have required some courage to be the first to attempt to ride a horse in such an entirely new manner her son charles the ninth tells us that she was always very regardless of herself for that she was of her nature very slow to complain and says that she frequently neglected her own health though so particular about that of her children she bore pain with the endurance of a stoic never complaining in her old age when constantly tormented with attacks of rheumatism she invariably treats the matter with a passing joke at her own infirmities all writers refer to her unusual courage and danger when determined to drive the english from france she insisted in order to inspire the troops on taking part personally in the siege of rouen and entering the battle and when remonstrated with by the constable and the duke of guise only laughed and asked why should she spare herself more than they did her agreeable manners when she came as a bride to france have already been alluded to on her becoming queen regent this characteristic had greater scope and we find all writers referring to it Brantome, always most enthusiastic when speaking of catherine expatiates in glowing terms on this point saying that she was tall and majestic and of a winning presence and that as queen of france and doing the honours of the court she was most brilliant and magnificent and nothing ever equalled her and even trollope says catherine the queen was one of the most graceful mannered women of her time grave diplomatists were fascinated by her conversation and learned lawyers charmed by her affability whether it was her fault or her misfortune that she acquired a character among later generations for exceptional malevolence and how far the character usually attributed to her has been a just one or the reverse is a point regarding which the main facts of her life as they appear in the fuller light now available are best left to speak for themselves having thus seen what were the chief features of the task before catherine and the qualities she possessed for coping with it we can now glance at the principal events of these last thirty years of her life and how she bore herself through the stormiest period of french history end of section six section seven of the medici volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young. Chapter 20, Catherine de' Medici, Part 3, 1559 to 1560. On Henry II's death, his eldest son, Francis II, then 16, succeeded to the throne. He was sickly in body and intensely feeble in character, and it might have been thought would certainly have been under the domination of his mother. But the powerful group of brothers, the Guises, whom Diane de Poitiers had placed in the principal offices of the state, were by no means ready to sink into obscurity as she had been obliged to do, and chance now gave all the power into their hands. The feeble-minded youth who had become king was entirely swayed by his young wife, Mary Queen of Scots, who was now Queen of France as well as of Scotland, and of whom Catherine, in her letters at this time, writes, Our little Scottish Queen has only to smile to turn all Frenchmen's heads. But Mary, herself also only sixteen, cared not at all about politics, and was chiefly bent on amusing herself. She was proud of her two crowns and her beauty, was surrounded by adulation and flattery, and in no mood to be occupied by such dull subjects as affairs of state policy. Therefore, she was only too ready to leave the entire management of state affairs to her powerful uncles, the Guises, and the latter almost at once secured complete dominion over the pitiful and contemptible youth Francis II, using him simply as their tool, and effectually preventing Catherine from having any influence. Moreover, the religious question helped to strengthen this state of things. Diane de Poitiers had always been the bitter enemy of the new religion, and she and the Guises were determined, now that the latter had complete power, to exercise it by a vigorous stamping out, by the most ruthless methods, of Protestantism in France. And as Catherine was considered to have leanings towards the Protestant party, and at any rate to be exceedingly lukewarm, and certain not to be at all disposed towards the stringent measures which the Guises intended to adopt, they were determined not to allow her to have any control over affairs. So that Catherine, during her eldest son's short reign of seventeen months, though outwardly occupying a more important position, owing to the removal from the scene of the Duchess of Valentinois, had practically little more power than she had during her husband's lifetime. And although Francis II began his reign by issuing a decree ordering his mother's authority to be obeyed as if it were his own, this became a dead letter, if it was ever intended to be anything else, and the Guises alone ruled France. To the Duke of Guise, Francis, by a formal decree, gave absolute authority over the whole of the military affairs of the kingdom, and to his brother, Charles de Guise, Cardinal of Lorraine, similar authority over the whole of the civil affairs, while one lucrative office after another was absorbed by them and their brothers. With the entire administration of the kingdom in their hands, the ambition of this family became more unbounded than ever, and they aspired even to set aside all the princes of the blood royal. Shortly after Henry II's death, Catherine, in her dejection at the loss of the husband she had loved, the incapacity of her eldest son, and the unquiet state of the kingdom, which threatened under the intolerant rule of the Guises, soon to bring heavy troubles upon the throne, went off to Chaumont, before its transfer to Diane de Poitiers had been effected, to consult her astrologer Ruggieri, who had long lived there in a set of apartments in one of the towers of the castle, as to the future of herself and her sons. And then ensued that strange vision of the future kings of France, of which one Nicolas Pasquier, son of a member of the States General, tells us how that the Queen Mother, being told by Ruggieri to gaze steadily into a large mirror which hung on the wall, when she would see the future kings of France appear in succession, while each of them would reign as many years as his apparition in the mirror made complete turns, in trepidation did so. First there appeared a pale and sickly youth, 
whom she recognised as her son Francis II, who slowly made one turn and then faded from her view. Next came her son Charles, who, as Catherine breathlessly watched, made thirteen turns and passed out of sight. He was followed by her son Henry, who rapidly made fifteen turns and then suddenly vanished. Then entered on the scene Henry of Navarre, who, as Catherine, now unable to remove her gaze from this strange pageant, watched as one spellbound, made twenty turns, and likewise suddenly disappeared. Following him came a bright boy, who continued turning again and again, until when he had done so thirty times, Catherine in an agony cried out that she could look no more, and fainted away. So at least runs the legend, and the next day Catherine, much shaken by what she had seen, left Chaumont, and never again saw the chateau where she had spent so many gloomy years, and the last visit to which had been marked by so weird an experience. But the residence which she had taken in exchange for it was the delight of Catherine's heart, and became during the rest of her life her favourite abode. Situated on the borders of the forest of Amboise, Chenonceau, which had originally been a mill, worked by the waters of the river Cher, had been gradually improved by successive owners, until it became a charming chateau, which about the year 1528 was bought by Francis I. Catherine had always coveted it, from the days when Francis I had taken her there, on some of their hunting trips together. And it was another of the bitter things she had had to bear, that on the latter's death, her husband, Henry II, instead of allowing it to become hers, gave it to Diane de Poitiers. The latter had since enlarged and beautified it, and Catherine, now that it had at last become her own, was bent upon improving it still further. For a time, however, she was obliged to defer those plans until public affairs should become less troubled. For the condition of these now became most threatening, and it was evident that at the rate matters were proceeding, the throne would ere long be in serious danger. For the Guises were not long in embarking on the course they had determined upon as regards Protestantism. The Cardinal of Lorraine, especially, was a most baneful character for any country to be cursed with, being a violent persecutor, loathed by the people, and bent upon rooting out Protestantism by the most drastic methods. Jeanne d'Albret, Queen of Navarre, wrote of him that he would like to set households by the ears all over France, and he certainly succeeded in doing so. Under his administration of the country, the most cruel persecution of Protestants at once set in, and when, after a short time, Anne de Bourg, a sincere and earnestly religious man of very temperate views and high character, a moderate and a leading member of the Parlement, was condemned and put to death by the Guises for being a Protestant, matters reached a climax. The Protestants, backed it is said by Elizabeth of England, laid a plot while the court was at Blois to capture and put to death the Guises and if possible to seize the young king and make him a Protestant, or if he refused, to make the Prince of Condé king. Catherine did not know what they were planning to do, but she was entirely opposed to the way in which the Protestants were being treated, as she considered that toleration was the only safe course for the kingdom, and hated the Guises, although as long as her son was ruled by his wife, and both of them by the uncles of the latter, Catherine had to stand aside and look on. But she writes, When I see these poor people burnt, beaten and tormented, not for thieving or marauding, but simply for upholding their religious opinions, when I see some of them suffer cheerfully with a glad heart, I am forced to believe that there is something in this which transcendeth human understanding. The Protestants, knowing of this sympathetic attitude on her part, 
and not knowing how small her power was, appealed to her against what was being done on the king's authority under the administrative powers which had been granted by him to the Guises. And she, unwilling to acknowledge how powerless she was, extracted a promise from the latter to stop the persecutions. But she could really affect nothing, and the persecutions continued. However, after a time, she succeeded in getting a decree issued by the king forbidding the persecution of Protestants. But the Guises had no intention of obeying any such decree and practically snapped their fingers in her face. Catherine consulted Admiral Coligny as to what could be done, and he told her, what she knew already, that the Guises were hated like the pest and alone to blame for the disturbed state of the country. But it was easier to say this than to discover how to oust the Guises, who had become practically kings of France. Meanwhile, the Protestants were elaborating their plot, regarding which Calvin afterwards said, Never was enterprise worse conceived or more stupidly carried out. The English Roman Catholics were suffered to find it out, and they informed the Duke of Guise, whereupon the latter promptly removed the king, the queen mother, and the court from Blois to Amboise, which was a more secure abode, and awaited events. At Amboise, the Guises, who desired to make the matter appear as formidable as possible to the king, so that they might punish with the greater severity those implicated in it, kept the courts in almost as complete confinement as though they were in a state of siege, the gates of the castle being shut and the neighbouring roads patrolled by parties of cavalry. In March 1560, the conspirators made their attempt to capture the Guises and the king. But in such a feeble and desultory fashion that from first to last, the so-called conspiracy presented no real danger to those concerned. So much so that there is even an appearance throughout the affair of the Protestants having been deliberately led on by the Guises to make the attempt in order that the latter might be able to destroy as many of them as possible. Whether this were the case or not, the attempt was made in a manner most inadequate for such an enterprise. A few of the conspirators were found by the cavalry patrols lurking in a wood near the castle. A day or two later, a larger band were captured. Condé, who had secretly been head of the plot, deserted his followers with their consent and took his place at court as though he had had no connection with the conspiracy. The rest of the conspirators, instead of thereupon abandoning the enterprise, as they would have been wise to do, foolishly advanced against the castle, though they could never have expected to take it. Their attack, feebly carried out, was easily repulsed. In the retreat, the greater number of them were taken prisoners, and the plot collapsed. The Guises, who headed the Roman Catholic party by causing the king to place in their hands the entire civil and military administration of the kingdom, were not only able to persecute their religious opponents with impunity, but could also declare any actions of the latter in retaliation to be acts of treason against the king. And it was exactly this, making the throne take aside, carrying with it consequences of this kind, which Catherine, when a year later she came into power, refused to adopt. But the Guises, being violent partisans who were determined to root out their opponents, cared for no such considerations, and were governed by one sole aim, that of making their own party triumphant. They therefore now proceeded to punish all those whom they had captured, not as heretics, but as persons guilty of treason against the king. By this means, notwithstanding the king's decree forbidding any further executions on account of religion, they would be able nevertheless to put to death a large number of important Protestants. From the prisoners under torture, the Guises learned, if they did not know it before, that there had never been any danger to the king, 
and that the whole plot was aimed at themselves alone. And their vengeance, inspired not only by the desire of the triumph of their party, but also by fears for their own safety, was cruel and vindictive. Every Protestant throughout the country, round upon whom their soldiers could lay hands, was summarily hanged, drowned in the Loire, or brought to the castle to be beheaded. These massacres of their opponents went on for a month. Every part of the walls of the castle was disfigured by heads of the slain, and the Guises, in order to implicate the members of the court in their proceedings, forced them whenever they could to witness these executions, even the Prince of Condé being compelled by them to do so. Finally, in order to strike terror into all who might think of engaging in such plots against their power in future, as well as to assist in giving the desired appearance of a condemnation for treason against the king, the Guises arranged a public execution of the 57 principal prisoners and made it as impressive as possible. They directed that the execution, fixed for the 30th of March, should be carried out in the presence of the whole court and issued notices throughout the surrounding country proclaiming the execution and ordering all to be present at it. In obedience to this order, the people came in crowds and occupied hilltops, roofs of houses, and every point from which the scaffold was visible, while for the members of the court, the Guises arranged seats in tiers round the open space, as if for a fate. When the whole court, with the young king and queen and their attendants, the queen mother and her ladies, and the princes of the blood, including the Prince of Condé himself, had taken their places, the Duke of Guise placed himself close to the scaffold on horseback, and one by one the fifty-seven gentlemen condemned to death laid their heads on the block and were beheaded. Catherine and the whole court were so horrified at this dreadful spectacle that they were thankful to leave Amboise on the following day for Chenonceau, where Catherine, to get rid of the horror of blood, arranged a series of garden fetes to wipe out the effect of the terrible scenes which the Guises had created for them during the month they had passed at Amboise. Thus did Francis, Duke of Guise, and his brother Charles, light the fires of civil war in France, which were to rage over that country for more than a generation. End of section 7. Recording by Jane Bennett. Section 8 of the Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici. Volume 2 by G. F. Young. Chapter 20. Catherine de' Medici. Part 4. By certain writers, Catherine's conduct in connection with the above episode has been described with every epithet of condemnation. One French chronicler declares that the Guises arranged these executions as a distraction for the ladies who were becoming bored at staying so long in one place. Others state that Catherine and her ladies were present at the spectacle and took pleasure in watching the tortures inflicted on the Protestants. Others that these executions were witnessed by the cold-hearted court from a balcony, as if they had been stage representations. And again that Catherine showed her cruel temperament by finding fault with the Duchess of Guise, when the latter wept copiously, at the cruel shedding of so much innocent blood. Blood, by the way, which was being shed by that lady's own husband and his brothers. But the facts do not appear to bear out this colour which the French Protestant writers have put on them, though it was one natural enough, perhaps, to the friends of those who were being put to death. It was not Catherine and her ladies, but Francis II and his court, of which they formed a part, who looked on at these executions. 
and it was not as an amusement or from a wanton pleasure in cruelty that they were there, though the arrangements made by the Guises no doubt caused it to have that appearance to those whom Francis, Duke of Guise, and his brothers thus slaughtered. So far from its being any pleasure to the court to be there, we know that both Francis the Second, Mary, and many of the rest were almost fainting from the dreadful spectacle, and that it was just because Catherine and all of them felt so horrified at it that she arranged for them all to quit Amboise the next day and depart to Chenonceau. The Guises, in whose hands Francis was a mere puppet, insisted on the presence of the king and his whole court at these executions with a threefold object. First, to have to watch such an execution would tend to intimidate all at the court, who, like Condé, might be inclined to take part with the enemies of the House of Guise. Second, the presence of the members of the court on such an occasion would tend to embroil them with the Protestants, which was just the effect it had, causing the Protestant writers to declare that they were there as an amusement and to inveigh against them for such heartless cruelty. Third, any member of the court who refused to be present at the execution of those who had plotted against the king's authority and made an organised attack on his residence, could ipso facto be pointed at by the Guises as being an enemy of the king and a friend of those who had desired to make him their prisoner. It is not likely, for instance, that Condé would have been present as a spectator at the execution of those whose leader he had been, and who still honoured him, if he had not been forced in this manner. Hence neither Catherine nor any other lady of the court could be absent, and we see this exemplified in the case of Anna d'Este, Duchess of Guise, who, when she refused to go to the execution, was dragged there by the Guises by physical force, and when subsequently she said that she was sure God would have vengeance on those who took so many worthy gentlemen's lives, she endured much rough treatment and anger from her husband's brothers in consequence. And if Catherine said anything to her at all on account of her weeping, which is very doubtful, it was nothing more than a remark intended to urge her to maintain a due amount of self-control. Moreover, Catherine did not remain passive during these proceedings of the Guises. She made a strong endeavour to save the lives of many of the prisoners, and we are told tried everything she could, even seeking out these new kings in their chambers and caressing them. But without avail for the Guises were determined to slay them all. It is also noteworthy as showing that these condemnatory remarks upon Catherine in connection with this episode proceed more from bias than from any solid basis of fact. That although Mary, Queen of Scots, was likewise present at this execution, and as Queen of France occupied at least as important a position at it as the Queen Mother, while also we do not hear of her having importuned her uncles on behalf of the lives of any of these prisoners, as Catherine had done, yet none have ever made similar remarks regarding Mary, Queen of Scots, in the matter. The fact is that these ladies were all of them women of their time, and that to look on at an execution of this kind was not the same thing to them as it would be to anyone in these days. France was becoming far too much accustomed to such cruel deeds, for women to fail to grow more or less callous to such sights. We may also remember that these ladies could both look on at executions, and also bear themselves with calmness and fortitude when their own turn came to suffer in like manner. Their doing the former is no proof of cruelty on their part, as it would be in our days and we, who live in more peaceful times, are in error if we impute cruelty to them, owing to our judging their actions by a standard which relates to an entirely different set of conditions. Catherine now succeeded in getting a council on the subject of the religious differences assembled at Fontainebleau, and at this council, 
notwithstanding the angry frowns of the Guises and their puppet the king, she spoke boldly against the policy which was being pursued regarding the Protestants, and stated that one half the people were Protestants, and asked sarcastically if it was supposed that the sword could be used against them all. Nevertheless, matters did not mend, and throughout the summer of 1560, plots on the part of the Protestants for a general rising throughout the south of France, including the seizure of Lyon, and imprisonments and executions of prominent Protestants on the part of the Guises, continued to take place. One artifice of the Guises did Catherine much harm in the eyes of the people of France, while it has largely affected the writings of the contemporary French historians who deal with the events of these 17 months. So long as the puppet king was entirely under their dominion, and so long as the entire civil and military rule of the country was by his decree vested in them, the Guises knew that neither Catherine nor anyone else could interfere with them. At the same time, they knew how greatly they were hated by the people, and to shield themselves as much as possible from the odium caused by their actions, they made the incapable youth who was their tool in authorising their proceedings from time to time quote also his mother's name as he had done in his original decree, thus making it appear as though their actions were done with Catherine's concurrence. And although she opposed them on every occasion at the court, she was powerless to take any action which would right her in the eyes of the country, so long as the position remained the same with regard to Francis. However, a time was rapidly approaching when she would be freed from this position and be able to show all men what her real attitude was. The Guises now began to fly at higher game and planned to achieve the death both of the Prince of Condé and his brother, Antoine de Bourbon, King of Navarre, the two leading members of the Protestant party, and were not deterred even by the fact that they were of the blood royal and next in succession to the throne after Catherine's sons. Condé especially was known by them to have been a party both to the plot which had ended at Amboise and to that for the seizure of Lyon. Accordingly, in September, the Guises caused the King of Navarre and the Prince of Condé to be summoned by the King to the court, which was then at Orléans, the King stating that he wished them to come and refute their accusers, and promising them a safe conduct and a friendly reception. Catherine could not have known what the Guises meant to do, nor would they have dreamed of letting her know it, and she no doubt did not believe that they would dare to take the lives of princes of the blood royal. For when Navarre and his brother showed reluctance to come, she wrote, begging them to do so as the king wished it so much, and that she and all the court would receive them hospitably. On their arrival at court, Condé was at once seized under the orders of the Duke of Guise and thrown into prison as a preliminary to his execution for high treason, while for the King of Navarre, who could not be thus accused, the Guises had another plan. So far from Catherine having plotted to take the lives of Condé and the King of Navarre, as has been maintained, her subsequent conduct in this affair completely disproves the assertion. The plot to which the Guises persuaded Francis to agree, and which they carefully kept concealed from Catherine, knowing that she would find means to frustrate it, was that he should summon Navarre to come to his apartment in a private manner and unattended. The only attendants on the king would be themselves and the Marshal de Saint-André, Francis was to reproach Navarre with the state of the country, and then in a sudden rage to strike him with his dagger, when the other three would assail him as defenders of the king's person, and dispatch him. But Catherine heard of the plot just in time. She hastily sent the Duchess of Montpensier to warn Navarre of it, and told him not to go when an invitation came to him from the king. At the same time, she herself went to her son, 
and used all her powers to prevent him from obeying the Guise's command in this manner. The account of what took place and of how Catherine had saved his life was afterwards related by Navarre to his wife, Jeanne d'Albray, who published it in a manifesto in 1568. He told his wife that in accordance with the Queen Mother's warning, he disregarded the first invitation he received from the king, but on receiving a second summons, thought it would appear cowardly to refuse, and went. As soon as he entered the room, the Cardinal de Lorraine closed the door carefully behind him. The king received him wearing his dagger, and reproached him bitterly as he had been instructed to do. But Navarre, owing to the warning he had received, replied in so humble a fashion that he gave no opportunity to the king to display any wrath. And after a time Francis allowed him to depart unharmed. To the intense rage of the Cardinal de Lorraine, who in disgust at the failure of the plot as he departed, burst out with, Voila! Le plus portant cœur que fut jamais. Catherine was overjoyed at having been thus successful in saving Navarre's life, and herself related her part in it to his wife, Jeanne d'Albray. But the Prince of Condé was still held fast in prison, and the Guises, who knew that he was their chief opponent, were determined that his life at all events should not be saved. Catherine had succeeded in getting his prison changed from Orléans to Amboise, but that was all she could effect. And she writes an ambiguously worded letter, saying how strong the latter place was, and how impossible it would be for him to escape thence, apparently with the object of showing that the Guises need have no objection to Amboise as the place of his incarceration, concluding with... I do not think that there is any place in all France where the prince could be safer or better looked after. That she intended to save his life if she could is fully proved by what happened immediately afterwards. So that whatever else this letter may mean, it certainly does not mean that she intended to help the Guises to effect their purpose. Nevertheless, the latter secured Condé's condemnation to death and got the sentence of death signed by the king, and the 10th of December fixed as the date of the execution. The Guises would not suffer even Condé's wife to see him, not even when she begged to be allowed to do so once before he died, to give him courage. Just at this juncture, Francis II fell ill, and a few days later this incapable youth breathed his last, after a reign of 17 months. He died on the 5th of December, 1560, his name hated throughout France, owing to his surrender of himself and his kingdom to such a rule as that of the Guises. End of section 8 Read by Jane Bennett Section 9 of the Medici, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young Chapter 20 Catherine de' Medici Part 5 1561-1574 On Francis II's death, Catherine's second son, Charles, a boy of ten, succeeded to the throne. Catherine was made, during his minority, Queen Regent of France, and the first act of her power was one which tells directly against the view ordinarily held of her. The death of the Prince of Condé, who was marked out as the leader of the Protestant party, and whom they were already proposing to make king, must have seemed highly desirable not only in the interests of Catherine's sons, but also in the cause of France, since the death of their leader might be expected to paralyse the Protestants, 
and prevent their commencing a civil war as they were now proposing to do. Catherine, whose affetto di signoreggiare had at last a chance of being gratified, desired greatly that scope for showing her ability for ruling, which she would have as queen regent on behalf of a boy of ten. On the other hand, Condé's existence seriously threatened this. He had already headed two plots in succession, which had as their object to place him on the throne instead of Catherine's sons. And he had been openly spoken of by the Protestants as Louis the Thirteenth. Condé, in his prison, was ignorant of Francis the Second's death, and supposed that he himself had but four more days to live and Catherine had only to let the law take its course. This, however, was not the course which Catherine adopted. We are told, Guise saw that his power was at an end, knowing that during the minority of the next king, the Queen Mother would be regent. He at once went to her and urged her with all his force, for the sake of her own and her son's safety, to allow the sentence of death which had been passed against Condé to be carried out, and also to put to death the King of Navarre. Catherine flatly refused, countermanded the execution, and ordered Condé to be set at liberty. She then sent for the King of Navarre, told him she had had no hand in the schemes to take the lives of himself and his brother, and offered him her friendship on two conditions. First, that he would forego his claim to the regency, for which he had small desire and was not fit, and second, that he would make peace with the Guises, so that there should be an end to the strife between the two religious parties, which was threatening to desolate France. These terms he accepted, and he also was set at liberty, though Catherine must have had grave doubts whether he would keep the second promise and she would have been justified, for he very quickly broke it. Thus did Catherine make her first essay in that long endeavour to be a peacemaker to France, which was to continue through so many years. We who have followed the course of the Medici have seen at least three other occasions in which conduct similar to this was displayed by them. And as Condé's prison doors roll back, we seem to hear an echo of Lorenzo's speech, that he who knows how to forgive knows how to rule. Catherine, on becoming Queen Regent, showed at once the line she intended to adopt, of endeavouring to maintain on the part of the throne that attitude of toleration towards both the religious parties, which she justly considered to furnish the only hope of preserving the country from the horrors of a desperate civil war. Within a month of her being installed in power as Queen Regent, she published a royal edict, dated 28th of January 1561, stopping all persecutions in consequence of religion, releasing all who were in prison on that account, and ordering that there should be full liberty given to the Protestant religion throughout France. At the same time, she wrote to the Pope, demanding that communion in both kinds should be administered to the laity, that prayers should be said in the vulgar tongue, and that certain other reforms in church matters desired by the Protestants should be carried out. For the above edict, she was, of course, abused by the Roman Catholic party, who under the regime of the Guises had nourished high hopes of seeing Protestantism stamped out in France. And when a little later she similarly granted concessions for which the Roman Catholics asked, she incurred like abuse from the Protestant party, though there were a few among the latter who took a more balanced view. As, for instance, Longue, who wrote that she sought to moderate all things. And throughout the years that followed, we find her always struggling to maintain the same attitude, and incurring odium, now from one side, and now from the other in consequence. So that among the writings of the day, the assertions as to her duplicity 
and double-mindedness throve apace. This endeavour to maintain or recover peace by holding the balance between the two parties who divided France is the key to all Catherine's conduct. She strove for it earnestly, while as yet the two adversaries were only drifting towards war. And when at last they broke into open war, she again and again brought about peace by the same method, though only to find her efforts nullified by their inability to live peaceably together. And this long and strenuous effort as a peacemaker to France, notwithstanding that by no fault of hers it failed of permanent success, will ever remain Catherine's chief claim to praise. But the dark clouds which had gathered over France were not to be dispelled by any such efforts, forcibly as Catherine made them, nor until long continued storm had poured itself out upon that country. Throughout the whole of the remaining twenty-eight years of her life, that storm raged. And during that time, France saw no less than eight religious wars follow each other in succession, while the short interludes of peace were each scarcely more than a truce, during which the two antagonists collected their strength for a fresh contest. And bitter indeed was this conflict. Mesere, who wrote about fifty years after Catherine's death, says, If anyone were to relate all that took place at this time, in different parts of France, all the taking and retaking of towns, the infinity of small combats, the mutual insults and retaliations, the furies, the massacres, it would take up an immense number of volumes. Before, however, this great contest began, Catherine, during the year 1561, made three splendid efforts to avert it. With a greater breadth of view than anyone else in either France or England at that time possessed, she formed a plan to assemble a national church council of the leading Protestants and Roman Catholic authorities in France, and to direct their deliberations herself on the lines of studying the institutions of the primitive church, investigating how far divergencies from the latter were the cause of the complaints made by the Protestants, and seeking to arrive at a settlement on this basis. This was a most remarkable proposal. There was no other sovereign in Europe then, or for many generations afterwards, who could have conceived the idea of assembling such a council and of personally directing its deliberations on the lines proposed. And perhaps no other act of Catherine's more strongly brings out the ability and breadth of view which had been brought to the service of France by a Medici coming to occupy that throne. The idea was entirely Catherine's own, and her letters show how much she hoped for from it and had she been able to carry out her own strong desire to keep the matter a strictly national one, and to prevent all outside interference, it is probable that success might have crowned her efforts, and France have been saved from all the miseries of the most terrible period in the history of that country. The proclamation ordering the assembly of this National Church Council was issued on the 25th of July and on the 9th of September, 1561, three weeks after Mary, Queen of Scots, a widow of 19, had bidden a sad adieu to France and sailed for Scotland, the council assembled at the monastery of Poissy, near Saint-Germain. On the Protestant side were 32 leading Protestant ministers, Jean d'Albret, who was looked upon as a host in herself, the Prince of Condé, Admiral Coligny, and a number of Protestant nobles, while on the Roman Catholic side were 40 bishops, 6 cardinals, 12 doctors of the Sorbonne, the Cardinal of Lorraine and his brother, the Duke of Guise, the Queen Regent with the boy King and the rest of the royal family, the members of the Council of State, the Chancellor, Michel de l'Hôpital, and other important members of the court, made up one of the most impressive assemblages which France had ever witnessed. 
Catherine opened the proceedings by a speech expressing a hope that the debates might be so conducted as to bring peace to the kingdom. Fine addresses were delivered by the principal leaders on either side, and at first Catherine hoped for success. But on the 19th of September, there arrived Cardinal Ippolito d'Este of Ferrara, who held three archbishoprics in France, and also came as legate from the Pope, and with secret orders from the latter to stop the proceedings. And from the moment of his arrival, all chance of a settlement between the two parties ended. Frequent scenes and furious discussions brought about an entire failure of this effort by the 26th of September, and Catherine's concluding speech, in which she dissolved the council, said, We are sorely grieved that this meeting hath not produced that fruit we had wished, so needful for the love of the whole Christian church. Catherine then tried another plan, and to avoid the angry recriminations of a large assembly containing many discordant elements, arranged a smaller conference, consisting of five of the leading Protestant ministers and five of the principal Roman Catholic clergy who were in favour of reforms. This conference was successful in arriving at a settlement satisfactory to both parties and drew up a joint agreement on the disputed points concerning the Holy Communion, the chief point of dissension, and submitted this agreement to the bishops for their approval. But the latter, knowing that the Pope would never agree to it, refused their assent. Meanwhile, Catherine continued to carry out her broad-minded reforms, with a view to an equal treatment by the state of both religions. Various important posts were given to Protestants, Fresh decrees furthering religious liberty were continually being promulgated, and Paris, strongly Roman Catholic, saw appointed as its governor a Protestant, the son of the constable Montmorency. But Catherine's difficulties were enormous. Not only were constant intrigues by both the rival parties to circumvent each other, taking place even while these conferences were being carried on, but also every country around was eager to take part in the conflict and make France a general battleground in which the religious question which divided Europe should be fought out. And Catherine had to strive hourly against anything being done which would afford a pretext to any of these adjacent powers for intervening in the strife. Her chief embarrassments came from the fanatic Philip II of Spain. He kept at her court, as his ambassador, Thomas Perrinot de Chantonnec, a man employed by Philip more in the capacity of a detective than as the envoy of a foreign power, and who threateningly told Catherine that he knew every detail of her days. Through him, Philip II menaced her perpetually with an armed intervention by Spain on behalf of the Roman Catholic Party in France, while Chantonnet, knowing that France in its present disunited state was powerless to resist such an invasion, treated the Queen with the utmost insolence on every occasion that her policy of tolerance caused her to take any step to the advantage of the Protestants. On the opposite side of France... The emperor was closely watching for some excuse to make war upon Catherine in order to recover Metz. Elizabeth of England was eagerly on the lookout for some pretext for taking arms on behalf of the Protestants, while from the Italian side, the Pope and the Duke of Savoy were both anxious to join in the fray. Catherine also laboured under another difficulty. Unlike her opponent Elizabeth, who was surrounded by a band of exceptionally able and reliable counsellors, Catherine was in this particular unusually ill-provided, and while surrounded by spies who watched and reported to their own governments every word and look of hers, she had not, as she truly said in her letters to her daughter, a single person about her in whom she could trust. At the very time that the conference, with a view to a peaceful settlement in religion, was sitting, 
A plot was set on foot by the Protestants to carry off her younger son, Henri, and set him up as a rival to his brother Charles. And another proposal was made, even in her council of state, by one of the Roman Catholic leaders to seize herself and throw her into the Seine in a sack. This latter proposition she had the pleasure of herself hearing, through the tube which she had secretly had made from the council chamber to her apartment. Added to these various perplexities, she had daily to exercise blandishments, prayers and remonstrances in order to keep the leaders of the two parties from coming to blows, even at her court. And when the strain of so many anxieties told visibly, even on her strong physique, the ambassador Chantonnet had the insolence to tell her that he believed that her indisposition was merely due to her eating too many melons, to which she replied with some dignity that it was not the fruits of the garden, but the fruits of the spirit which made her ill. Well might one of those acute Venetian ambassadors who watched and reported all these proceedings say that he did not know what ruler would not have made mistakes under so many difficulties, and express surprise that she did not give way to one or other of the two parties. Nor did any termination to this strain appear likely to occur. She had for a time, by her tolerant measures, put down the flames which had been ready to burst forth, but none saw more clearly than Catherine herself that they were not put out. And what she said in writing to her ambassador in Spain was only too true. The ashes of the fire which has gone out are still so hot that the least spark will make them leap up into bigger flames than we have ever seen. But Catherine was not yet daunted, and although both her first and second attempts to avert the impending conflict had failed, she made yet a third. Paris, violently opposed to her policy of toleration, broke out into tumults. Every Sunday there was fighting of some sort round the churches, and in these quarrels lives on both sides were lost. Whereupon Chantonnet had the effrontery to tell the Queen Regent that if she did not quickly put an end to these heretics, his master would come to the assistance of her Catholic subjects and would certainly make war upon her. But Catherine came of a family who were not to be cowed by threats like this, and she told him bluntly to tell his master that she would be mistress in her own house. Accordingly, in December 1561, she called a meeting of the States General and made a powerful speech in favour of a policy of toleration, and then summoned a third conference between the two parties to meet at Saint-Germain on the 3rd of January, 1562. Consisting of 30 presidents and councillors, chosen from the eight parlements, and 20 members of the Privy Council, including the Princes of the Blood. The proceedings began with a remarkable speech from the Chancellor in favour of allowing the two religions to live side by side in France. This was followed by a most powerful speech from Catherine herself in the same direction. After a debate of twelve days, a compromise was at length agreed upon, which, though not all that Catherine desired nor completely satisfactory to either party, was more agreeable to the Protestants than it was to their opponents. Having thus at last obtained a settlement which an influential body of men, representative of both parties, could accept, Catherine drew up an edict following their recommendations, which afterwards became very celebrated under the name of the Edict of January. This, though it did not allow the Protestants to build churches, authorised their assembling for worship. Still more important than this, it gave them for the first time legal recognition, the state thus acknowledging two different religious bodies. But when this edict, containing such an entirely new departure, was sent by the Queen to the Parliament to be registered and published, they altogether refused to publish it, 
and took up a most determined attitude. Catherine was furious. She at once mounted her horse and rode at a gallop from Saint-Germain to Paris, and, says the account, in good sooth it seemed as though she would gallop straight into the council chamber in order the better to demonstrate her absolute will and have the edict registered. She found the president and councillors obdurate. They declared that the edict would do evil to the kingdom and dishonour to God, and that nothing should induce them to register it. And at length the president rose to leave the hall, solemnly saying to the queen, Your majesty is taking the road that will lose you crown and kingdom. But Catherine was as firm on behalf of her measure of toleration as the deputies were against it, and as we watch her standing alone before the Parliament, determined that they and not she should give way in a matter which she felt was the last chance of saving the country from civil war. Suddenly before the mind's eye, there rises that scene of thirty-two years before, at the door of the Murat convent in Florence, when she was a girl of eleven, and the whole drama seems to have been acted before on a smaller stage, and we know which side will conquer, and so it turned out. For notwithstanding all the determination of the president and councillors, Catherine prevailed, and before she left the council chamber, she had obtained a promise that the edict should be published on the following day, which was done. Though in publishing it, the Parlement themselves attested that her determination had been greater than theirs by adding the words, Published, read, and registered in our Court of Parlement at Paris, by reason of the importunity of those who profess the so-called new reformed religion and this only provisionally while awaiting the majority of the king. End of section 9 Reading by Jane Bennett Section 10 of The Medici, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Blakely, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. This episode completed Catherine's first year of power, and that year certainly showed no insignificant tale of work. She could not undo the harm which had been done during the years when she had compulsorily been merely an onlooker, while incapacity of various kinds, first during her husband's reign, and then during that of her son, steadily drove France towards civil war. But on getting hold of the helm, she made a fine effort to save the ship from the rocks even at the eleventh hour, and her edict of toleration immediately on coming to power in January 1561, her proclamation of July assembling a national church council, her broad-minded reforms in the matter of giving appointments equally to those of both religious parties, her second conference in October when the first failed, her third conference proclaimed in December when the second failed, and lastly in January 1562, her celebrated Edict of January, which so often formed the basis of peace in the years which followed, collectively made a record of which any ruler of a country drifting towards civil war might well be proud. But all Catherine's efforts were rendered of no avail. The Roman Catholic Party, headed by the Guises, declared her Edict of January to be intolerable and that there could not be two religions side by side in France. The Protestant party declared that her edict did not go far enough, and clamored for further concessions. Several fights with the slaughter of opponents took place, and both parties now prepared openly for civil war. An intercepted letter from a Protestant minister disclosed to the Guises the fact that the Protestants were plotting a wholesale massacre of the Roman Catholics in Paris. The writer of the letter quoted the examples of Gideon and Judith, and said that he felt in his spirit a godsent vocation to do this deed. Ten years later, on St. Bartholomew's Day, 1572, the Roman Catholics apparently felt the same vocation. Catherine, knowing that the object of both sides was to get possession of the king, withdrew with him to Fontainebleau, first ordering the Duke of Guise not to bring an armed force into Paris, an order which he promptly proceeded to disobey, whereupon Catherine, determined to keep the antagonists apart if possible, begged Condé to quit Paris, which he did. 
Guise, with a Roman Catholic force, seized Paris. The Protestants, under Condé and Coligny, seized Orleans and other towns in the Loire and the Rhone, and the first religious war had begun, May 1562. The Duke of Guise proceeded with a force to Fontainebleau, captured the Queen Regent and the King, and escorted them under a guard first to Paris and thence to Melun, where, though treated with courtesy, they were practically Guise's prisoners and were not allowed to communicate by letter or other means with the outside world. Elizabeth of England, joining in the conflict, sent over an English force which occupied Havre and Rouen, and the war rapidly spread in both northern and southern France. Meanwhile, Catherine, who after a time had managed to get free from the power of Guise, was struggling in every way to reconcile the combatants, but for some time without any success. Various battles ensued, in which at length the King of Navarre was killed, Condé taken prisoner by the Roman Catholics, and Montmorency by the Protestants. In February 1568, while the Duke of Guise was besieging Orleans, occurred an event which, while it assisted the cause of peace at the time, laid the seeds of still more bitter strife later on. This was the murder of the Duke of Guise, who, as he was riding unarmed back to his house, was shot by Poltro de Meret, a Protestant who had attached himself to the Guise's army in order to execute this crime, and who at his trial stated that it was Admiral Coligny who had employed him to commit the deed though whether this was true or not has never been made clear. Francis, Duke of Guise, was a noble character, and the most deservedly beloved and honored figure of that time, and his murder by the Protestants was the chief cause of the bitter hatred against Admiral Coligny and the Protestant party on the part of the Roman Catholics, which eventually culminated in the massacre on St. Bartholomew's Day ten years later. This death of the commander on the Roman Catholic side, combined with the other events which had for the moment deprived both parties of the most fiery spirits among their leaders, gave Catherine an opportunity which she at once seized. She forthwith arranged a meeting between herself and the two chief prisoners on either side, Montmorency and Condé at Orleans, and in a few days had caused them to agree to terms of peace which were almost exactly on the lines of her Edict of January and on her return to Amboise, where she was then staying, she was able on the 19th March, 1568, to proclaim in an edict called the Edict of Amboise the peace which she had effected. Thus ended the first religious war, and Catherine was so delighted at her success that she is said to have danced for joy. She had a right to feel satisfaction, and her joy was not dimmed by any knowledge that seven other wars of the same kind were to follow, in which the most arduous labors in the same direction were often to fail. She promptly carried off her children, Charles IX, Henry, Duke of Anjou, Francis, Duke of Alençon, and Marguerite, together with the Prince of Condé and his wife, the young Henry, now Duke of Guise, the other young Henry, now King of Navarre, and a brilliant company to Chenonceau for a happy week of festivities to celebrate the cessation of the war. These were varied and picturesque. Naval battles and water fetes on the Cher were followed by fireworks and torchlight dances in the long galleries while spirited encounters took place in the woods and gardens between troops of gentlemen and ladies of the court disguised as satyrs and nymphs. Having been so successful in causing the two parties to make peace, Catherine's next move was to bind them together as much as possible by urging that it was the duty of all Frenchmen to combine to drive the English from French soil, and entirely owing to her own enthusiasm on this point, she was able three months later to assemble an army commanded by the leaders of both parties which advanced to attack the English in Rouen, and which she herself accompanied, going into the battle herself, and saying that she would never rest until she had driven the English out of France. The campaign was entirely successful, and in July the English force surrendered, and France was once more free from foreign invasion. It was the last time for many a long day that the two parties of Frenchmen were to be found fighting on the same side. Peace having been thus brought to France for a time, Catherine caused Charles IX, now fourteen, to be installed at Rouen, and then took him on a prolonged tour through France, both to make him acquainted with his kingdom and also to keep the court away from Paris, where religious animosity was always ready to break out. This tour lasted nearly two years, from the spring of 1564 to the end of 1565, in the course of which the court visited nearly all the principal places in southern France. The court numbered over 800 persons accompanied by a huge retinue of servants, and there are graphic accounts of this immense progress, which was like a moving pageant. We hear of gaily dressed nymphs who issued from glittering rocks by the wayside, of shepherds who suddenly appeared and recited long Latin poems, 
and of various other diversions to beguile the tedium of the march. At bar le duc there took place the baptism of the queen's grandchild, Christine of Lorraine, the child of Catherine's daughter Claude, and at Mascon Catherine was called upon to settle a fierce sectarian quarrel over the knotty point of whether in processions the children of Protestant parents could be permitted to walk side by side with these of Roman Catholic parents. Though the fires of civil war had been quenched, the ashes still smoldered, and while at Roussillon, Catherine found it necessary to issue a further edict, calling upon each of the two parties to respect the religion of the other. The court reached Bayonne in June 1565, where Catherine had arranged that her daughter, Elizabeth of Spain, was to meet them. There followed three weeks of balls, tournaments, and other festivities to celebrate this happy meeting. Elizabeth was accompanied by the Duke of Alva, afterwards of such evil memory in the Netherlands, who had come to Bayonne with a fixed program, carefully settled beforehand with his master, Philip II, in accordance with which he intended to extort from Catherine agreement to three main conditions, the exclusion of all Protestants from holding any public office, the prohibition of Protestant services, and the expulsion from France of all Protestant ministers. And the Protestant writers have always maintained that at this meeting Catherine, with the utmost duplicity, made a secret compact with Alva for the extermination of Protestantism in France, and that the massacre, which occurred seven years later in Paris, was the result of this meeting between the Queen Mother and Alva. But here we have a notable instance of how modern research overthrows long-established errors due to reliance upon the perfectly unscrupulous partisan writers of that epoch. For the above theory in connection with this meeting at Bayonne, a theory which had until recently become so firmly established as to be an accepted fact of history, has now been completely refuted by the publication of the Spanish state papers, including Alva's secret dispatches to his master, Philip II. For these show that so far from anything of the kind having taken place, Alva, by his own admission, entirely failed to induce Catherine to agree to anything that he urged for the repression of Protestantism. He tells his master that he was unable to get her to agree to prohibit the Protestant preachers, authorized by her Edict of Amboise, or to dismiss her Chancellor, Michel de Apital, or to consent to any of the other proposals which he urged upon her. And this notwithstanding, the lofty energy and consummate prudence displayed by the Queen of Spain to assist his efforts, adding that he found the Queen Mother more than cold for the holy religion. The court returned to Paris at the end of the year, and during the following year, 1566, Catherine, besides many labors to maintain the existing tranquillity on the religious question, was mainly occupied in getting, with the able assistance of her chancellor, a large number of very important enactments passed for the better administration of justice throughout France. These swept away numerous unjust practices of the courts of justice, and many abuses in the management of the police, which pressed severely on the people, and with which her recent prolonged progress through the country had made her acquainted. Many of the new laws thus enacted obtained a permanent place in French legal code and were of lasting benefit to France. These four years, 1563 to 1567, were also a time of much activity on Catherine's part in other directions. Both of what were, until 1871, the two principal palaces in Paris are inseparably connected with her name. The Palace of the Louvre began a few years before his death by Francis I, on the designs of the architect Lescaut, was completed by the end of Henry II's reign, and Catherine was the first sovereign of France to occupy it, when she came to power after her son Francis II's death. And in the year 1564 she began building her own palace of the Tuileries, connected it with the Louvre by a long gallery passing through the crowded quarter of the city, which then occupied the intervening space. For this palace, she employed the celebrated architect, Philibert de Léomé, who had been ousted from royal favor by the Guises during Francis II's reign, but whom Catherine, on coming to power, reinstated. Besides this work, she was also busy in making extensive improvements at Fontainebleau, Genonceau, and others of the royal residences, in collecting objects of art of all kinds, and in patronizing literature. And notwithstanding all the storms of war through which France passed during the years of Catherine's rule, they form a notable epoch in French literature. The poets Ronsard, Du Bellay, Bellot, Binet, and other lesser stars, having made this period famous by their collective name of the Pleiad, Catherine's Edict of Amboise, supplemented by that issued at Roussillon, 
had kept France free from war for four years. The religious animosities, however, fomented on the one side by the Calvinists in Geneva, and on the other by the intolerant temper of the Guise faction, at length again blazed out, and in September 1567 the second religious war was begun by an attempt made by the Protestants to seize the person of the young king while the court was at Meaux. The Battle of St. Denis followed, in which the constable Montmorency was killed. During the next six months severe fighting took place in various parts of France, in the course of which the Protestants took Rochelle, which became their permanent headquarters. Eventually, in March 1568, the Second War was brought to an end by the so-called Peace of L'Anjumeau. How untiring were Catherine's efforts to maintain peace, and how great the difficulties of the task, is shown in the reports of the various ambassadors. Thus the Spanish envoy Alava, in one of his secret reports to Philip II, informs him that as the queen was coming one day from the council chamber, and when he, being pressed by her to say why he looked at her as he did, remarked in reply that her eyes were swollen with weeping, she said, It is but too true, but I have every reason for alone and single-handed I bear the burden of affairs. You would be amazed, so she spoke, if you understood what has just happened. I no longer know in whom I can trust. Again the Venetian ambassador, Giovanni Correr, reports thus, I do not know what prince would not have made mistakes in such a great confusion. How much more a woman, a foreigner, without trusty friends, frightened, and never hearing the truth from those about her. For my part, I have often been surprised that she did not become thoroughly confused, and give way to one or other of the two parties, which would have been a final calamity to the kingdom. It is she alone who has preserved the remnant of royal majesty still to be found there. For this reason, I have always pitied rather than blamed her, and she has often reminded me of it when speaking of her distresses and the woes of France. Words such as these give a vivid picture of the difficulties which Catherine's policy entailed on her and of the ability with which she adhered to it. Nevertheless, difficult though it might be, the correctness of that policy is shown by the ambassador's remark that her abandonment of it would have been a final calamity to the kingdom. The peace made at L'Anjumeau proved but of short duration. The two parties had no real intention of becoming reconciled, and in August 1568 the third religious war began, and was fought with great ferocity on both sides. Two months after it began, Catherine heard of the death of her favorite daughter, Elizabeth of Spain, at the age of twenty-four. Catherine's grief thereat was very great, but she had little time to indulge in it, as the terrible state of affairs which now supervened in France claimed her whole energies. In March 1569 was fought the Battle of Jarnac, in which the Prince of Condé was killed. That which Catherine had long labored to prevent now occurred, the participation of other countries in the conflict— a German army entered France to assist the Protestants, and a Spanish one to assist the Roman Catholics, and with the entrance upon the scene of these foreigners the contest took a more savage character. The leaders on both sides gave orders to their troops to give no quarter. City after city, upon being taken, was sacked. Whole garrisons had their throats cut, and the war assumed the appearance rather of one between fanatical Hindus and Mohammedans than between people of a civilized race. The time was a terrible one, for both Protestants and Roman Catholics. The various woes suffered were enormous, but all that we are concerned with in this history is Catherine's conduct in connection with them. The Protestants, who could not be retaliated upon in the same way, delighted in destroying and defiling everything which in the eyes of their opponents was sacred. They demolished churches and mutilated shrines, they dragged crucifixes and relics in the mud, they gave the holy sacrament to dogs and cattle and greased their boots with the holy oil. They profaned the sepulchres of the ancestors of the reigning family. They burnt at Clary the bones of St. Louis, king of France, and at St. Croix the heart of Francis I. They destroyed the beauty of every building on which they could lay hands, and in short poured out their fury upon everything which to the French people represented refinement, care for religion, and pride in the past history of their race. This conduct roused their antagonists to frenzy. A cry of fiercest wrath and a vow of vengeance went up from all Catholic France, and instead of one massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day, it was more to be expected that there should have been a dozen such in different cities of France. And in fact we find contemporary writers, after that massacre speaking in this very strain, 
and saying that it was no more than a due retaliation for all that the protestants had done throughout france not only in massacring their opponents but also in their hateful destruction and desecration of everything revered by the latter how deeply catherine felt all this misery which in spite of her strong efforts to avert it had descended upon france can be seen in her letters she says i do not think there is any one in the world who can feel more pained and horrified at the atrocious evils wrought by the foreign troops than i who am dying of it on my feet the popular feeling of maddened indignation and hatred was most of all rampant in paris while second only to the citizens rage against the protestants was their wrath against the queen mother for her tolerant edicts allowing to protestants liberty of worship and prohibiting persecution of them the parisians declared her policy to be like ordering the cats and the rats to live at peace together they petitioned for leave to abandon france and go to live in some country where they might practise in freedom the catholic religion and when she ordered her edict of toleration to be read to the people from the pulpits the priests not only refused to do so but again and again referred to her in their sermons as jezebel it was no wonder that catherine wrote all the towns in the kingdom would not cause me one half the evils i endure from paris alone nor is it any wonder with protestants in such a state that they could commit the enormities which have been mentioned and with the roman catholics calling the queen mother jezebel because she would persist in allowing their enemies liberty of worship no record of Catherine's actions emanating from either side is to be relied upon, except where such is corroborated from more trustworthy sources, or by facts admitted by these writers themselves in formulating their indictments against her, as, for instance, this one of her persistent pursuit of a policy of toleration. Catherine at this time, feeling Paris an unsafe abode, and knowing, on the other hand, how eager the Protestants were to capture the young king, while southern france was in too great a state of conflagration to afford an asylum carried him off to metz where for some time the court took refuge she still labored for peace and on the same lines of mutual toleration and rights if those who started the war had had the patience to let us complete what we had begun at st germain we should not be in the difficulties we now are in regard to bringing about a durable peace which after all even when it is obtained cannot be more satisfactory to both parties than the old edict of january end of section ten recording by beth blakely section eleven of the medici volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Blakely, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. After various important cities had been taken and retaken, the Battle of Montcontour was fought in October 1569, at which the Protestants, now commanded by Colony, sustained a severe defeat. More sieges followed, but at length, in August 1570, Catherine succeeded in bringing the war to an end by arranging the peace of St. Germain and Laye in which the terms obtained by the protestant party were even more favorable to them than those contained in her edict of january nevertheless as the result catherine only reaped abuse from both parties philip too urgently demanding that the war should be continued until the protestants were completely crushed was full of wrath at any peace having been made the roman catholic party in france declared that the terms of the peace which the queen mother had arranged were far too favorable to their foes and that the vanquished had been treated as though they were the victors while the protestant party declared that the terms were not favorable enough and also that they were only a trap laid for them by the duplicity of the queen mother but catherine had to consider france as a whole the country was utterly exhausted by these furious wars its condition altogether deplorable and a cessation of this fratricidal strife absolutely necessary any peace between two combatants which strikes at all an uneven balance between them is always considered unfair by both that which catherine had effected at st germain and laye was of this nature and monsieur le valet speaks no more than the truth when he says it was another effort to make the two religions live together and to give some repose to exhausted france as to the accusation against catherine of duplicity on this and other similar occasions while they are only what was to be expected from the state in which france was they probably gained their chief material from the necessity perpetually laid upon catherine 
if France was not to be invaded by the Spaniards, of outwitting Chantenay, between whom and herself an hourly duel, on his part in order to discover what were her intentions, and on her part to hide them from him, was ceaselessly fought. Undoubtedly this peace was a great triumph for Catherine, the second of this kind which she had gained, for the results proved her wisdom, notwithstanding the wrathful grumbling of the Roman Catholics that the terms were too favorable to the Protestants, and of the Protestants that they were not favorable enough, France quieted down, and the Protestants went to their prish, and the Roman Catholics to mass without molesting each other. Catherine was overjoyed at her success, and though she saw that after so fierce a storm the waves could only be expected to calm down by degrees, she had good hopes of being able to create permanent harmony, and as she says in her letters, make a nation of France. Speaking of those who declared that the miseries of France had all been caused by her refusal to suppress the heretics, she writes, If things were even worse than they are after all this war, they might have laid the blame upon the rule of a woman. But if such persons are honest, they should blame only the rule of men who desire to play the part of kings. In future, if I am not any more hampered, I hope to show that women have a more sincere determination to preserve the country than those who have plunged it into the miserable condition to which it has been brought. Catherine now had leisure to turn her attention to other affairs than the miseries of war, and to think of matrimonial projects and artistic concerns. Her palace of the Tuileries was by this time nearly finished, and she delighted in laying out its gardens, and in arranging to adorn them with all sorts of examples of the new art in earthenware pottery which had been invented by the celebrated Palissy. She had a year or two before rescued him from extreme poverty, as well as from persecution as an ardent Protestant, and she now established him as superintendent over these various works at the Tuileries. At Chenonceau also she was busy in laying out new gardens on an elaborate plan, and here too she employed Palissy to assist her, while in many other directions she indulged those artistic tastes which she had inherited. The marriage of her children also now occupied her attention. The peace between the two rival parties in France enabled her to set on foot three matrimonial projects, all intended to cement the reconciliation and make it permanent. These were the marriage of her son, Charles IX, now twenty, to Elizabeth of Austria, the daughter of the tolerant Emperor Maximilian II, that of her next son, Henry, Duke of Anjou, to Elizabeth, Queen of England, and that of her daughter, Marguerite, to Henry of Navarre, the son of the redoubtable Protestant, Jean d'Albret. The first of these marriages, that of Charles IX to Elizabeth of Austria, was soon carried out, and they were married in November 1570. The negotiations for the marriage of Elizabeth, Queen of England, to Catherine's son Henry, or failing him with his younger brother, the Duke of Alençon, dragged on for years and were eventually dropped. But the third marriage, that of the Princess Marguerite to Henry of Navarre, was also carried out, and took place two years after that of her brother Charles. Elizabeth of Austria, Catherine's new daughter-in-law, was virtuous, wise, and had in every way a charming disposition. Having no taste for politics, she occupied her time almost entirely in numerous charitable works, and was looked upon by the people as a saint. She was very sincere in her religion, and when at her coronation, at which she was to receive the Holy Communion, various unforeseen delays caused the ceremony, instead of taking place in the morning as intended, to be delayed until three in the afternoon. She remained fasting the whole day, and although it being feared that she might faint, authority was given for her to break her fast, she would not do so and, says the record, received the Holy Communion at six in the evening, as upright and gay as though it were six in the morning. The difficulties in the way of Catherine's project for the marriage of her son, Henry of Anjou, with Elizabeth of England, were mainly created by the Pope, who foresaw in it a possibility of the Church of France seceding from his authority in the same way as the Church of England had done. But great as these difficulties were, those which had to be overcome in connection with the project for the marriage of the Princess Marguerite with Henry of Navarre, which marriage was Catherine's main attempt to bind the two hostile forces in France together, were greater still. For not only was the Pope equally opposed to this project for similar reasons, but also Henry's mother, the strong-minded and stern Calvinist Jean d'Albret, had great doubts as to whether she could allow her son to marry a Roman Catholic, much as she desired the match from every other point of view. However, having at length made up her mind to agree to it, but to keep her son as much as possible away from Roman Catholic influences, she came early in 1572 to Paris in order to conduct the negotiations herself, ordering her son to remain in Navarre until she had completed them. 
Jean d'Aubray had been in bad health for some time, and the feverish energy with which she threw herself into the preparations for her son's marriage exhausted her remaining strength. Finding her health failing, she summoned her son from Navarre, but died in Paris on the ninth June before he arrived. Catherine visited her on her deathbed and wrote in admiration of her patient endurance of her sufferings. It has for three centuries been a favorite story that Jean d'Albret was poisoned by the Queen Mother by means of a perfume which Jean had bought from Catherine's perfumer. The story, which had its origins in libels published by the Calvinists at Geneva, had been repeatedly disproved by the most reliable historians, as well as by reports of Jean d'Albret's two physicians, Caillard and Denou, both of them Protestants who had written many things against the Roman Catholic party, and would at once have denounced such a crime had it occurred. But nevertheless, the story continues to hold its ground. No amount of disproof, nor even the fact that Catherine was scarcely likely to endeavor to overthrow a plan which she had so long labored to achieve, having had any weight against so fascinating a piece of sensational fiction. The most recent authority on the subject dismisses the story in the following words. A legend that she, Jean d'Albret, had been poisoned, long formed one of the stock charges against the Queen Mother. There is as little evidence for it as for most of the similar accusations brought in those days. Henry of Navarre, accompanied by five hundred Protestant gentlemen, arrived in Paris a few days after his mother's death, where Admiral Coligny, the young Prince of Condé, and a great concourse of the Protestant party were already assembled for this marriage, which was to heal all wounds and bind the two parties firmly together. And on the 18th August, 1572, the Princess Marguerite and Henry, King of Navarre, were married in the midst of a grand assembly of all the principal men of both parties, and with much magnificence. A ball at the Louvre followed in the evening, and the festivities continued throughout the next three days. But this great gathering of the rival parties in a city at all times so inflammable as Paris had serious dangers for the preservation of the state of outward tranquillity, which had now been maintained for two years. The things which the Protestants had done in desecrating and destroying all that their opponents held dear were not forgotten, and the citizens of Paris, who had so long loathed Catherine's policy of toleration towards their opponents, were roused to a white heat of animosity at seeing the marriage of their king's sister to the leader of the rival community, while many of the attendant circumstances of the ceremony were highly unpalatable to them. On the other hand, the majority of the Protestant party liked the marriage no better, thinking they saw it in a design to entrap their leader, Henry of Navarre, into becoming a Roman Catholic. Neither party, so far as their subordinate members were concerned, took any pains to hide their contempt and hatred of the other, or to avoid offending their religious sentiments. Even the marriage ceremony itself, at which the whole body of the Protestant gentlemen had ostentatiously withdrawn when the celebration of the Mass began, and gone to walk up and down outside in the gardens, provided fuel to the slumbering fires. Moreover, there were still deeper causes of enmity at work. Henry, Duke of Guise, the leader of the Roman Catholic Party, looked upon Admiral Coligny as the treacherous murderer of his father, Francis, Duke of Guise, a crime which Henry, his mother, and the whole family of Guise were firmly determined to avenge on the first opportunity, Henry's mother being specially urgent with him to take this vengeance so that this marriage, intended to bind the opposing forces together, had within it all the elements for a fresh outburst of their enmity. Hatred and suspicion were rampant on both sides, and it needed but a spark to set all Paris in a blaze. That spark was soon supplied. On the 22nd August, four days after the marriage, Admiral Coligny, walking from the Louvre to his house, was fired at from the window of a house inhabited by one of the retainers of the Duke of Guise, and wounded in the hand and arm. The king and queen mother, knowing the seething state of Paris, and being in the greatest anxiety lest anything should be done by either party which might bring on a conflict and a civil war in Paris itself, immediately on hearing of this outrage, visited Colony, expressed the greatest concern at what had happened, and sent the king's own surgeon, Ambrose Paré, a Protestant, to attend Colony, and a guard of their own soldiers to protect his house. They offered the Protestant nobles lodgings round their leader, and they promised Colony that there should be a strict search for the criminal and his prompt punishment. The house was at once searched, but the man, whoever he was, had escaped. These actions were, of course, put down by the Protestants to dissimulation on the part of the Queen Mother, but there is not a particle of proof to support the charge. They are just such as would be natural in the position in which Catherine found herself, 
placed between two bitterly hostile parties who could only be kept at peace from hour to hour with difficulty while a conflict within paris itself threatened to engulf the throne and would in any case bring to ruin all that catherine had striven for and hoped that she had achieved by the marriage just concluded this outrage upon colony brought matters to a climax all through the twenty third august secret plots were going on each party frightened and suspicious plotting to massacre the other and at early dawn on the morning of the twenty fourth st bartholomew's day the roman catholic party suddenly rushed upon their opponents armed bands headed by the guises the duke of angoulême and other roman catholic nobles issued into the streets and roused the only too eager paris mob to fall upon the protestants throughout the city the duke of guise at once hurried with all speed to colony's house accompanied by a band of his own soldiers who overpowering the guard forced their way into colony's chamber and murdered him his party were taken by surprise the fanatical hatred of the citizens burst forth like a river long dammed up and the protestants with the exception of the prince of conde the king of navarre michel de l'hopital and others whom catherine protected either in the louvre or by sending strong guards to defend their houses were brutally massacred throughout paris the historian sully speaking of this massacre says the whole house of guise had been personally animated against the admiral ever since the assassination of francis duke of guise by poltrol de mere whom they believed to have been instigated to this crime by colony and it must be admitted that the admiral was never able to clear himself of the charge if this cruel slaughter was as many people are fully persuaded only the effect of the revenge of the house of guise it must be confessed that no person ever executed so severe a vengeance for an offence as did henry duke of guise for his noble father's murder the protestant writers have maintained that this massacre was a long premeditated scheme but this view is no longer held by historians fuller knowledge having shown that the spanish ambassador cuniga spoke the truth when he reported that with the exception of the murder of colony the rest was due to sudden impulse it remains to consider whether catherine is to be held responsible for this massacre as on the authority of the infuriated protestants has so long been declared or whether the charge of responsibility on her part was only another result of their long-standing prejudice against her one which made french protestants prefer to lay this crime on the shoulders of the italian woman rather than on any of their own nation first as to the murder of colony one of the two murders which have always been charged against catherine and both of which accusations are now considered to have been unjustly made against her the circumstances under which it is now known that colony's murder took place the fact that catherine is acknowledged to have had no special feeling against him and above all the fact that this murder meant the ruin of a plan to achieve which she had labored hard for two years appear sufficient to dispose of this charge end of section eleven recording by beth blakely section twelve of the medici volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Blakely, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Section 12. Catherine's part in the massacre as a whole is a question on which, like that of the guilt or innocence of Mary, Queen of Scots, opposite opinions will probably always continue to be held, and this is inevitable, because the only records of her actions on these three days, 22nd to 24th August, are all furnished by persons who were violent partisans of one side or the other and at a time when none took pen in hand with any other idea than to obscure the truth as much as possible for the advantage of his party the protestants desired to show the queen mother and her son the king as guilty of the crime perpetrated against themselves while the roman catholics desired to show that in what they did the queen mother and the king were on their side the following fact is eloquent as to the way in which under such conditions the history of this affair has been written it was declared by the protestants that charles nine had himself assisted in the massacre by firing at their co-religionists from a window of the louvre the very window was pointed out and so thoroughly was this fact supposed to be authenticated that a tablet to that effect was in after years affixed to the window this tablet was however removed in eighteen o two on its being discovered that that wing of the palace was not even built until the reign of henry four 
It is from accounts written in this fashion that we have to gather what Catherine's words and actions within the Louvre were at this time. None know really what went on in the Louvre during the 22nd and 23rd August preceding the commencement of the massacre on the morning of the 24th, and it is upon this that the question of Catherine's part in the matter turns. Two things only are certain. First, that of those around Catherine during these three days, there is not one, either Protestant or Roman Catholic, French, English, or Italian, whose word on the subject we can trust in the smallest degree. And second, that if Catherine were responsible for this massacre, then it was the only occasion in her life that she resorted to violent measures. Even the Venetian ambassadors fail us at this point in Catherine's history, and throw no lights as regards the massacre in August 1572. There is a long gap in the Venetian state papers at this part of the 16th century, the official dispatches of this period having been lost. The regular ambassador at this time at the court of France was Sigismondo Cavalli. In addition to him, an ambassador extraordinary, Giovanni Michieli, had just been deputed to that court for a special purpose connected with the proceedings of Spain and Flanders. And in default of the official dispatches, all that we have is a semi-private account by this Giovanni Michieli, which is by no means equally trustworthy. This purports to give a circumstantial report of the proceedings in the Louvre, charges Catherine with the sole responsibility both for Colony's murder and for the general massacre, and states that her action was the result of a long premeditated plan, and that the whole scheme of the marriage of Henry of Navarre and Marguerite had been merely a trap to inveigle all the leading Protestants to Paris. But the remarks made by M. Merime show how little real value can be attached to the statement of Giovanni Michieli. M. Merime says, I cannot admit that the same men could have been able to conceive a crime whose results must be so important and to execute it so badly. The measures, in fact, were so ill-taken that soon after the St. Bartholomew the war began afresh, the reformers certainly winning all the glory of it, and retiring from it with new advantages. In short, is not the assault on Colony, which took place two days before the St. Bartholomew, sufficient to refute the supposition of a conspiracy? Why kill the chief before the general massacre? Was not this the way to alarm the Huguenots and put them on their guard? Giovanni Michieli, in fact, was not in a position to furnish information of any value. He had only reached Paris a week or two before. He was unable to base his opinion on any observations of his own, as he appears to have had as yet no communication with the Queen Mother, who had only arrived from Lorraine just before the marriage, and he is only able to relate what he had heard on this subject from persons highly situated who have access to the secrets of the court. In other words, from just those persons whose evidence, as already noted, is in this case absolutely worthless. We are therefore left to form such inferences as we may from the surer ground of collateral evidence, and from the following considerations. 1. If Catherine was responsible for instigating this massacre, then she committed an act which is at variance with the whole of the rest of a policy steadily pursued by her for a long number of years, in spite of the greatest difficulties and to carry out which she had made formidable enemies, and an act which entirely stultified that policy. 2. Again, if she was responsible for this massacre, then one possessing one of the most acute intellects ever seen upon a throne took action which caused all her special efforts of the preceding two years to be absolutely thrown away, and destroyed the effect of a marriage to achieve which she had undergone severe labors, and had incurred much odium from a large part of the French people. Also, it is impossible that she should not have foreseen that it would be at once declared that the marriage was a long premeditated scheme to entrap the Protestants to their destruction. 3. As this massacre began the Fourth Religious War, Catherine, who had everything to gain by peace and to lose by war, yet becomes by the hypothesis the deliberate originator of that war. How far the theory that Catherine de' Medici was responsible for the massacre on St. Bartholomew's Day with these facts is a point which each must decide for himself. They cannot be slurred over or explained away, but must be faced. What, however, is probably the truest view of this question was long ago pointed out by a Protestant historian, the fair-minded rank, who stated that the responsibility for this massacre had been unfairly placed by the French people on the shoulders of Catherine de' Medici, whereas it was they themselves who must bear it, for that this massacre was caused entirely by their own state of wild fanaticism and the frenzied hatred by which at the moment both of the religious factions who faced each other in Paris were possessed. The two parties into which Frenchmen were divided 
furiously embittered against each other by many cruel deeds during ten years of conflict, and brought into close juxtaposition in a single city, were seething with animosity, and from the moment that Guise's retainer fired upon Coligny, were bent upon massacring each other. It was only a question of hours which should be the assailant, while the knowledge of what their opponents were planning drove each forward. The Protestant party, who had marched into Paris in confident strength, had already once before planned to massacre the Roman Catholics in Paris, and it was to a large extent fear of what their opponents might do which caused the rapid resolve of the Roman Catholics to be the first in the field. The night, the unexpected situation, the thought of having in the Louvre itself thirty or forty of the most redoubtable Protestants, a part et de pile, the first swordsmen of France, all combined to make Guise and his party rush to massacre their opponents before the latter should do the same to them, and to force the Queen Mother and the King to stand aside while they worked their will upon their foes. Catherine, between the two antagonists, had only one object, that which she had always had, to preserve the throne from being overwhelmed in the storm. But she was placed in a more difficult position than hitherto, owing to the close proximity of the two foes. Walsingham, the English minister, afterwards told her that it would have been easy to seize the persons who were plotting on the Protestant side, and so have avoided the explosion. But his argument took no account of the fact that any force with which she could have done so must have been a Roman Catholic one, and that would at once have brought about the same catastrophe. As far as can be judged in the absence of any record that can be trusted, Catherine, for once in her life, was thoroughly frightened, as well she might be, and seeing that a conflict was going to take place which she had no longer any power to prevent, sought only to keep herself and her children and her daughter's husband from being destroyed in it. While the massacre was spreading through the city, she sent her commands to the Roman Catholics to desist, but no one paid any attention to her, and for the time being Paris was as much beyond any control as a city in which a sack was taking place. The truth is that France had become by this time so maddened by these furious religious wars that such a massacre was likely at any time in any city, and as a matter of fact, as soon as the news of what had occurred in Paris spread, similar massacres did take place in one or two other towns. It is also evident that Queen Elizabeth of England did not attach much credit to the reports of Catherine's responsibility in the matter, for though she thought it politic to express her reprobation of the massacre, she did not break off the negotiations for her own marriage with Catherine's son. The above massacre ruined all Catherine's plans. During the visit which she and her son had paid to Colony when he was wounded, Charles IX had said, looking angrily at the Duke of Guise, It is I who am attacked, whereupon Catherine had added, it is all France. And she was right. The flames of war were relighted, destined to cause still greater desolation and misery to France than even that which the country had already experienced. The fourth religious war began at once, and raged with great fury for the whole of the next twelve months, until in July 1578 a temporary truce was effected, called the Peace of Rochelle, as before on the lines of Catherine's now celebrated Edict of January. End of section 12 Recording by Beth Blakely. Section 13 of the Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young. Chapter 20 Catherine de Medici, Part 9. 1574 to 1589. The Peace of Rochelle proved nothing more than a six months' truce, and in February 1574 the Fifth Religious War broke out. Three months later, in May 1574, Charles the Ninth died, and as he left only a daughter, he was succeeded by his brother, Henry the Third, then twenty three. When Charles the Ninth's queen, the good Elizabeth of Austria, was condoled with because her child was not a boy, she replied that she was glad of it, since that would only have added yet further divisions to cause affliction to distracted France. Henry the Third, Catherine's favorite son, who now ascended the throne, was a strange character, inheriting more of his father's peculiar disposition than either of his brothers but with all his father's weak points greatly intensified. He had plenty of intelligence, had been made lieutenant-general of the realm, and had taken part with distinction in the various campaigns during the previous five years, including the battles of Jarnac and Moncontour, 
and had eight months before been elected as king of poland where he governed with much success and won the greatest admiration from the poles notwithstanding that they were mostly protestants but his abilities were combined with an indolence which caused him on becoming king of france to make his mother undertake all affairs that were troublesome and also with a taste for the most extravagant follies a taste which became more pronounced as he grew older on hearing in poland that he had become king of france he arranged a midnight escape from his faithful polish subjects in the manner of a conspirator fleeing for his life entertaining at this time a violent passion for the princess of conde he poured forth the most extravagant sentiments to her in letters written in his blood but on hearing of her sudden death he showed his grief by wearing little silver death's heads all over his dress even on his shoe ribbons and after a week appeared completely to forget her and became entirely occupied in making proposals of marriage to a young lady louise de vaudemont whom he had chanced to see a month or two before at nancy meanwhile he went off to avignon and while there joined the flagellants and insisted on the ladies of the court and even his mother doing so also his follies and extravagant vagaries were innumerable each more fantastic than the last his mother idolized him she could refuse him nothing and those who have held that catherine de medici was without the softer feelings natural to a woman have only to study the expressions in her letters wherever the name of her son henry occurs to discover that this view is far from the truth we have a somewhat touching glimpse of catherine at this period in connection with a visit which while staying at lyon she paid to the studio of the painter cornet de lyon there looking round the pictures on the walls she saw one of herself as she had been about five-and-twenty years before attired in the french mode with a little cap edged with pearls and a dress having large sleeves of silver tissue lined with links after gazing at it sadly for a few moments recalling as it did the memories of the years of her long trial in the days of diane de potier she turned to the duc de nemours and said cousin you remember well the time and fashion of this picture and you can say better than any of those around us if i was once as i am painted here henry the third was crowned at rheims on the eighteenth february fifteen seventy five and two days afterwards married louise de vaudemont her father was the count de vaudemont and it speaks well for henry as a counterpoise to his many follies that he thus chose for himself the daughter of a simple gentleman of france whose family were not even wealthy rather than any of the royal princesses who had been spoken of as a desirable match for the new king of france his choice proved an excellent one louise had a charming character her beautiful disposition modesty wisdom and innate goodness being praised by all writers she shone like a star amidst the corruptions of the court yet gave offence to none and was respected by all around her while her husband invariably treated her with deference and affection both protestants and roman catholics had at least found one point at all events on which they could agree for both of them loved and reverenced la reine blanche as louise came to be called and it is one of the brightest spots in the character of catherine de medici that she was intensely fond of louise de vaudemont and showed it to the last hour of her life meanwhile the fifth religious war continued to rage over france and an end to the conflict seemed as far off as ever though we are told the queen mother did not cease to labor for peace tooth and nail at last however in april fifteen seventy six a peace was concluded at beaulieu again on the basis of catherine's edict of january and this time france obtained rest for nearly a year 
nothing could better show how thoroughly the edict for which catherine had fought and won her struggle with the parlement in january fifteen sixty two provided just that balance between the two parties which the needs of france required than the fact that again and again after war had raged we find the protestants in negotiating for peace stipulating for the terms of this edict and again and again find peace between the combatants made on its basis if only the two parties had been sufficiently ready to live and let live to have adhered to it france would through catherine's celebrated measure of toleration have saved herself many years of misery some have held that there was in catherine's career as the ruling spirit of france a protestant period and a roman catholic period and a complete change from the former to the latter after the year fifteen sixty two but this constant attainment of peace on the basis of her edict of january time after time for so many years afterwards entirely contradicts this and refutes the idea that there was ever this change in her attitude it was just because her attitude remained always unchanged that the same edict published so many years before was able to form the basis of each peace that she brought about this spirit of tolerance and natural attraction for freedom is a remarkable feature in catherine's character in view of the opinion on that point which was universal in her day nothing roused greater wrath and contempt in the men of that age than to note a spirit of tolerance in a ruler they invariably attributed it to either weakness lukewarmness or duplicity and seeing that after all catherine was a roman catholic and as such necessarily had more sympathy with that side in the contest that she should so steadfastly have adopted a policy of toleration shows a degree of broad-minded statesmanship of which she had considerable reason to be proud it was undoubtedly due to florentine ideas and to that republican atmosphere in which she had been born and brought up and which had been traditional in her family ideas of freedom in political life lead naturally to ideas of freedom in religion one outcome of this spirit on catherine's part was a notable one for when we remember how terrible were the horrors of the inquisition nothing tends more strongly to make us regard catherine de medici with favor than the fact that at a time when the inquisition was perpetrating its detestable enormities in every other country round in spain in italy in the netherlands and every other roman catholic country catherine boldly refused during all the years of her life to allow it to be established in france this brought upon her the enmity of both the pope and the fanatical philip the second of spain whose vengeance in the defenceless state of france could only be warded off by much diplomacy on catherine's part with as a result many accusations against her of duplicity nevertheless catherine was as iron on this point and the anchor which was the sole protection of many lives from horrible tortures and death was not to be torn from its hold repeatedly we find men whose lives were in danger from this cause in the adjacent countries flying to catherine for protection and obtaining it one of the most notable of these was Carnesecchi, a Florentine who, becoming one of the chief of the Protestant reformers in Italy, was pronounced by the Pope a refractory heretic. Forced to fly for his life from Italy, he was protected by Catherine from the wrath of the Pope, and when, after a long residence in France, he ventured to return to Florence, Catherine wrote to her kinsman, Cosimo I, urging him to protect Carnesecchi as she had done the disregard of which recommendation resulted in carnesecchi's being burnt in rome by the inquisition the peace of beaulieu having once more brought a tranquil state of affairs catherine who had inaugurated the reign of each of her other sons by a fete at chenonceau did the same in henry the third's case that which she now held for him was on a more splendid scale than any which had taken place before every effort being employed to make the occasion as joyous as possible 
and with the hope that at last the miseries of war were at an end but what we chiefly hear of in connection with the festivities are the extravagant follies of henry he received the guests dressed as a woman with jewels in his hair earrings in his ears strings of pearls round his bared neck an embroidered collar and high ruff his youthful courtiers were arrayed in a similar manner while by his desire the ladies of the court were attired as men but with bare shoulders and flowing hair but the sunshine was only temporary and the storm clouds were soon again gathered over france from the first the guise had refused to be bound by the peace made at beaulieu as they had declared it to be too favourable to the protestants they therefore now formed the celebrated league with henry duke of guise at its head for the defence of the interests of the roman catholic party this league had for its policy one the exact opposite of catherine's being formed to overturn her principle of a recognition by the state of two religions side by side in france and while she laboured steadily to attain peace by means of this principle the league strove to keep up a state of war until protestantism should have been crushed and was the cause of innumerable troubles to france during the next twenty years the first result of the formation of the league was that the guise were enabled so to manipulate the elections that the states-general when assembled consisted almost entirely of deputies opposed to the principle of the toleration of two religions and on the first january fifteen seventy seven this assembly declared themselves in favour of one religion only and forced the king to abolish the edict of january the protestants at once took up arms were assisted with money by elizabeth of england and the sixth religious war began it lasted for nine months but in september the principle of tolerating both religions was again agreed to and a peace was made at bergerac in september fifteen seventy seven catherine was now approaching sixty years of age and her appearance was very different from that which she had borne in the days of henry the second instead of the beautiful figure for which she had been so admired during all the earlier portion of her life in france she was now immensely stout but she still danced and rode played games and excelled in shooting with the crossbow her complexion was fresh she had not a wrinkle on her full round face which was set off by the long black widow's veil she always wore fastened back from her forehead and falling down upon her shoulders this was for indoors when she went out she put a little woolen hat upon the top of it had we met her we should have probably thought her a jolly soul a little inclined to be cynical but we should have found her good company colloquial in her speech with vivid turns of expression at times however she could blaze out as fiercely as queen elizabeth of england herself but with more dignity one who knew her well has said she had these moods not seldom even with the greatest princes and at such times she was possessed by anger and took a lofty tone nor was anything in the world so superb as she on such occasions for her tongue spared the truth to no one her ability for business and power of concentration were marvellous brantome says that he watched her write twenty long letters in an afternoon and on one of those uncomfortable journeys in a litter to which ladies were then subjected she unconscious of joltings and of stoppings would read through ten pages of parchment a dry procès verbal as if she were a lawyer or reporter without lifting her eyes till she had finished her style in writing is business-like and terse illumined here and there by homely wit and racy phrase perhaps nothing better shows catherine's strong nature and entire freedom from all small-minded vanity than her tolerance of jokes against herself when she heard that the protestants called their biggest cannon la reine mere because it was so heavy and unwieldy that they could not move it a joke which few ladies of stout figure would relish she only laughed in the most good-natured manner at the unflattering jest 
for that of her nature she was jovial and loved a good repartee a contemporary writer says she was never gayer than when someone brought her a good satire against herself the bitterer ruder coarser the better once when she and the king of navarre were standing in the window of a ground-floor room they listened to two vagrants outside who were roasting a goose and who as they did so talked loudly telling ugly stories of the queen cursing her and giving her foul names for all the evil she had done to them whereupon the king of navarre wished to take leave of her intending to go and have them hanged but she only called through the window to them eh hey, what after all has she done to you it is thanks to her that you have that goose to roast in her letters to her son henry she often displays the sadness of heart which came over her as she saw him more and more given up to follies and surrounding himself with others more foolish than himself whose advice he took instead of hers she writes to him give orders for some one to tell me how your affairs are going i do not ask this because i wish to control them but because if they go well my heart will be at ease and if they go ill i can help your trouble for you are my all and whether or no you love me you do not trust me as you ought forgive me if i speak straight out like this i have no wish to live any longer i have never cared for life since your father died excepting as i might serve you and god in another letter to him she says and this is my request that you will publish anew the ordinance forbidding swearing and blaspheming and will punish those who do not keep it and firmly resolve not to give either bishopric or any benefice with the cure of souls excepting to learned men of good life end of section thirteen Section 14 of the Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 20, Catherine de' Medici, Part 10. In August 1578, hostilities again threatening to break out, Catherine, her son henry the third having none of the gift which she possessed for reconciling hostile parties set out on a prolonged tour through the south of france in order to prevent war if possible the first of those wonderful journeys of pacification in which she was engaged during the greater part of the next three years to believe her intendant of finance she writes it seems to me that one ought to quit everything else and to employ every means to avert the storm of war i am determined not to return until i see peace but if god gives me grace to fulfil my desires i hope that this kingdom will feel the good of my labours and that enduring peace will reign there one gazes in astonishment at this woman of sixty hampered by bodily infirmities and the difficulties of travel at that period in france and confronted by such apparently insuperable obstacles in the irreconcilable temper towards each other of the two hostile parties resolutely setting forth notwithstanding that it was an acute pain to her to thus absent herself from the son whom she adored determined to overcome all difficulties to carry out the motto she had chosen when a girl of fifteen and to bring serenity to her adopted country and displaying a power of endurance and an ability to win success even under the most adverse conditions which have extorted admiration even from those most prejudiced against her for example miss sitchell says it is impossible not to admire the indomitable spirit with which as she grew older she pursued her object in the face of every hardship every obstacle between fifteen seventy eight and fifteen eighty one she knew no repose driven by her purpose she was continually traversing france amidst perils and discomforts unimaginable so heavy in person that motion meant suffering she was always on the move 
so rheumatic that acute pain was chronic she uncomplainingly braved every kind of climate now she was carried in her litter under a burning sun now she was snowed up for weeks amid all the bodily privations and the difficulties of getting provisions that winter in the country then signified the provinces to which catherine chiefly turned her attention in this attempt to prevent war were guienne languedoc provence and dauphine she received no encouragement from those around her in regard to the task upon which she was bent all thought and said that it was a hopeless endeavour the hatred between the two factions having grown so implacable and that she was attempting the impossible nevertheless she managed to bring about a conference between the two opposing parties and so successful was she in allaying their mutual feelings of enmity that she ended by getting articles of agreement which placed the two religions on an equal footing drawn up and signed by both sides at nerac in february fifteen seventy nine and war was once more averted catherine's satisfaction at her success was naturally considerable to the duchesse de zay she says in another letter you have understood me and i you for more than forty years of kindly memories and to this lifelong friend she now writes i have finished my labours here and in my humble opinion have made a great many persons to lie for i have achieved that which was said to be impossible but there were other provinces still to be visited where the difficulties were even greater thus in coming to montpellier she approached a city which was on the verge of an appeal to arms and known to be inimical to her personally she writes to her son i walked the whole length of the city walls and reached the gate which i found guarded by arquebusiers as i had been told but that did not prevent me from going on fearlessly without showing dread or mistrust although they were all so near my coach especially as the road there is narrow that the butts of their arquebuses nearly touched my carriage the councils in their red robes and their caps together with a great crowd of people of both religions who followed them came to meet me with all humility offering you and me their property and lives with all the devotion of loyal subjects and both parties promised me on their honour to live according to my commands when i got nearly opposite the gate another great crowd of people came out of the town all showing a more friendly feeling than i had been led to expect the fact that i had gone among them so freely helped a good deal i am told to increase their confidence and also their certainty that peace was near i thought to have managed to sleep here yesterday so as to escape the risk of the plague by making one day's journey getting earlier to provence but i felt rather tired as i did full six leagues among the rocks of this district before my dinner in the recent troubles every church in the town had been destroyed except one and this had become a bone of contention the protestants claimed half of it the roman catholics refused to worship under the same roof and claimed the whole building she got them to refer the knotty point to her and after much acrid discussion arranged an amicable settlement in this manner catherine travelled hither and thither smoothing difficulties overcoming obstacles deliberately contrived to frustrate her purpose producing smiles where she had been met with frowns and settling innumerable disputes last of all she reached dauphine regarding which province she writes to the duchesse d'uzay here i am in your land of dauphine the hilliest and most aggravating in which i have hitherto been every day there is cold heat rain fine weather hail and the characters of the people here are just the same but god who leads me is bringing me to my goal and in ten days i shall be in my beloved france and in the city where is the dearest thing i have in the world report says that you govern him keep me in his good graces and tell descartes that since she has sat next to him at dinner i am sure he no longer wishes to die again to the same friend she writes were it not for the plague i would bring you news of your estate but all the neighbourhood round uzay is so very much infected that they say even the birds flying past it fall dead this has made me take the other road between the lakes and the sea 
and there we had to sleep two nights in tents camping thus in the service of my king whom i longed to see again in good health as for me mine is good excepting that port st marie has given me a troublesome catarrh which at the moment has turned to sciatica however this does not prevent my walking not very well though so that i am forced to have a little mule to ride upon occasions i think that the king would laugh if he saw me on it looking so exactly like the marechal de Cosset. but if one goes on living one must grow old and truly one is very lucky not to feel it more you have to ride in a carrying chair i upon a mule because i like to travel farther than you do tell me that i shall be welcome when i return at length her task was accomplished peace had been created for a time in guienne languedoc provence and dauphine but scarcely had she returned with a joyful heart to paris when similar troubles began in the north and she had to set forth again on a journey in december into picardy where she also succeeded for a time in averting war but the two religious parties had not yet learnt to live at peace together their adherents could never refrain for long from insulting each other's religion thereby provoking brawls which quickly developed into open war and in this conduct the protestants were not a whit behind their opponents while they always had a strong tendency to invoke foreign aid a course which enlisted against them every one who had a patriotic feeling for france as before therefore this inherent animosity again produced its natural result and in march fifteen eighty the seventh religious war began after continuing for eight months this war was brought to an end in november by the peace of flaix the terms of which were almost exactly the same as the agreement which catherine had got the two parties to sign at nerac this peace joined to the exhausted state of france created by wars which had continued almost incessantly for fourteen years now caused a cessation of the contest for four years fifteen eighty one to fifteen eighty five though during these years there were from time to time local conflicts in different parts of france while the state of general disorder into which the country had been brought by this long and bitter struggle was deplorable in june fifteen eighty four catherine's fourth son the duc d'alencon died which as louise de vaudemont had no children left henry of navarre the next heir to the throne catherine's many sorrows disappointments and bereavements began to weigh heavily upon her she writes about this time i am so much accustomed never to have an unspoiled joy that it does not seem so strange to me as it would to another that god will be pitiful to me who have lost so many that he will not let me see any more of them die that is what i pray of his mercy and that he will allow me to depart as befits my age catherine de medici praying that because so many of her dear ones are gone she may depart this life as befits her age is certainly not the picture of her which has been painted for us by a long succession of writers yet these are her own written words unearthed after three centuries by the patient labor of an age which seeks to base its knowledge of history on more sure foundations than those which sufficed for previous times in july fifteen eighty five the operations of the league caused the commencement of the eighth religious war sometimes called the war of the three henrys between henry the third henry of navarre and the league under henry duke of guise catherine was now sixty-six years old and was wearied with this long struggle to create peace nevertheless before this war began she took a toilsome journey into champagne to endeavor to induce guise to keep from war but without avail about this time also she became so disgusted with the follies of henry the third and the persistency with which he insisted on invariably choosing the most ill-advised courses of action that she removed from the louvre and gave up taking any part in public affairs we read of her ordering her attendants to carry her chair outside the city walls and to put her down for a while in the green fields that she might 
amid the quiet peace of country scenes gain some rest of mind and allay her utter weariness of spirit at the political condition of the country and her son's refusal to listen to her advice but catherine had adopted france as her country and notwithstanding the long abuse she had endured from the french was as intensely national as if born a frenchwoman and when she saw one-third of the kingdom occupied by the troops of the league another third by those of henry of navarre a german army also invading the country and france threatened with complete dismemberment she came forth from her retirement to make one more effort to save the country and her son's throne war now raged over the whole of france but catherine though she was by this time sixty-eight set out on the last of her many journeys in the cause of peace one which required no little courage and travelling through a large part of france which was in revolt from her son held a meeting with henry of navarre near cognac this however produced only partial results while news of the alarming state of affairs in paris created by the machinations of the league necessitated her hurrying back to the capital on her way thither she heard at mort in february fifteen eighty seven of elizabeth of england having had mary queen of scots executed that daughter-in-law to whom catherine had set latin exercises and of whom she had written twenty-eight years before that she had only to smile to turn all frenchmen's heads elizabeth had put mary to death because she was a dangerous rival to her throne and on account of the plots against herself of which mary had become the centre if it did not cross catherine's own mind it must have crossed the minds of others that elizabeth's position in the matter was exactly that in which catherine had been placed in december fifteen sixty with regard to the prince of conde and yet that she had not acted as elizabeth had done even though she would have had more excuse since she had merely to allow as she was strongly pressed to do a sentence of death already passed against him by others to take effect on arrival in paris catherine found a revolutionary government installed there which prompted by the league was intriguing with spain both to seize the king and also to make over bologna to philip the second in order to assist the armada which he was preparing for the invasion of england however these plans were eventually foiled and after a time henry the third was able to leave paris in command of an army to attack the germans and expel them from france the war continued during the rest of the year fifteen eighty seven but at length in february fifteen eighty eight a sort of peace was patched up between henry the third and the duke of guise paris however was entirely on the side of the latter and on the verge of revolution the king therefore ordered guise not to come to the capital this order he disobeyed pretending not to have understood it and entered the city on the ninth may being received in the streets with the usual shouts of one religion the king was urged by those around him to have guise assassinated on his leaving the louvre and had determined on doing so but at the interview between the king and guise catherine suddenly seeing what her son contemplated took him aside and spoke to him so forcibly that he allowed guise who on entering the louvre had wondered if he should leave the palace alive to depart unharmed three days later paris rose in revolt on behalf of guise and the league barricades were quickly erected cutting off the different quarters of the royal troops from each other the swiss troops were forced to surrender and the king with his wife louise and his mother protected by a very small force were besieged in the louvre henry the third's cause seemed ruined and catherine must have felt that it was chiefly his own fault through the many follies he had committed we are told that as the king the queen and the queen mother sat at dinner on the evening that this revolution took place catherine while her son sat unmoved silently shed great tears throughout the entire repast however next day henry managed to escape from the louvre and fled from paris leaving his mother to see what she could do by her well-known gift for reconciliation issuing from the louvre almost unaccompanied catherine went to seek the duke of guise 
her journey across the city was a difficult operation the streets were everywhere blocked by barricades and in each of these it was necessary to induce those who guarded them to allow her to pass and to make an opening for her sedan chair but though the leaguers were in open rebellion she induced them to do so all heads being uncovered to the queen mother nothing could show better than this the influence which catherine once so despised by the french people had in thirty years gained among them as so often before she was successful in assuaging the angry passions raging and though everything was against her she succeeded in getting guise to accompany her to chartres where the king was and in arranging terms of peace though the latter practically left guise all-powerful in the kingdom eleventh july fifteen eighty eight within a fortnight after this peace was made in france the spanish armada appeared off the coast of cornwall and the great ten days naval battle between spain and england began in which the maritime power of spain was utterly destroyed but peace was not yet come to france and round catherine's deathbed the storm was still to rage henry the third was now determined to assassinate guise but remembering what had taken place before carefully kept his design from his mother catherine worn out by so many labours and anxieties was by this time in a dying condition and removed to blois that fortified chateau on the loire which francis i had so greatly improved and enlarged thither in october the king summoned the states-general to assemble and there on the twenty eighth december fifteen eighty eight henry carried out his plot to rid himself of the duke of guise in the great northern wing built by francis i and affording such a splendid example of french renaissance architecture catherine in her richly decorated range of apartments lay dying close by rose the wonderful outside staircase the escalier a jour which for more than fifty years back she had so often seen thronged by the laughing groups of the petite bande but a very different atmosphere now pervaded the castle of blois and the gloom of tragedy and death overshadowed the abode which francis had delighted to see brightened with the smiles of beauty and resounding with laughter and the sallies of wit catherine's apartments were on the first floor while the king occupied the suite of apartments on the floor above and he had warned all in the plot on pain of death not to allow the queen mother to know what was going on the murder was secretly debated by the king and council after the manner of an execution it was to be carried out by the forty-five the band of gentlemen which henry had formed as his personal bodyguard some of the band were placed in the king's bedchamber and some in the passage outside it the duke of guise who had received intimation that there was a plot on foot but would not attend to the warning being summoned from the council chamber to speak with the king in his cabinet was attacked as he went thither by the members of the forty-five stationed for that purpose and fell dead on the floor of the king's bedchamber henry the third at once descended to his mother's apartments and entering the room where she lay ill announced to her what he had done saying that now at last he felt secure on his throne catherine knowing what the vengeance of the league would be and how this deed would again set light to the fires of war but too ill to attempt any longer to guide the vessel amidst so many breakers told him he was much mistaken and would live to repent his act weak as she was she dragged herself from her bed and went to visit the old cardinal bourbon in the prison to which she had been consigned by the king's orders but he only greeted her with the old cry that all these misfortunes were the result of her policy of tolerating two religions the injustice of these reproaches combined with distress of mind on account of the trouble she correctly foresaw would be the result of her son's deed threw her into a high fever and on returning from the interview she took to her bed never to rise from it again and a few days later on the fifth january fifteen eighty nine catherine de medici ended her long and storm-tossed life she was three months short of seventy years of age when she died two women attended her affectionately throughout her illness and were with her to the last 
her much-loved daughter-in-law louise de vaudemont and her favorite granddaughter christine of lorraine to the former catherine left as a parting gift her beloved chateau of chenonceau a solid boon to louise who on her husband's death shortly afterwards was left very badly off catherine during her lifetime had erected in st denis a double monument for henry the second and herself but when she died the war which at once broke out again on the murder of the duke of guise did not permit of her body being removed thither and she was buried temporarily in the chapel at blois but in sixteen o nine at the entreaty of the duchess of angeleme who had always liked catherine her remains were removed by henry the fourth to st denis and buried by the side of her husband the monument over them consists of the two recumbent figures of henry the second and catherine lying on a bronze couch end of section fourteen section fifteen of the medici volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the medici volume two by g f young chapter twenty catherine de medici part eleven part two introduction the character of catherine de medici as it stands revealed to us by the fuller information we now possess and divested of that cloud of mystery fable and misrepresentation which has so long been gathered round it by partisan writers is not difficult to unravel that which is its salient feature is the extraordinary way in which though always suffering abuse as an italian she threw herself heart and soul into the cause of france and amidst difficulties dangers and discouragements enough to have made the stoutest heart abandon the effort in despair laboured from the age of forty-two to that of seventy to bring peace to a country devastated by a succession of vindictive wars thus one of those venetian ambassadors who have so often formed our guides in this study of her life calls her the great moderatress while the highest authority has said of her that she was an indefatigable worker in the cause of peace in her adopted country in the previous history of catherine's family we have seen that one of their chief characteristics was a unique gift for abating strife and making those who were at feud lay aside their enmity and live at peace it was their special talent in this respect which had helped them to rise and had made their rule of florence so successful and in catherine this family characteristic comes out in even stronger degree than in any of her ancestors again and again at orleans at roussillon at st germain en laye at beaulieu at nerac at Fleix, at Chartres, and on many other occasions, she proved her peculiar gift for pouring oil on troubled waters and getting bitter foes to make peace. This is the chief characteristic which she shows during the thirty years of her widowhood. The other qualities which she possessed have been successively indicated by the facts of her life as we have followed her long and harassed career from her childhood in the Medici Palace in Florence to her death at gloom darkened Blois. And if any indication of character is afforded, as it is, by the persons whom an individual has chiefly liked through life, then it is not without significance that omitting her husband and children the persons of whom at different times in her life we find catherine chiefly fond nay more the only persons of whom we hear that she was specially fond are the nuns at the murate maria salviati elizabeth of austria and above all louise de vaudemont the three latter all of them women who in a corrupt age were like shining lights in a dark sky nor again is it without significance that so many notable protestants should have owed their lives to her such as conde navarre de l'hopital aldobrandini canesecchi and others or that one who in the circumstances of france had special reason to dread making unnecessary foes should yet have endured the wrath of the pope and the king of spain rather than ever permit the inquisition to be established in the country she ruled 
these things together with the fact that the two murders of which she has in former days been accused are now acknowledged to have been unjustly laid at her door necessitate a very different view of the character of catherine de medici from that which has been handed down to us by the biased historians of an age of bitter conflict and has so long provided material for the writers of sensational fiction it has already been remarked that to those who start from the basis that she was a villain catherine de medici will always be an enigma to look at her with affection is impossible one might as well feel affection for a hundred-ton gun on the other hand those who regard her with hatred are not those who can draw a true picture of her inevitably under such auspices stories long since discarded by history are given more or less credit points which tell against her are painted in unduly strong colours and those which tell in her favour are belittled and robbed of any weight by the manner in which they are put until a figure is produced which is an incongruous impossibility and which has to be declared as an enigma and a paradox those only will understand catherine de medici who will look at her with a calm dispassionateness if then we may neither hate nor love what remains admiration for strength for great ability for untiring energy for a self-control which has seldom been equalled for a wisdom beyond her time enabling her to see that the only policy which can give peace to a country whose people have taken up opposite views in religion is that of causing different religious bodies to learn to live side by side without conflict for steadfast determination to do the best for france for persevering endeavour through countless discouragements to be a peacemaker these are the things confessed even by her enemies which we are to admire in catherine de medici and each fresh record brought to light shows more clearly that they are justly to be attributed to her she did not succeed but she splendidly tried and it is certain that where she did not succeed none other of her time would have done so for neither in germany england or flanders was it found possible to prevent the forces let loose by the reformation from resulting in similar conflicts while in none of those countries was the attempt made as it was made in france to attain that mutual toleration which all countries have since found is the only sound policy we have surveyed the task we have seen the effort which catherine made to cope with it sectarian partisans may continue to battle over her conduct but the point on which the historian will fix his eye is did catherine amidst the terrible woes which came upon the french people through the birth of a new form of religion by her actions increase those woes or did she diminish them this is the sole issue upon which history as distinguished from religious controversy will fix its attention and will judge her and on this issue there is no doubt at all what the verdict will be in fact it has already been pronounced her splendid fight for a hitherto unheard-of principle that two religions should be allowed to exist each recognized by the state was a fight to bring peace to france by what we all now know to be the only means by which peace in such matters can be either obtained or preserved and beginning from her three magnificent efforts in the year fifteen sixty one by this means to prevent france from drifting into civil war down to the seventh and last occasion when she brought about peace for a time by the same means catherine at each juncture did the most that any one could do to prevent or to allay the miseries of france and just so far as she obtained pauses in the conflict some of them lasting for several years did she assuage and diminish the sufferings which that conflict created with the result that the name given her by the leading modern authority on the subject in summing up her character and work is that of an indefatigable peacemaker and with that verdict the whole issue regarding her conduct is conclusively given in her favour upon this last scion of cosimo's branch devolved a task severer far than had fallen to the lot of any of her family who had gone before even that of her ancestor 
cosimo pater patriae pales before that which fell upon the shoulders of his last descendant the baby girl upon whom in her cradle cardinal giulio had looked down in the almost empty medici palace and round whose path he wove so many thorny briars end of chapter twenty part two introduction we have done with that elder branch of the family which in the course of a hundred and ninety years beginning from the humble position they occupied in the time of giovanni de bici in the second generation had created a new epoch for florence in the fourth had directed the politics of all italy in the fifth had swayed the destinies of europe and in the seventh had seated its last descendant on the throne of a queen of france and governed that country through thirty years of a most troubled time we have now to turn to the descendants of giovanni di bici's second son that younger branch which carried on the succession after the death of alessandro gained the crown which the achievements of the elder branch had made possible and which had been the long dream of giulio de medici and after ruling over tuscany for two hundred years brought the family to an end in seventeen forty eight beginning with lorenzo the brother of cosimo pater patriae there are of this younger branch four generations before we reach that which succeeded to the rule of tuscany after the death of alessandro and while the first and second of these have scarcely any separate history from that of the elder branch with the third and fourth generations it is otherwise these have an independent history of their own particularly in the case of giovanni and his wife catherine sforza and their celebrated son giovanni della bandanere but although the considerations of their history involves retracing our steps it has the compensating advantage that the story of their lives often throws a sidelight on that of the elder branch the time of giovanni and catherine sforza is contemporary with that of lorenzo the magnificent pietro the unfortunate and the interregnum and the time of giovanni della bandanere with that of leo x and clement the seventh lastly the reigns of cosimo i and his son francis i are contemporaneous with the long life of catherine de medici End of section fifteen. Section sixteen of the Medici, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume two by G. F. Young. Chapter twenty one. Lorenzo the Elder, born thirteen ninety five, died fourteen forty. Lorenzo the second son of Giovanni di Bici, generally called Lorenzo the Elder, to distinguish him from his grandson of the same name, took no part in that public life which formed the chief occupation of his brother Cosimo. He was of a retiring disposition, without ambition or taste for public affairs, and was content to be a humble assistant to his more capable elder brother, and to confine himself to the banking concerns of the family. He shared in the banishment of 1433 and in the triumphant return of 1434 and lived for six years after that event, dying in 1440. He thus lived long enough to see his brother exercising the chief influence in the state, though not to see all the subsequent developments of the remaining 24 years of Cosimo's strenuous life. We see him in Benozzo Gozzoli's picture in the Medici chapel, riding by Cosimo's side on a mule and the mutual attitude of the two brothers is undoubtedly correctly represented. Lorenzo married Ginevra Calfacanti and left one son, Pierre Francesco, who was about twenty-five years old when his father died. Pierre Francesco the Elder, born 1415, died 1476. Pierre Francesco, son of Lorenzo, generally called Pierre Francesco the Elder, to distinguish him from his grandson of the same name, was eighteen when the family were banished, and he accompanied his father in their exile to Venice. In the following year they returned, and in a short time his uncle Cosimo became the chief power in the state, while the death of his father, six years later, left Pier Francesco head of his branch of the family. Like his father, he preferred a retired life, 
and though his share of the family wealth, divided between them in 1458, was nearly as great as that of his uncle Cosimo, he lived very quietly, taking little part in public affairs and confining himself to the banking business of the family, nor did he nourish any jealousy towards his uncle Cosimo and his cousins, Piero and Giovanni, on account of the more exalted position they had come to occupy in the state. He was fifty when Cosimo Pater Patriae died, and he survived his cousin, Piero il Cotoso, seeing the first seven years of the rule of the latter's son, Lorenzo the Magnificent. Pier Francesco died in 1476, at the age of 61. He married somewhat late in life, Lodomia Acciajoli, and left two sons, Lorenzo and Giovanni, aged respectively thirteen and nine when their father died. None of this younger branch possessed the financial talent which distinguished the elder branch, so that their wealth, instead of increasing, gradually diminished, but, nevertheless, Pier Francesco, at his death, left his two sons very rich. Bronzino's portrait of him is taken from Filippino Lippi's picture of the Adoration of the Magi, painted for Pier Francesco's younger son, Giovanni, in 1496, in which picture Pier Francesco and his son Giovanni are introduced in the same way as Cosimo Perto Patriae, his sons and grandsons, had been, in Botticelli's picture on the same subject, painted thirty years before, for Piero il Cotoso. Lorenzo the Younger, commonly called Lorenzo Popolano, born 1463, died 1507. Lorenzo the Younger and his brother Giovanni, the two sons of Pier Francesco the Elder, failed to continue the attitude towards the elder branch of the family which had been maintained by their father and grandfather. Their father died while they were still boys, and by the time that they were grown up, their second cousin, Lorenzo the Magnificent, had created for himself and his branch of the family a position in Italy of such weight and importance that it resembled that of a sovereign ruler. He was entertaining as an equal the rulers of other states. His children were making exalted marriages, and the whole life of the elder branch was quite different from that of the younger. All this created much jealousy in the minds of the younger branch, who found themselves occupying a very inferior position to their cousins, and they consequently began to exhibit a marked coldness towards the latter. It was in order to allay this feeling that Lorenzo the Magnificent brought about the engagement of his daughter, Maria, to Giovanni, the younger of the two brothers. But this match was unfortunately prevented from taking place owing to her death in 1487. Lorenzo the Magnificent, however, managed to keep this jealousy from growing stronger so long as he lived, and it did not come to a head until after his death in 1492. Nor did the younger branch fail to participate, to some extent, in the general exaltation of the family. For in January 1493, we find Isabella d'Este, Marchioness of Mantua, in a letter to her sister Beatrice, mentioning Lorenzo, son of Pier Francesco, as one of the four sponsors of her lately-born daughter, and saying that his brother Giovanni had come to Mantua to represent Lorenzo at the baptism of the child. Soon after this, the two brothers became so incensed against their cousin, Pietro the Unfortunate, that the jealousy they had long nourished against the elder branch was no longer restrained, and they became, as already noted, chiefly instrumental in rousing the ill-feeling against him which culminated in the banishment of the elder branch in 1494. We are told that it was principally owing to their representations that Charles VIII turned aside from Pisa and instead of taking the coast road thence to Rome, advanced upon Florence. This conduct of theirs, together with their adopting for a time the name of Popolano, and erasing the family arms from their palace, was never forgiven by the elder branch. After the elder branch had been thus driven out, Lorenzo, who was a man of very mediocre abilities, became, as the reward for his conduct towards the elder branch of his family, a member of the government. But the position only served to demonstrate his want of any capacity 
and he was merely one among other non-entities who nominally ruled Florence, while all the real power was wielded by Savonarola, and this was undoubtedly the reason why the Pope was able so easily to create a party in Florence antagonistic to Savonarola and possessing the power to bring him to disaster. Men of the mental calibre of Lorenzo, composing nominally the ruling body of the state, but being thrust into the background by the more able character of Savonarola, resented this and nourished a jealousy of him which made them ready to become the Pope's instruments in order to get rid of him. Lorenzo and Giovanni took in regard to Savonarola an exactly similar course to that which they had adopted in the case of their cousin Pietro. Fanning the ill feeling against the dominant prior of San Marco, and endeavouring to derive advantage for themselves by heading the party who are being made use of by the Pope to destroy him, and it appears to have been at their instigation that the attack was made on San Marco, which resulted in Savonarola's imprisonment and death. These two brothers are therefore flagrantly associated with one of the most disgraceful episodes in Florentine history, their conduct being all the more to be condemned because they took the ignoble part of instigators to the more prominent actors, they themselves keeping to a large extent out of sight. Upon his brother Giovanni's death in 1498, Lorenzo appropriated the latter's estate of Castello, three miles from Florence, though it really belonged to the child of a few months old whom his brother had left. He pretended to hold the property as the representative of this child, but in view of the serious difficulties with the Pope in which the child's mother, Catherine Swartzer, had become involved, never intended to surrender it. Lorenzo's whole conduct with regard to his nephew and the latter's mother, Catherine Swartzer, displayed the same meanness of character which he had shown by his action in bringing about the banishment of the elder branch of his family in order to gratify an ignoble jealousy and by his conduct in becoming one of the Pope's tools for the destruction of Savonarola. He was, however, eventually punished. When his sister-in-law was unexpectedly released from her imprisonment and came to settle in Florence, Lorenzo, much to his disgust, had to surrender to her the custody of her son and the villa of Castello. He had embezzled a large part of the boy's inheritance and dreaded this being discovered, and the manoeuvres he adopted to prevent it showed his character. The lawsuit which followed disclosed what he had done, and the shame of the discovery, together with the mortification at having failed in his object, brought on an illness which caused his death. He died in 1507 at the age of 44. Unlike his brother Giovanni, Lorenzo does not appear to have been to any great extent a patron of art. It is said that Botticelli's drawings illustrating Dante's Divine Comedy were executed for him, and Vasari says that one of Michelangelo's early works, A Little St. John, was made for him. He is, however, remarkable as being the only male member of both branches of the Medici family of whom no portrait appears ever to have been painted, and this could scarcely have been the case had he been even to a moderate degree a patron of art. He married Simaranade da Piano and left three sons and two daughters. Pier Francesco the Younger Lorenzo's eldest son, Pier Francesco the Younger, was a man of even less note than his father. Almost the only thing recorded of him is his active cooperation with his father in the attempt to rob the boy Giovanni, the son of Giovanni Popolano and Catherine Swartzer, of his inheritance. Pier Francesco took much interest in the minor arts, especially in pottery. From his father, he inherited the estate of Caffagiolo, and there he founded the Caffagiolo Manufactory, which soon became famous. Caffagiolo ware being considered to surpass even that of Faenza. He married Maria Soderini and was the father of Lorenzino, Maddalena and La Domia. Pier Francesco died while his son Lorenzino was still a boy. End of section 16. Recording by Florence.
Section 17 of the Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 22, Part 1. Joanny Popolano and Catherine Swartza. Joanny. Born 1467, died 1498. Giovanni, the second son of Pier Francesco the Elder, is said to have been one of the handsomest and most accomplished of the Florentines of his day. He was eleven years old at the time of the Pazzi conspiracy, and all his youth was passed in the midst of the splendour of the rule of Lorenzo the Magnificent. And when he was nineteen, he was engaged to the latter's daughter Maria, who, however, died before the marriage took place. When Lorenzo the Magnificent died in 1492, Giovanni was 25, and in the following year we find him visiting the court of Mantua in great style at the baptism of Isabella d'Este's daughter. After the leading part, which he and his brother Lorenzo took in the banishment of the elder branch of the family, Giovanni took service with the King of France and was given by Charles VIII a post with an annual salary of 2,000 crowns, but this did not last long, as in 1496 he was appointed by the Florentine Republic as their ambassador to Catherine Sforza, the masterful Countess of Forli. At Forli, Giovanni soon made himself highly popular, and after a short time the Countess of Forli, whose political position made it almost imperative that she should marry again, showed so much admiration for her handsome and accomplished Florentine envoy, that some began to say that she intended to marry him. Nevertheless, it was thought by most to be very unlikely that so great a personage would marry one so much beneath her in rank, and only a simple citizen. It was true that under Lorenzo the Magnificent, the family had attained a great position, but with his death, and the exile of the elder branch of the Medici, all their importance had passed away, The future Pope, Leo X, was at that time merely a wandering member of a banished family, and all the subsequent developments of that family were undreamt of. However, eventually Giovanni's various attractions prevailed, and in 1497, to the disgust of both Milan and Venice, Catherine Sforza, Countess of Forli and Imola, married Giovanni de' Medici, called in Florence Giovanni Popolano. He was then thirty and she thirty-five. It was by far the most exalted marriage which any member of the Medici family had up to that time made. Giovanni had much fondness for art, and being both accomplished and wealthy, was able to gratify his artistic tastes to the utmost. The sack of the Medici palace in 1494 had filled Florence with art treasures, which those who had plundered them were anxious to sell and Giovanni was able by this means to adorn his villa of Costello with many of the treasures of art which had belonged to the elder branch. Among other artists, he patronised in particular Botticelli and Filippino Lippi. We have seen how in 1496 the latter painted for him one of his finest pictures, his adoration of the Magi, now in the Uffizi Gallery, and the anonymous writer who is quoted by the Anonimo Gadiano, tells us that Botticelli painted for Giovanni in his villa of Castello various beautiful pictures. We do not know what these were, but the language used by the writer in question seems to imply that they were frescoes. Giovanni only survived his marriage a little more than a year. In 1498, he accompanied his stepson Ottaviano Riario to Pisa as his guardian and guide, in commanding a body of troops. He got ill at Pisa, and becoming no better, proceeded to the baths of San Pietro in Bagno. There he grew worse, and died on the 14th of September 1498, at the age of 31, his wife Catherine only arriving a few hours before he died. Their only child was a boy, born five months before his father's death, afterwards the celebrated Giovanni delle Bande Nere, Catherine Swartzer, born 1462, married 
Girolamo Riario, 1477, Giacomo Feo, 1489, Giovanni de' Medici, 1497, died 1509. Catherine Schwarzer, who was the ancestress of all the Medici who follow, was regarded by those of her own time as a sort of wonder of her age, a woman of almost superhuman ability, courage and resolution. Her history before she married into the Medici family is valuable, as, since her first marriage was into the family who were their greatest enemies, it throws a side light upon the story of the Medici. During the time of Lorenzo the Magnificent, Pietro the Unfortunate, and the Interregnum. The Sforza were not, like their contemporaries in the Este of Ferrara, of long and noble descent. Catherine's great-grandfather, Muzio Attendolo, who was given the name of Sforza, had been a private soldier, the son of a peasant, but had raised himself to be a renowned commander and married the widow of the King of Naples. His son, Francesco Sforza, had been a similarly renowned condottiere leader, who in 1441 had married Bianca Maria Visconti, and in 1450, by the help of Cosimo Peter Patriae, had become Duke of Milan. His eldest son, Galeazzo Sforza, Catherine's father, had succeeded him in 1466, and two years later had married the good Bonna of Savoy, called the Madonna of Italy, and a very different character from her sister, Louise of Savoy, mother of Francis I. Catherine Schwarzer was brought up by her grandmother, the Duchess Bianca Maria Visconti, who in all the early struggles of her husband, Francesca Schwarzer, was not only a most capable adviser and helper to him, and even on occasion a brave leader of his soldiers in battle, but also was adored by the people as a saint and the protector of the oppressed. She was the peacemaker and comforter wherever enmity, wrongs or misery existed, and it was under her that Catherine was first shown what governing ought to be like. But she died in 1470, after which Catherine was brought up by her stepmother, the Duchess Bona. Catherine, in accordance with the custom of the time, had a most elaborate education. We have already seen how, in the generation immediately preceding hers, in the time of Lucrezia Tornabuoni, ladies in Italy had begun to come forth from the seclusion previously customary and to make themselves notable by their attainments and in Catherine's time this became still more pronounced. The ladies of that age were accomplished to an extent which would now be thought scarcely possible. They were expected to be proficient in classical learning and Latin and Greek composition, to be conversant also with the current literature of their own and other countries, to have a knowledge of the various branches of art and science, to be as accomplished in music, dancing, and the playing of various instruments, as their brothers were in the use of arms, and be able to ride well and take part in field sports. Cecilia Gonzaga, Ippolita Schwarza, Catherine's aunt, and Catherine herself, with, a few years later, Isabella d'Este, her sister Beatrice d'Este, and their sister-in-law, Elisabetta Gonzaga, all furnish examples of the numerous attainments and wide range of culture of the ladies of this time. We read of Ippolita Schwarza at about twelve years old, delighting Pope Pius II, when he visited her father's court, by reciting a Latin oration composed by herself. Of Cecilia Gonzaga, reading and writing both Greek and Latin at eight years old, of Catherine herself, at the age of ten, reciting Latin verses of her own composition, to welcome Cardinal Riario to her father's court, of Elisabetta Gonzaga singing Virgil's poems and accompanying herself on the lute, and of Isabella d'Este reading Virgil and Cicero when quite a young girl, and continuing her classical studies, even when Marchioness of Mantua. While at the same time, we read of these ladies dancing all night at balls, taking part in elaborate theatrical performances 
and engaging in stag hunts and boar hunts, in which they at times experienced serious accidents. The age was one in which it was considered that classical learning was the chief ornament either to man or woman, and that it added a special charm to the latter, and no difference was therefore made in the education of girls and boys in this particular. Castiglione, in summing up his ideas of the perfect lady, after saying, all inspiration comes from women, adds that it rests with her to inspire men with hope and courage on the battlefield, in the council chamber, in the pursuit of art and learning, and in the paths of virtue and religion. And these ladies grew up to be renowned for the powerful influence which they exercised on the life of their age, an influence due entirely to the high standard of education which they had received. Mrs. Adie says, By their intellectual attainments, their delicate culture and their refined taste, these noble women of the Renaissance brought art into close touch with life, and by their gracious and kindly sympathy and knowledge, they cheered on the artist's souls that were struggling towards the light and helped to produce immortal works. Will posterity, we wonder, say as much for the ladies of our own age? But in Catherine Swartz's Life of Activity and Stress, these matters could only be pursued occasionally, having perforce during long periods to be put aside, and she had more often to exercise her power of ruling men and her courage and skill in war than her ability to compose Latin verses, to encourage art, and to enjoy the conversation of learned men. In 1471, when Catherine was nine years old, her father, Duke Galeazzo Sforza, paid that visit to Florence, which has previously been mentioned, and took with him his wife, Bona of Savoy, and his daughters, Anna and Catherine. When the latter, for the first time, met the Bedici family, into which she was long afterwards to marry. They stayed with Lorenzo and his brother Giuliano, and their mother Lucrezia Tornaboni, at the Medici Palace. And while they were amazed at the art collections they saw gathered there, it is evident that the nine-year-old girl looked with a sort of hero worship upon the twenty-two-year-old Lorenzo the Magnificent. For during all the rest of her life, though she never saw him again, she always held him in the greatest admiration. Although six years later she became a member of a family who hated the Medici with a deadly hatred, nothing ever obliterated from her mind the memory of this visit, and she all her life felt a strong attraction for the Medici and Florence. In 1476 her father, Duke Galeazzo, was murdered, and the Duchess Bona assumed the rule of Milan on behalf of her six-year-old son, Gian Galeazzo. Catherine had by this time been betrothed by her father to Girolamo Riario, nephew of Pope Sixtus IV, and it was feared that the death of the Duke might cause this engagement to be broken off. However, it did not do so, and in April 1477, when she was fifteen, she was married by proxy at Milan, the small state of Imola in Romagna being given her as a dowry. She journeyed to Rome with much magnificence, and at Parma, Reggio, Modena and Bologna, as well as at Imola and every halting place in the Papal States, was received with great ovations and festivities. She writes to her sister, Chiara, describing these receptions, and how they never cease feasting me. In these letters she signs herself, Caterina Vicicom, showing that the Swartzer carried on the name of the Visconti. After travelling in this way for over a month, she reached Rome. Seven miles from the city, she was met by her future husband, Girolamo Riario, that ex-custom house clerk who never became a gentleman, with a very magnificent retinue. And as they proceeded towards the city, they were joined by cardinals, prelates and dignitaries of all sorts, and at last, at the Ponte Mole, by the papal court, and the ambassadors of Spain and Naples. Thus attended, Catherine made her first entry into Rome. We are told that when as a bride of fifteen, she rode in through the Porta del Popolo 
in the midst of this brilliant assemblage, her fine appearance created a great sensation. Her dress was a cloak of black damask, brocaded with gold, a skirt of crimson satin, and sleeves of black brocade, and she is described as of a fine figure, having a face to be admired rather than loved, the features of beautiful outline, the face hard and even stern, but full of vigour and intelligence. They rode through the narrow streets to the ancient basilica of St. Peter's, which thirty years later was to be demolished by Julius II, and there the marriage ceremony was again performed by Pope Sixtus IV himself, after which the bride and bridegroom were escorted amidst burning perfumes and festoons of flowers to their palace, that now known as the Cassini Palace on the Lungaro in Trastevere. Then followed an immense banquet to about 200 people with every kind of extravagant magnificence, which lasted for five hours. End of section 17, part 1. Reading by Florence. Section 18 of The Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 22, Giovanni Popolano and Catherine Sforza, Part 2. The family into which Catherine had married was not an agreeable one. Sixtus IV was the son of a fisherman on the coast near Ancona, and the whole family were exceedingly vulgar, and were hated by the Colonna, the Orsini, and the rest of the ancient Roman nobility. Girolamo Riario was the worst of the Pope's nephews, but had been made by Sixtus IV captain-general of the papal forces, and the richest prince in Rome. He was vulgar, uncultured, violent, and arrogant, was loathed by the people for his crimes, and, being an arrant coward, never trusted himself in the streets except when surrounded by a band of his villainous retainers, and Catherine, descended from a race of soldiers, can only have looked on him with contempt. However, her life was not without compensations. Pope Sixtus IV, brutal and vulgar tyrant as he was to others, behaved well towards her, and in a very short time she became so great a favorite with him that she wielded an immense influence. Few in that age, placed in such a position, would have borne the moral degradation of such a court as that of Sixtus IV without being contaminated, but it is acknowledged that Catherine did so and that personal and family pride kept her from being corrupted. Amidst these surroundings, Catherine lived for seven years, the first four of them the most prosperous and brilliant of her life. During these seven years, she saw an immense change wrought in Rome, which, when she arrived, was mean and half-ruined in appearance, but which was transformed by Sixtus IV into a fine city. He organized a department for public works, pulled down houses and widened the streets, and built the Sistine Chapel, various important churches, and many other of the buildings which still exist in Rome. In connection with these operations, Catherine saw summoned to Rome every notable artist of the time, including Botticelli, Ghirlandajo, Perugino, Mantegna, Pinturicchio, Filippino Lippi, Melozzo da Forli, Cosimo Roselli, and Luca Signorelli. At the same time, Sixtus IV founded the Vatican Library, of which a memorial exists in the picture by Melozzo da Forli of the Pope, surrounded by his nephews, giving to the librarian Platina the foundation statutes of the library. Catherine took part in these activities, while we are told that she did a great deal of reading and delighted in the society of the numerous cultured and learned men then gathered in Rome. The year after Catherine's marriage, 
there took place, 1478, the celebrated Pazzi conspiracy, headed by Sixtus IV and her husband Girolamo. After the failure of that conspiracy, Girolamo sent an emissary to Florence to poison Lorenzo the Magnificent, but this attempt also failed. Again, Girolamo planned with certain Florentines to assassinate Lorenzo, and the day was appointed. But again, the plot was discovered, and all the conspirators were executed. Historians are unanimous that Catherine had no part in any of these plots, nor was told of them. In 1478, the first of Catherine's children was born, a daughter whom she named Bianca after her beloved grandmother. In the following year, her eldest son was born and was given the name of Ottaviano. During the next two years, another son and a daughter were born. In 1480, a quarrel between the two branches of the Ordelaffi family at Forli, the adjacent state to Catherine's little domain of Imola, was seized upon by Sixtus IV as a pretext for ejecting the Ordelaffi from their territory, over which they had ruled with honor for a hundred and fifty years, and giving it to Girolamo Riario. This junction of Forli with Imola made a state of some political importance, especially as one of the two main roads from the north of Italy to Rome and Naples ran through it. In June 1481, Girolamo and Catherine left Rome to pay a visit to their new state, accompanied by an enormous train of mules and carts laden with all the wealth which Girolamo had been able to plunder, and which he thought, as the Pope was growing old, it was advisable to remove from Rome. For many days this great baggage train crowded the long, rough road from Rome by way of Orte, Terni, and Spoleto into Umbria, and thence over the passes of the Apennines and through Ancona, Pesaro, and Rimini to Forli. The entry of Girolamo and Catherine into Forli was a very grand affair, with triumphal arches, the streets hung with tapestries, companies of white-clad youths bearing palm branches, a triumphal car full of children who sang Latin verses, bands of music, and the clanging of innumerable bells. Catherine rode on a white horse, whose trappings of cloth of silver were embroidered with pearls, and over the heads of the pair a party of young nobles in white and gold carried a canopy for a mile before the town was reached. Then followed the usual feasting, and in the evening a ball, at which Catherine was much admired for her magnificent appearance, in a dress covered with jewels, and a veil, with the device, worked in silver and pearls, of a rising sun piercing the clouds. In September they visited Venice, ostensibly for pleasure, but also with a political object. In the war of 1478 to 1480 between Florence and Sixtus IV, Duke Ercole d'Este of Ferrara had sided with Florence, and the Pope now wished to retaliate, and to obtain the help of Venice to enable him to treat the house of Este as he had the Ordelaffi, and take Ferrara for the ever-hungry Girolamo. They were greeted at Venice with a splendid reception, but the Venetians saw no reason why they should assist the Pope to take Ferrara for Girolamo. So, while they overwhelmed him and Catherine with honors and delighted them with gorgeous pageants, they sent them away without having effected anything. And Girolamo and Catherine, avoiding Ferrara, returned to Forli and from thence to Rome. Catherine's portrait by Palmezzano, with the castle of Forli in the background, shows her as she was at this time, at the age of twenty, and before she had yet demonstrated those extraordinary powers of courage and resolution which she possessed. After their return to Rome, Girolamo's enormities increased to such an extent that he became more detested than ever. At length, in the beginning of 1484, he instigated the Pope, 
with the help of the Orsini, to attack the Colonna, whose possessions he coveted. The papal troops sacked the whole quarter in which stood the palaces of the Colonna, whereupon Girolamo perpetrated one of his most odious crimes. In order to save the life of the head of the family, the highly respected Lorenzo Colonna, who had fallen into the Pope's hands, Colonna's mother agreed conditionally to give up part of their estates. Nevertheless, Girolamo, falsifying the Pope's most solemn word, basely took the life of Lorenzo Colonna, who was atrociously tortured to death in the castle of Sant'Angelo on the 30th June, 1484. Catherine shuddered at these crimes of her husband and held herself as much as possible aloof from him, occupying herself with the care of her children and removing herself and them for a time to Frascati. Her husband's baseness filled her with disgust, but when once or twice she reproached him for the vileness of his crimes, he vented his wrath upon her with such violent brutality that after his death, she told the Milanese envoy that she, quote, had often envied those who died, end quote. In the midst of these disturbances, Pope Sixtus suddenly died on the 12th August, 1484. Anarchy at once ensued in Rome, and the Riario Palace, which Catherine had furnished with great magnificence, was attacked by the mob and sacked. Girolamo was absent with his troops at Pagliano, and Catherine and her children were with him. He advanced with his force as far as the Ponte Mole, while Catherine boldly went on and entered the castle of St. Angelo, which she declared she should hold for Count Girolamo. She was now twenty-two, and here gave the first sign of that military spirit and indomitable will which was afterwards to make her so famous. Rome was like a city given up to be sacked, the mob reveling in the abeyance of all authority. The cardinals sent messenger after messenger to Catherine, demanding that she should give up the castle, but she only laughed at them, being determined to hold it until a new pope had been elected and had confirmed her husband in his estates. They tried various expedients, but without avail, Catherine, holding the Pope's castle, was mistress of the situation, and the cardinals were afraid even to assemble for the conclave. At length, they put such pressure upon her husband that, betrayed by him, she had to yield, whereupon she marched out with the honors of war, and she and Girolamo departed for Forli, where two months later Catherine's third son was born. For Lee, during the next three years, was by no means a bed of roses for Catherine. The people loved the Ordelafi, and Girolamo Riario's character would have made him detested anywhere. So that there were frequent insurrections both at Forli and Imola, and either Girolamo or his countess had constantly at short notice to hurry from one place to the other to quell these disturbances. In these labors of a difficult government, Catherine took her full share, and it was only by her able assistance that Girolamo was able to preserve his position. On one occasion, in August 1487, when they were at Imola, her husband being ill, and only a few days before the birth of Catherine's fifth son, urgent news came late in the evening that an insurrection had occurred at Forli and that one of the rebels, Codronchi, had murdered the Castellane and seized the castle. Catherine forthwith ordered her horse and rode the sixteen miles to Forli, arriving there at midnight and proceeding to the gate of the castle, which dominated the town, summoned Codronchi to surrender it to her. He replied insolently, promising to think about it if she would return in the morning to breakfast. Catherine, sitting on her horse at midnight before the closed gates of her castle, was obliged to give in for the time, and retired to her palace in the town, but laid her plans for the next day. In the morning she presented herself again at the castle gate. She was told that only she herself, with one attendant, 
to carry her breakfast, would be admitted. Catherine, against the strong advice of her counsellors, accepted the terms offered, and, taking with her Tommaso Feo, whom she knew she could trust, passed in. What transpired inside none know, but she brought such power to bear upon the rebellious Codronchi that after a few hours he delivered up the castle to her, whereupon she placed Tommaso Feo in command, sallied forth accompanied by Codronchi, and rode away, back to Imola taking him with her, and Forli was saved. On the day after her return to Imola, her fifth son, whom she named Francesco Sforza, was born, 17th August, 1487. A few months after this, in April 1488, Girolamo Riario met the natural end of his many crimes, being assassinated in the palace at Forli in an insurrection headed by the Orsi family. Catherine, with her six children and her sister Stella, were seized by the conspirators in another room, but not before she had contrived to send off a messenger to her half-brother, the Duke of Milan, with an urgent appeal to him to send troops to her assistance. She and her children were ignominiously marched through the crowded streets and locked up in the Orsi Palace. Thence they were removed in the evening to the fortress of San Pietro, where Catherine, her six children, the two youngest in the arms of their nurses, her sister and two other attendants were all confined in one small room, and underwent much distress and terror, Catherine being the only one of the party who kept her head. The conspirators ordered Feo to give up the castle, but he refused, and next day, by a ruse, Catherine, leaving her children in the enemy's hands, escaped to the castle. They threatened to kill her children if she did not surrender, but she dared them to do it, and threatened them with the vengeance of the Duke of Milan, while the castle bombarded the town day and night. At length, after the castle had been besieged for a fortnight, troops came to her assistance from Milan, whereupon the leaders of the rebellion fled, the town made a humble submission, and Catherine had conquered. We see her in this hour of her victory, as she is described by Ceretani. Quote, Wise, brave, great, speaking little, with a full beautiful face, wearing a tan satin gown with two L's of train, a large black velvet hat in the French mode, and a man's belt whence hung a bag of gold ducats and a curved sword. And among the soldiers both horse and foot, she was much feared, for that armed lady was both fierce and cruel. End quote. Those of the ringleaders of the rebellion who were caught were executed. The palace of the Orsi was demolished, and all the men of that family who had not fled were put to death in vengeance for Girolamo's murder. And though Catherine did not show general vindictiveness, she showed herself hard and cruel, not only punishing the guilty with death, but consigning to dark and horrible dungeons their innocent families. On the other hand, she refused to allow the troops from Milan to sack the city, as they had been fully confident of doing, or even to enter it. And though this almost caused a mutiny among them, Catherine was resolute, and showed no less courage on this point than she had in confronting the rebellion. She returned to her palace in the town, escorted only by a small picked body of these troops, who, though she had deprived them of the plunder of the city, could not help honoring her for the brave way in which she had fought her battle. And on the way, says Bernardi, many of our women embraced her feet, for a woman whose first exercise of power was for the protection of other women had not till then been seen. Girolamo's body was buried at Imola, Catherine declaring that she would never forgive the canons of the cathedral of Forli for having refused it burial, and during the remaining twelve years of her reign she never forgave them or entered the cathedral. 
The property of the Orsi family was, however, not confiscated, Catherine refusing to take anything of theirs, and she liberated, after a short time, the women of that family from their imprisonment. End of section 18. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 19 of The Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young. Chapter 22 Giovanni Popolano and Catherine Sforza, Part 3. Catherine was now twenty-six, and a sovereign ruler of her state, her eldest son Octavian being still a child. In the following year, 1489, she married Giacomo Feo, the younger brother of her faithful Castellani, Tommaso Feo, appointing the latter governor of Imola. Giacomo Feo was, we are told, quote, a fine handsome young man, courteous and pleasant to all, and skilled in all military exercises, end quote. She kept the government of her state in her own hands, he remaining simply the commander of her army. There was much jealousy in Forlì against Giacomo Feo on account of his elevation, and, though he did his best to allay it, this feeling smoldered. They had one son, called after his father Giacomo. In 1492, Catherine heard of the death at Florence of Lorenzo the Magnificent. Though he had been opposed through life to Girolamo Riario in consequence of the Pazzi conspiracy and the murder of his brother Giuliano, and so had placed Florence always in political opposition to Forlì, yet Catherine had never lost her regard for him and the Medici family. She had always contrived to maintain a sort of private and personal friendship with Florence outside the arena of politics, and much regretted Lorenzo's death. In the same year, Sixtus IV's successor, Pope Innocent VIII, also died, and Cardinal Rodrigo Borgia became Pope Alexander VI, in whom she was to find her bitterest enemy. During the next two years, Catherine was involved in a web of difficult policy. Charles VIII was about to invade Italy, and Catherine's whole abilities were called forth to prevent her small state from being ravaged by the two foes. On the one side, the French, with Milan, her natural ally, and on the other, Florence, with Rome and Naples. She trimmed perpetually between the two, but at length, declared herself on the side of the latter party. When, however, her castle of Mordano was attacked and taken by the French, while the troops of the Allies made no attempt to give her garrison any assistance, she renounced the side of Florence, Rome, and Naples, and took that of the French and Milan. Many letters still extant passed at this time between her and Pietro the Unfortunate on the subject of these intricate politics. In 1494, Charles VIII, in his march through Italy, sent a portion of his troops through her state, but they did her no harm, and were eventually recalled by Charles to meet him in Tuscany. Shortly afterwards, Catherine's half-brother, Gian Galeazzo Sforza, died, and her uncle, Ludovico Sforza, proclaimed himself Duke of Milan. In August 1495, those jealous of Giacomo Feo's advancement laid plans to murder him. Catherine, her husband, and her band of young sons were returning joyously from a hunting party when, at the Bogheri Bridge, Giacomo Feo, who was riding a little behind, was suddenly set upon by a party of conspirators and stabbed to death. Catherine escaped to the castle and took a terrible vengeance. When her first husband, a man to whom she had been married as a matter of policy, and whom she loathed, was murdered, she merely punished with a stern, hard justice. 
but her second husband was the man of her own choice the first love of this vehement strong-willed woman whose great-grandfather had been given the name of sforza on account of his violence and impetuosity characteristics prominent in all the sforza hence we now have a woman raging with tiger-like fury for the murder of her love her terrible sforza nature blazing up in all its awful madness of blind and passionate ferocity the guilty the families of the guilty including women girls and even children all on whom the slightest suspicion fell were involved in a general destruction and there followed indiscriminate slaughtering hanging torturing banishment and ruin for giacomo feo's murder more than one hundred persons men women and children suffered various degrees of misery over forty of them being put to death in most cruel ways Quote, the beautiful rosaria getti the unhappy wife of the principal assassin of feo was dragged to the castle of forli and there with her two little children thrown down a spiked well the dungeons of the castle were turned into abodes of lamentation and death the hall where the podesta examined prisoners rang with the clank of instruments of torture and the desperate cries of the victims quote. truly the sforza nature was a terrible one when roused the same qualities which produced such indomitable power to overcome difficulties and such an unquenchable spirit in adversity produced in the hour of vengeance results at which mankind trembled even catherine's own son octavian then sixteen was by her consigned to prison because she shrewdly suspected that he had had a share in the crime through his jealousy of feo even if he had not instigated it all italy shuddered at such a vengeance pope alexander the sixth though tolerably accustomed to terrible deeds ventured on a remonstrance but catherine turned a deaf ear until her wrath had destroyed every one and everything connected with the murder of giacomo feo she would listen to nothing at length the fury of her wrath was satisfied and she turned her attention to other matters both famine and pestilence were at this time causing great suffering to her people and catherine threw herself into a contest with these evils with a fierce energy which seemed desirous of obliterating the memory of her bereavement by the most arduous labors buying corn and organizing famine relief establishing dispensaries and hiring doctors from other states and founding confraternities for the care of the sick and other charitable purposes politics also demanded all her abilities the peaceful times of italy had passed away and a time of turmoil had succeeded in which her petty state threatened to be crushed between more powerful neighbors she was divided between her desire to keep in friendship with her uncle's state of milan and her ever-increasing sympathy with florence this latter feeling was in fourteen ninety six strengthened by their coming to her as florentine envoy giovanni de medici known in florence as giovanni popolano catherine wanted a guardian for her inert and effeminate son octavian she also wanted a helper and adviser in her precarious position as the female ruler of a state which every power round her coveted and she saw that she would have once again to contract a marriage of policy she had always felt an attraction for the medici family while giovanni was not only handsome and accomplished but also showed much political ability so in fourteen ninety seven about two years after giacomo feo's death she married her florentine envoy keeping it secret as long as she could for fear of the wrath of her uncle ludovico duke of milan who was constantly urging upon her to have nothing to do with florence when at last he plainly taxed her 
with intending such a marriage after it had already taken place she denied it in the most barefaced way saying she was pained that her uncle should think it possible she would ever take a husband without first consulting him or marry one of whom he would not approve however eventually she had to acknowledge it and then managed with such ability to show the political advantages of such an alliance that the duke of milan gave his consent soon afterwards the pope sent her a proposal that her son octavian should be married to his daughter lucrezia borgia the advantages that would be hers if she consented were plainly placed before her the result if she refused would she knew sooner or later be war brought upon her by the pope nevertheless her whole soul recoiled from the idea of intermarriage with the borgia family with whose crimes all italy rang she therefore refused the proposal and to keep her son out of the way sent him off to see something of war she dreaded lest he should grow up with the sluggish temperament of his father girolamo as he did so she dispatched him with a body of troops to help florence in its war against venice and pisa and persuaded giovanni de medici to go with him to instruct him in military affairs these troops had been trained by herself and during their absence at pisa she continued to watch over their management writing long letters containing minute instructions on all details of their administration in april fourteen ninety eight her son ludovico was born she named him after her uncle the duke of milan to conciliate the latter but when his father died five months later she changed his name to giovanni and by that name he is always known in august her husband giovanni became ill at pisa and returned to forli and went thence to the baths of san pietro in bagno in the apennines after he had been there a few days she received an urgent summons from him saying he was worse and begging her to come at once she rode thither from forli in haste but arrived to find him dying and a few hours afterwards he breathed his last in her arms his brother lorenzo came and conveyed his body to florence for burial there and catherine returned in deepest grief a third time a widow to her desolate palace at forli dangers now surrounded catherine sforza on every side through her alliance with florence she was brought into collision with venice on the north and the pope on the south while the latter was bent on punishing her for her refusal of his matrimonial project and also wanted her state for his son caesar borgia venice demanded a passage through her territories for the troops it was sending against florence and thought she was too much plunged in grief to refuse but war made catherine herself again directly and she refused the demand of venice and upon the latter sending a force against her she defeated it at the same time lorenzo the younger lorenzo popolano her late husband's brother demanded the custody of her child on the plea that she must not expose him to the dangers which threatened herself catherine replied that there was nothing which she could refuse to the house of medici except her child and kept possession of him meanwhile foreseeing that she would ere long be attacked she devoted her whole attention to military affairs fortifying passes repairing her town walls enlisting fresh troops providing new arms and immense supplies of ammunition drilling her troops sitting up late at night going through the accounts that she might provide funds for the payment of her soldiers regulating even the discipline and expenses of the body of troops she still kept at pisa with octavian arranging for all the mules to be sent here in these and similar activities she displayed her unbounded energy and resource in july fourteen ninety nine florence sent to her an envoy the celebrated niccolo machiavelli 
to endeavor to obtain her agreement to various arrangements by which Forli was to give much and obtain little. But not even Machiavelli could outwit Catherine, and we are told, quote, the young envoy found more than his match in the woman he had tried and failed to circumvent. End quote. Apparently, Catherine had by this time given up inhabiting her palace in the town, and, for greater security, had transferred her abode to a new residence which she had constructed in the castle. Tomasini, in his life of Machiavelli, describing, quote, those long-vanished halls that witnessed these interviews of Catherine Sforza and Niccolo Machiavelli, unquote, says, quote, Catherine had demolished that part of the citadel which had seen her temporary humiliation by the insurgents, and on the highest part of the walls, which were held to be impregnable, had built herself a new and magnificent abode, she had named this paradiso from its beauty and the fine architecture of its lofty rooms decorated with splendid paintings and brilliant with gilded coffered ceilings on which were displayed the arms of the visconti in these rooms and amidst those defences where not long afterwards this brave woman calmly awaited the assault of the borgia and her own ruin she received the envoy Niccolo Machiavelli, who carried away with him a deep impression of her beauty, her greatness of soul, and the strength of her castle. End quote. All through the year 1499, Catherine was busy in preparing for the attack which was coming upon her from the Pope and his ally, the new King of France, Louis XII. The latter had deprived her uncle Ludovico of his throne and put him to flight, so no assistance could come to her from Milan. The Republic of Florence could not help her, for it was itself at this time trembling before Caesar Borgia, and, notwithstanding the specious protestations of Florentine friendship which had been conveyed to her by Machiavelli, dared take no action which would bring trouble upon Florence from that quarter. No other states would ally themselves with her against two such powerful adversaries as the Pope and the King of France. Alexander the Sixth issued a bull by which he deposed this daughter of iniquity and invested Caesar Borgia with her territories. And Louis the Twelfth addressed a circular letter to the states of Italy, stating that he was dispatching an army under Caesar Borgia, Duke of Valentino, to besiege and take the fortresses of Imola and Forli, on behalf of the Pope. Thus, the force which Caesar Borgia was able to bring against her was far beyond anything which she could put in the field. For he had not only the whole of the papal forces, but also 15,000 French under Yves d'Alegre and 4,000 Swiss. But nothing daunted Catherine Sforza's stout heart, and she prepared with the utmost energy to resist the united power of the Pope and the King of France, and worked away at her defences, as though she had any number of powerful allies, instead of only the strength of her own small state. Though she knew that she was enormously overmatched, and that all her efforts would be powerless to prevail against such a force, she was determined to defend the rights of her children to the last, she cut down all the trees round the town. She burnt down the suburbs. She destroyed even the pleasure house in her park and cut down its trees. She erected fortifications in every direction. She sent away her children to Florence. She diverted the streams in the hills and flooded the whole country round the town. And she devoted every spare hour to personally drilling her troops and increasing their efficiency. In November 1499, Caesar Borgia's army advanced against Imola. It was furiously attacked, taken by assault, and sacked. This frightened the citizens of Forli, and the Signoria, after long debate and much hustling by Catherine, declined to stand by her against the Pope, and agreed to surrender the town. Catherine, on receiving their message to this effect, 
sent Landriani to tell the members of the Signoria that they were rabbits. She withdrew her forces into the castle and there stood at bay. And on the following day, Caesar Borgia, with his army, entered the town. He did his utmost to induce her to surrender, but without avail. The more desperate her case grew, the more resolute Catherine became. The castle was fiercely attacked, but successfully resisted all the enemy's efforts. It steadily bombarded the town, and especially the palace in which Caesar Borgia had taken up his quarters, which made him furious. After some time, he tried a parley, and advanced to the edge of the moat, and presently Catherine looked down on him from the battlements. He pointed out to her the overwhelming strength of his forces and the uselessness of further struggle, and urged her to yield. But she replied that she, quote, was the daughter of one who knew no fear, and was determined to walk in his steps till death, end quote. So the bombardment continued. Again, a second time, he tried a parley, urging upon her still more forcible arguments, but with the same result. Catherine hoped that her half-sister, the Empress of Germany, would induce the Emperor Maximilian to send her assistance, but the latter dreaded Caesar Borgia too much to do so, and no help came to the beleaguered castle of Forli. All through December 1499, the furious contest went on, the castle being continuously attacked, but successfully beating off all assaults. Damage done to the defences by day was regularly repaired each night, and Catherine's resource seemed inexhaustible. While the high spirit with which she conducted her defence and encouraged the sinking hearts of her troops as their numbers gradually dwindled, won the admiration even of her foes, and especially of the French, who swore they would like to serve under her command. Catherine at this time wore armor permanently, and there is still to be seen a suit of woman's plate armor, said to have been hers, which may have been that worn by her during this siege. Quote, On the last night of the year, she took counsel till late at night with her captains and engineers, and at early morn, made a thorough inspection of the entire castle. From the height of the chief tower, which she had climbed to look down on the city, the enemy's camp, and the ravaged and snow-clad plain, she saw the dawn of a new century, and the sun rise on the 1st of January, 1500. End, quote. End of section 19. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 20 of The Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 22, Giovanni Popolano and Catherine Sforza, Part 4. Four days later, a breach was made in the castle walls which could not be repaired, and the enemy forced their way in. But Catherine retreated to the citadel and still stood at bay, and her beloved Paradiso was defended to the end. Never, wrote Grunello, had been seen a woman of such spirit. At length, when the castle was crowded with the enemy, the citadel still remaining hers, Catherine ordered the magazine to be blown up, determined to perish unconquered in the ruins, but it was done ineffectively and only gave further assistance to the attack. At last, Caesar Borgia demanded to parley with her, and while she spoke with him, she was treacherously seized from behind, and the defense of Forli by its lion-hearted countess was at an end. 8th January, 1500. D'Allegre, the French commander, declared that Catherine was the prisoner of the King of France, but Caesar Borgia refused to give her up, and on the 23rd of January he marched out of Forli, conveying her as a prisoner to Rome, 
and treating her with many indignities. Caesar Borgia reached Rome on the 26th February, and as Catherine once more entered through the Porta del Popolo, she must have contrasted this entry with that first brilliant one of hers as a girl of fifteen, twenty-three years before. At first she was treated well, but was soon consigned to the dungeons of the castle of St. Angelo on a charge of plotting to poison the Pope, and was there shamefully treated. The Borgia did not dare openly to put to death one whose sister was married to the Emperor, and whom the King of France claimed as his prisoner, but they intended that she should die nevertheless. And for a whole year she disappeared from sight. However, in June 1501, the French army returned to Italy and heard of her disappearance into the dungeons of St. Angelo. Her gallant defense of Forli had shed glory on the French arms by their capture of so formidable a castle, and Louis the Twelfth refused to allow her to be thus treated, and insisted on her being set at liberty. Caesar Borgia opposed her liberation with all his might, declaring that she would turn Lombardy and Romagna upside down, but the commander of the French army, D'Alegre, who had tried to protect Catherine from him when she surrendered at Forli, swore that if she were not set free at once, the French army, then approaching Rome, should plunder and sack the city, and the Pope had to submit. D'Alegre rode himself to the castle of St. Angelo to announce to Catherine her freedom. Then was revealed what she had endured since she had been imprisoned in the Borgia's dungeons. Quote, the woman who rose to greet Monseigneur d'Alegre bore no resemblance to her whom he had known a year and a half ago. She had spent over a year in the dark, narrow cell into which the Borgia had thrust her. They had expended as little as possible on her in continual expectation of her death. She was haggard from suffering and scant food, worn by fever and livid from living in the dark. Every time that her scanty food was brought her, she had dreaded poison. Every night she had dreaded the Tiber. D'Alegre was horrified. Could this be the fiery lady of Forli, grand even in defeat, whom he had last seen at the close of her gallant struggle to defend her castle? She was so changed that he did not know her. End quote. And now there comes out a new trait in this woman's character, and it is witnessed, too, by her own letters. These show that her sufferings were no surprise to her. She felt that she deserved them. The influences of her earliest years under her grandmother Bianca Visconti and the Duchess Bona had never deserted Catherine Sforza, and her letters show that while she believed that God would punish the Borgia for their cruel treatment of herself, she believed no less that, in her own sufferings, her victims, those innocent ones who had been thrown down spiked wells or had been tortured to death in her dungeons, were being avenged, and that God had surely punished her who had been guilty of these crimes. She was liberated on the 13th July 1501, and at once fled from Rome by the Tiber in a boat to Ostia, thence by sea to a point on the coast near Pisa, and thence by road to Florence. She chose this route because she knew that Caesar Borgia, disgusted at her being set free, had posted assassins on the land route to murder her. At Florence, she met all her children and was received with cordiality by her late husband's brother, Lorenzo the Younger, the Florentines welcoming her with a public ovation, the warmth of which reception much offended the Pope. Yet this woman, who had formerly so fiercely denounced her enemies, whose violence of language when roused had been the terror of Forli, and who had been betrayed, calumniated and tortured by the Borgia, never afterwards mentioned them in anger. Of her sufferings she would never speak, 
once only to her Dominican confessor, she said, quote, Could I write all, the world would turn to stone. End quote. During the remaining eight years of her life, Catherine lived at Florence in much retirement, chiefly at her late husband's villa of Castello, though even here she did not enjoy peace, being much harassed both by the money difficulties and incapacity of her elder sons, and by a long struggle, ending with lawsuit, to protect the property of her youngest son. On the death in 1503 of Pope Alexander VI, most of the princes of Romagna, whose states he and Caesar Borgia had seized, resumed them again, and Catherine urged her son Octavian to do the same and take possession of Forli. But he, being indolent and incapable, declined to make any such effort. It is remarkable to notice how, notwithstanding all their mother's ability and energy, not one of all her five sons by her first husband, Riario, nor her son by her second husband, Feo, inherited a particle of her qualities, but were, all of them, without capacity, energy, or strength of character. Whereas, in her son by her third husband, Giovanni de' Medici, all Catherine's qualities were reproduced in full vigor, and in him, Medici and Sforza were most powerfully blended. This boy, Giovanni, was now five years old, and Catherine soon found herself involved in an arduous conflict to protect him from the designs of his uncle, Lorenzo the Younger, and the latter's son, Pier Francesco the Younger. The former, while Catherine was in prison at Rome, and unlikely ever again to appear, had spent a large part of his late brother's inheritance, and this would be discovered unless they could get the boy into their hands. Accordingly, after various unsuccessful endeavors to get Catherine to give him up, they went to law with her over her guardianship of him, and also over the possession of her late husband's villa of Castello. All Catherine's fighting instincts were roused by this conduct. Castello became to her another for Lee. She declared that, quote, they should only get her out of it in pieces, end quote. At length, however, she was obliged to leave it for a time until the result of the lawsuit, which dragged on interminably, should become known, and while thus forced to leave her abode, took refuge at that convent of the Murate, where another Catherine was, twenty-three years later, to live, during the dawn of life, instead of its close. Eventually, the lawsuit was given in Catherine's favor, but then Lorenzo contrived to steal the boy, and she had again to go to law to get him back. Thereupon, considering that his life was in danger, she sent him to the convent of the Annalena, where she caused him to be dressed in girls' clothes and kept there in hiding for about a year. Catherine's portrait by Vasari shows her as she was at this time in her life. The loss of the above lawsuit, which had become a cause célèbre in Florence, together with the disgrace which he incurred among his fellow countrymen on account of the embezzlement of his nephew's property, so preyed on Lorenzo's mind that he fell ill and died, 1507. Whereupon, Catherine returned with her boy Giovanni, now nine years old, to the villa of Castello, where she spent the remaining two years of her life in training him in all manly exercises. Catherine delighted in him. He was a true Sforza, quote, all fire, arms and horses, as she writes, and she was, for these last two years of her life, perfectly happy. But her naturally vigorous health, had been permanently ruined by her terrible imprisonment. After two happy years with her fiery little son at Castello, her health in the early part of the year 1509 began altogether to give way, one of her feet especially causing her much suffering. To be nearer to doctors, she moved into the city, and on the 28th of May 1509, Catherine Sforza, the brave Countess of Forli, 
passed away at the age of 47. She died at the house in the Via Larga, which was then the next but one to the Medici Palace. She was buried in the chapel of the Murate Convent, where she had spent a great part of her latter years. But her tomb is not now to be seen, having been broken up when a few years ago that convent was converted into the state prison. At her death, she confided the charge of her son to Jacopo Salviati, who had been his tutor, and was also a connection by marriage, his wife, Lucrezia, being a daughter of Lorenzo the Magnificent, and belonging to that elder branch of the Medici family who had been exiled, and who at this time seemed unlikely ever to be allowed to return to Florence. End of section 20 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 21 of the Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young. Chapter 23. Giovanni della Bandanere and Maria Salviati. Part 1. Giovanni della Bandanere, born 1498, died 1526. The life of Giovanni della Bandanere, the only soldier of the Medici family, comes like a refreshing wind from another sphere in the midst of all the diplomacy, craft, and ignoble scheming of the times of Leo X, Clement VII, Francis I, and Charles V, which is the period in which his short life was passed. The only child of Giovanni de' Medici and his wife, Catherine Sforza, he was born in Forlì on the 6th April, 1498, and when about a year and a half old, was sent away by his mother from Forlì, then about to be attacked, to Florence, to the charge of his uncle, Lorenzo. When he was three years old, his mother arrived at Florence from her imprisonment at Rome, and Giovanni returned to her care, and his earliest recollections must have been those of the villa of Castello, with its stiff and formal garden and adjacent woods. When about eight years old, he was sent by his mother to the convent of the Annalena, where he was kept in hiding disguised as a girl, like another Achilles. After about a year, he returned to his mother's care, living with her at the villa of Castello, and being entirely trained by her. As a boy, he cared for nothing but riding, swimming, and manly exercises, and was difficult to manage, being fiery and headstrong, though he showed an affectionate and generous nature. He was the joy of his mother's heart, as she saw in him one such as her own ancestors had been, and she was never tired of expatiating on his manly spirit and his love of arms, horses, and military exercises. At the same time, she knew that strength and valor alone would not enable him to achieve success in that military career for which, almost from his very cradle, he showed such a strong inclination. And from the time he was nine years old, she sought everywhere for the best tutors for him, being determined to make him a man fitted to command armies and rule a state. His mother, however, died when he was still only eleven years old and in accordance with her will jacopo salviati became his guardian and under the care of salviati and his wife lucrezia giovanni remained until he was seventeen the charge was not an easy one for even as quite a little boy he would never obey any one but his mother so that when she died there was no one who could control him but in time lucrezia gained great influence over him and he always held her in much respect the Salviati lived in a palace in the Corso, in Florence, notable as being that in which had lived, in the thirteenth century, Folco Portinari, the father of Dante's Beatrice, and which the Salviati, when it became theirs, had restored. Here Giovanni grew up, taking warmly to all things which would fit him for a military career, but averse to books, except such as might assist that object pope alexander the sixth had been succeeded by pope julius the second and under his auspices when giovanni was fourteen the elder branch of the medici returned to florence 
giovanni watched their entry into the city and writes that it was a fine sight the government of florence thereupon passed into the hands of giuliano duc de nemour lucrezia salviati's brother and a few months later on the death of julius the second her other brother giovanni became pope leo the tenth this changed considerably the position of the salviati and henceforth the young son of catherine sforza looked forward to obtaining his much-desired military career through lucrezia salviati's influence with her brother the pope in fifteen fifteen when giovanni was seventeen leo x sent for him to rome where giovanni speedily distinguished himself by numerous quarrels and equally numerous deeds of bravery one of these latter is depicted on the wall of the sala di giovanni della bandanere in the palazzo vecchio showing him when a band of the orsini tried to take him prisoner forcing his way through them with only ten soldiers during this time we find lucrezia salviati writing to him as a mother to her son and giving him much good advice in the following year when he was eighteen giovanni at last obtained that which had been the desire of his heart from his earliest years and was given by the pope command of a troop of a hundred cavalry and saw his first campaign he and his troops being sent as part of the force dispatched by pope leo to attack urbino under the command of the pope's nephew lorenzo who had become ruler of florence in this campaign giovanni showed so many valuable qualities as a leader that he was soon advanced to a larger command he manifested from the first all those qualities which most endear a commander to those whom he leads in war and in a very short time his soldiers idolized him and there was someone else who idolized him too namely his guardian's sensible and good-hearted daughter maria salviati who had grown up with him and knew all his aspirations and worshipped this fine young soldier who loved her and was so rapidly winning distinction so in november fifteen sixteen when giovanni came back from his first campaign they were married he being then a little over eighteen and she seventeen by this marriage the two branches of the medici family were united maria's mother being a great-granddaughter of cosimo pater patrie and giovanni a great-grandson of cosimo's brother lorenzo but not for long did giovanni remain encircled by the silken cords of love he was soon back again with his troops and seeking fighting wherever it was to be found nor did he even confine himself to land operations once when there was no fighting to be done on land he managed to get three small ships fitted out and proceeded on a cruise in pursuit of the pirates who infested the coasts of the adriatic his rise was tremendously rapid and we soon find him given by leo x the command of a force of four thousand infantry and a hundred cavalry and sent to attack fenimo a hard-fought battle ensued in which giovanni was victorious his letter announcing his success is to be seen in the state archives in florence written in the bold round style which characterizes his handwriting meanwhile maria remained in florence living in the salviati palace where on the twelfth june fifteen nineteen a son was born to them whom they named cosimo at the request of pope leo x after the latter's ancestor cosimo pater patrie it is told of giovanni that in order to make the child courageous he had him thrown from the first floor of the salviati palace into the courtyard where he stood and caught him in his arms though what maria thought of such escapades with her child is not related in this year fifteen nineteen when giovanni was twenty-one lorenzo duke of urbino the nephew of leo x died and as he left only a daughter while giuliano duc de nemour had left no legitimate heir it was evident that on the death of pope leo x the rights of the medici to the rule of florence would pass to the younger branch of which giovanni was the most important representative the latter however was rapidly making for himself so great a reputation as a commander in war that he despised all such questions and gave no attention to the matter the time was one in which war was becoming the normal condition in italy and by the time that giovanni was twenty-two he commanded a force of his own 
and these troops were becoming renowned throughout italy from the black armor which they wore they were called the bandanere or black bands which gave giovanni the name by which he is known in history and so invariable was his success in command of this force that he had already gained the title of the invincible and was one of the most noted leaders in italy in fifteen twenty one when he was twenty-three the long war between francis i and charles v began and giovanni della bandanere was now to have a larger field for the display of his military talents so far as italy was concerned this first campaign between the two great antagonists resolved itself into a struggle for the possession of milan which since the battle of marignano in fifteen fifteen had belonged to france pope leo x sided with charles v and to assist the imperial army in the campaign in lombardy against the french commander de la trec sent a large body of troops of which the bandanere formed an important part in these operations we find giovanni holding with his force the line of ada to the east of milan and eventually performing a remarkable feat in swimming his entire force across that river in order to make a rapid advance upon milan the result of this was that the city was taken to the great delight of the pope who however died a week or two afterwards during the short pontificate of adrian the sixth the war languished but in fifteen twenty three soon after clement the seventh had become pope the french again invaded lombardy and during this and the following year the fighting in northern italy was incessant by the death of leo x giovanni della bandanere failing his cousin lorenzino then six years old had become the only legitimate representative of the medici claims to the rule of florence but clement the seventh was scheming in every way to keep that rule from passing to the younger branch of the family and seeing in this successful soldier a dangerous obstacle to his views managed to find constant employment for giovanni and the bandanere hoping that sooner or later he would get killed in battle and giovanni caring nothing for political affairs and entirely absorbed in his profession was only too ready to be kept thus employed meanwhile giovanni's reputation as a great soldier grew continually his renown spreading even as far as england he had begun by being looked upon as a uniformly successful leader of a first-rate body of troops he was now getting to be considered indispensable wherever large operations were to be undertaken his poor young wife maria saw little of him and was forever imploring him to come home and attend to his family affairs for she had thoroughly fathomed pope clement's design and in a letter to her husband in fifteen twenty three shows how bitterly she felt this crafty plan of the pope's and the certainty that sooner or later giovanni's life would be sacrificed but giovanni was not to be got away from the stirring life of the camp and the great game of war for a little time however during a pause in the military operations he was persuaded to retire to reggio where maria was delighted to get him to herself for a few months and induce him to lead a quiet life occupying himself with field sports it was probably at this time that titian's portrait of him was painted at reggio attracted by his fame there gathered round him quite a small court of notable men among these was pietro aretino a man more in his element in the baneful atmosphere of the court of charles v than in the wholesomer air of camps but between whom and giovanni della bandanere a strong friendship soon grew up but this time of rest at reggio did not last long and giovanni was soon again in the field shortly afterwards maria writes to him still more strongly than before pointing out pope clement's artifices and how he was arranging to attack ancona and sending giovanni in command of the expedition solely with the object of keeping him continually employed and in the hope that he would eventually be killed in battle but poor maria's tender exhortations fell on deaf ears early in fifteen twenty five francis i made his great invasion of lombardy and giovanni della bandanere in command of the contingent furnished by the pope joined the french king before pavia to take part in the siege 
ten days before the battle of twenty fourth february giovanni while reconnoitring the enemy was severely wounded by a round shot and his leg broken and was carried to piacenza then ensued the great battle and the destruction of the whole french army francis i always declared that if giovanni della bandanere had been there he would not have lost the day and the accounts of the battle tend to show that he was probably right this disaster to the french arms put an end to the war for the time meanwhile giovanni was lying wounded at piacenza and his troops were in great destitution owing to its being impossible to extract their pay from the pope who took advantage of their commander being hors de combat to withhold it in this emergency maria as usual proved herself a faithful and capable assistant to her husband she writes beseeching him not again to attach himself to the pope's cause pointing out the duplicity with which clement was treating him and saying there will be no popes like those who are gone will you not cease to be at the beck and call of others and come home and attend to your own concerns now that there is time remember papa leo and how suddenly he died ending her letter with the prayer that god will keep giovanni in safety and then having written thus she went in person to rome and bravely assailed pope clement demanding the pay of giovanni's soldiers and forced him to give her six thousand ducats for them but maria did not get her giovanni to come home and attend to his own concerns even before his wound was healed he was again busy in preparations for the fresh campaign which was impending he writes to maria to buy fresh horses arms and equipment in florence to replace those lost in the recent operations and for the new levies which he was raising and she though it strained his resources greatly complied and a few months later giovanni was again at the head of his troops and the tide of war once more sweeping over lombardy francis i having regained his liberty there was formed in fifteen twenty six the league between france the pope venice and florence against charles v and at such a time giovanni della bandanere italy's foremost commander could not be absent his command now consisted of the whole of the infantry supplied by the pope and florence together with a corps of about a thousand cavalry while the entire army of the allies was commanded by the duke of urbino various operations took place in which the duke of urbino was completely outgeneraled by the imperial commander the duke of bourbon and the allied army forced to retire and then came the end that end for which clement had hoped and which maria had so long sorrowfully foreseen on the bank of the mincio in the plain of governolo eight miles from mantua there were in november four days severe fighting and on the fourth day giovanni was struck by a shot from the enemy's artillery in the leg previously wounded at pavia they carried him to mantua where though an enemy he was lodged by federigo gonzaga marquis of mantua in his own palace and treated with every honour pietro aretino was with him and was directed to tell him that his leg must be amputated a terrible operation in those days they said he must be held by ten men but he declared that no one should hold him and taking the candle held it himself throughout the operation which was performed with great ignorance and roughness causing indescribable agony and after all it was useless for mortification set in a few hours afterwards he endured intense pain in the midst of which however he sent an affectionate message to poor maria and wrote an admirable brief address of farewell to his soldiers and then saying he would not die in a sick bed had himself placed on his camp bed and the pain thereupon departing he fell asleep and so died thirtieth november fifteen twenty six he was buried in his armour in the church of san francesco in mantua but in sixteen eighty five his remains were brought back to florence and buried in the family mausoleum and when the medici coffins were opened in eighteen fifty seven more than three hundred years after his death his body was found still lying in its black armour and with the amputated leg many of his letters are in the state archives of florence 
while his most prominent deeds in war are immortalized in the frescoes on the walls of the sala di giovanni della banda nere in the palazzo vecchio he left only one son cosimo who was seven years old when his father died the grief of the soldiers of the bandanere at their great commander's death was overwhelming they wore mourning for him for the rest of their lives and carrying a black banner his celebrated corps won added honor even after he was gone to the name he had made so renowned and long afterwards they gave a notable proof of their regard for him most of giovanni's soldiers were recruited from his mother's former patrimony of imola and many years after his death when his son cosimo was ruler of florence and a movement against the latter was being got up in romagna we are told that around imola it could make no way the old soldiers of giovanni della bandanere repressing every whisper against their revered commander's son as regards the character of giovanni della bandanere as a soldier we are told again and again of his extraordinary bravery his fortitude amidst dangers and hardships his modesty just dealing generosity and unselfishness the person who knew him best was pietro aretino who thus describes him he gave away to his soldiers more than he ever kept for himself fatigue and hardship he endured with greatest patience in the battlefield he wore no distinguishing mark so that by his conspicuous valor alone could he be singled out from his men he was ever the first to mount the last to dismount he esteemed men according to their value not according to their rank or wealth he was always better than his word in action but in council he never traded on his great reputation he had a wonderful art of governing his soldiers now by love and now by fear of all things he held indolence in most horror there is no doubt that his disposition was naturally virtuous his faults were those only of youth so that had it pleased god to give him a longer life every one would have been as convinced of his goodness as i am myself it is certain that he had a most affectionate heart in short many may envy him but none can imitate him so died at the age of twenty-eight the greatest commander produced by italy in the sixteenth century one of whom it has been said that had he lived longer the history of italy would have been altered and the emperor charles v have been shorn of much of his glory one also who attained the eminence he did not like gaston de foix or charles of bourbon through being related to a king but entirely by his own talents we may well inquire what were the particular methods peculiar to himself by excelling in which giovanni della bandanere in only ten years from the time that he was given his first troop of one hundred men made himself the greatest commander in italy there were plenty of conspicuously brave men among the leaders of troops at this time but they did not achieve the success attained by him so that we must look elsewhere than to his renowned bravery for the secret of that success if his history is studied it will be found that two main lines of action produce the result both of them demonstrating unusual insight into his profession as regards the first of these it is stated that he was the first commander in war who exercised a personal care over his troops this new departure on his part had greater results than many at all events at that time would have supposed likely for we find that his care of his men watchful protection of their interests generosity justice and absence of regard for himself when joined to his great courage and chivalrous character made his soldiers notwithstanding his very strict discipline ready to make efforts for him which none other could have obtained from them but the second way in which giovanni della bandanere struck out a new line for himself is more remarkable requiring as it did an unusual independence of spirit in those days as in many subsequent times it was considered a finer thing to command men who rode than men who fought on foot giovanni della bandanere held another view it is stated that he was the first commander since julius caesar to realize that 
since it is the infantry arm which in battle bears the brunt of the fighting that arm must in all ways be given the chief importance both in peace and war by a commander who desires success acting on this which only his unusually ardent love for the soldier's profession enabled him to discern giovanni della bandanere though he had begun as a leader of cavalry very early in his career changed to being an infantry commander and remained such for the rest of his life as a consequence he became we are told the first commander under whom the infantry began to acquire fame since the time of the roman legions the result of these two courses of action was that his infantry became such as no infantry had been for many centuries and won for him the name of the invincible at only twenty-two while by the time he was twenty-eight he had become the greatest commander in italy End of section 21section 22 of the medici volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the medici volume 2 by g f young chapter 23 giovanni della bandanere and maria salviati part two maria salviati born 1499 married 1516 died 1543 maria salviati daughter of jacopo salviati and his wife lucrezia de medici and granddaughter of lorenzo the magnificent is one of the most attractive characters of the age though she lived in the worst time in florentine history married at seventeen to giovanni de medici soon to be known as giovanni della bandanere who had been brought up with her from the time that she was ten and he eleven years old she made him a most excellent wife she was of an exceedingly affectionate disposition she was a virtuous woman in an age when it was the exception and she was no less noteworthy for her strong sense wisdom and capacity she helped giovanni in all his difficulties and whereas he was from his fiery and headstrong nature always ready to become involved in some trouble she was ever on the watch from a distance displaying a wonderful forethought and sending him sound advice which saved him from many quarrels her letters to him many of which are preserved in the state archives of florence are models of sense wisdom and the strongest affection combined her portrait by vasari is sure to be a good likeness as he knew her well while giovanni was absent on his almost perpetual campaigns she remained living in her father's palace in the corso at florence where in fifteen nineteen her son cosimo was born during the next three years giovanni having attained command of a troop was mounting by rapid steps in his profession and gaining great distinction owing to his invariable success wherever employed so that the occasions when he was able to be with her were few and when in fifteen twenty three pope adrian the sixth was succeeded by clement the seventh this became still more the case by this time her young husband all whose youthful aspirations she had shared as a girl had become one of the most renowned commanders in italy and she saw less and less of him but this did not in any way prevent his being her one consideration at all times and wherever we hear of her she seems to have no other care or interest but his well-being her life had in it much sadness for seeing plainly pope clement's manoeuvres to oust giovanni from his rights and keep him always in the field in the hope that he would eventually get killed she yet found it impossible to get giovanni to guard his own interests while she also lived in perpetual dread of hearing of his death and the higher he rose in his profession and the more the cloud of war spread over northern italy as it did almost uninterruptedly during the last three years of his life the more impossible did it become for giovanni to give any attention to his domestic affairs or to be with the wife who loved him so devotedly maria salviati reveals herself completely to us in her letters and the more we see of her the more attractive she becomes m gautier calls her this wife who remained always a lover 
a modern woman of passion and nerves out of place among these suits of armor these swords and noises of war and again and again after quoting long extracts from her letters he exclaims such tenderness such womanly words in a touching letter to giovanni in reference to a quarrel he had got into she implores him to keep out of such broils and not to destroy us both by these frequent quarrels and signs herself your desolate wife who commends herself to you with face covered with tears at the same time she is far from being weak and one knows not which to admire the most her great love for her warrior husband her pleading tenderness her gentle reproach her ceaseless solicitude for his welfare or her sagacious wisdom and strong common sense the tender pathos of many of her letters is indescribable she knew that in the years before he was twenty-five he was while absent at rome often unfaithful to her and that she was supplanted by low rivals and in her letters written at that time it is the peculiar combination of this knowledge of which she speaks openly of tender reproach to him for treating her so and yet of an unswerving affection care for his welfare and sensible advice to keep him out of this or that quarrel which makes them so singularly touching giovanni spent nearly all his private funds on his troops and as previously noted maria was continually occupied in providing what he required though it was often difficult to find the necessary money and that he thus relied upon her to purchase for him such things as horses arms and other military equipment shows how well he knew her sound sense and judgment at last the news came which she had all along dreaded and she heard of his being mortally wounded which news was followed almost immediately by that of his death his friend pietro aretino writes to her of how he had himself put giovanni's body in its coffin telling her of his own great grief which however he says must be far less than hers he describes the funeral at mantua and with a fine touch of sympathy for the desolate wife speaks of how the women gazed from the windows with awe and reverence upon the honored form of him who was your husband signora and my lord maria replies by a striking letter dignified and sensible saying what a comfort it had been to her throughout the campaign to feel that he was with her husband and then she urges him to write the history of her husband's life suggesting that he shall write the history of its last fourteen years and she with the help of her father will write that of the first fourteen years and she ends by a request that he will commend myself and my poor cosimo to the marquis of mantua who has been so kind reading these letters of maria's it is hard to realize that it is all so long ago we feel that it might have happened yesterday here as so often we feel how much closer the sixteenth century is to us than e g the eighteenth for the next ten years fifteen twenty seven to fifteen thirty seven i e during the three years of the revolt of florence from pope clement the year of the siege and the reign of alessandro as duke maria salviati lived in the greatest retirement at trebia in the mugello about twenty miles from florence devoting herself to the education of her son cosimo the only occasion on which she came out of this retirement was in fifteen thirty three when as catherine de medici's nearest relative she accompanied the latter to marseilles for her marriage maria lived this retired life for two reasons not only was she very badly off most of her patrimony having been absorbed by her husband's military necessities but also she lived in constant fear for her son now that the elder branch had no legitimate male descendant knowing well that both pope clement and alessandro were utterly unscrupulous and looked with no friendly eye on one whose existence might be supposed to be an obstacle to alessandro's being ruler of florence the only other male representative of the younger branch besides her son was lorenzino and alessandro knew that the latter possessed no influence and would never set up any claim to the rule of florence 
but it might be otherwise with the son of giovanni della bandanere to whom his father's name and reputation would give plenty of adherence not that maria had any desire at all that such claims should be put forward on behalf of her son her gallant soldier's death ended all life for her and she felt a complete repugnance for all the strivings of ambition and worldly honours she became a member of the third order of st dominic giving herself up to charitable works and she kept her son out of sight of florence and its affairs training him to take pleasure in field sports and a country life and secluding him so effectually as far as florence was concerned that the mass of the citizens scarcely knew that such a youth existed the poverty to which she had been reduced is shown by a letter of hers written in fifteen thirty to filippo strozzi the wealthy banker and head of the strozzi family who was one of her creditors she says magnificent and much respected sir we are my son and i to that degree impoverished and broken down not only by private debts but by those due to the government that we are in a desperate position unless we can find some one who will assist us until we can get breathing time we therefore suppliantly entreat your magnificence that if the other creditors press and crush us as you will have the more pity on us and as you have had from us two hundred ducats up to this time that you will be content to bear with us for this year i declare to you on my faith that it is impossible for us to do more and i will use every effort to meet you in such a manner as you will find satisfactory at the end of the time named i implore and beseech your excellency and with all my heart beg of you not to deny us this favour for should you decide otherwise and determine on pressing us i know of no means of meeting your claim we will not the less strive our utmost to put together another two hundred ducats within this year if it be any way possible and if you will not have patience with us for the entire debt our gratitude will be greater should you give us one year's time for the whole sum yet it will be no less if you will content yourself with the two hundred ducats i will say no more save that cosimo and i commend ourselves earnestly to your magnificence your cousin and sister maria salviati de medici at length when maria had been a widow for ten years and when her son cosimo was seventeen and a half years old there occurred in january fifteen thirty seven duke alessandro's sudden assassination whereupon her son suddenly and without consulting her made his bold bid for power his mother liked neither the thing itself nor his methods and endeavoured to persuade him to abandon the course on which he had embarked which greatly enraged him and the cruelty which a few months later he displayed against those who had opposed him still more deeply pained his gentle-spirited and high-minded mother strengthening her strong disapproval of his whole course of action this caused a complete estrangement between them from the time he became duke of florence he never went near her and she suffered many things from his harsh and unlovely disposition on her son becoming head of the state she removed from trebia to the villa at castello where her husband had lived as a boy and there resided during the remaining six years of her life seldom seeing any one and devoting herself to religion and good works her son's conduct was the last drop of sadness in a life which had always been sad while we are told that cosimo displayed towards her such an utter want of affection that even when she was lying ill at the villa of castello and he was shooting in the vicinity he could hardly be persuaded to relinquish the pleasures of the chase for a single day to visit her on her deathbed. a few days later her gentle spirit passed away maria salviati died at castello in fifteen forty three sixteen years after her son became duke of florence and was buried dressed in the habit of the third order of st dominic in after years her remains were removed from their first resting-place to be laid beside those of her husband when brought from mantua when the medici coffins were opened in eighteen fifty seven her body was found unimpaired her coffin bore only her simple name maria 
she and giovanni della bandanere lie side by side in the centre of the crypt of the great family mausoleum with round them their descendants the grand dukes and grand duchesses princes and princesses of tuscany end of section twenty two section twenty three of the medici volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bill chapter twenty four cosimo the first born fifteen nineteen reigned fifteen thirty seven to fifteen seventy four created grand duke of tuscany fifteen sixty nine died fifteen seventy four when on the fifth of january fifteen eighty seven alessandro's sudden death took place all was for some days in great confusion since uh, the signora having been abolished Florence was left by the Duke's death without any government. Moreover, there were none left on whom it devolved to form one. Pope Clement the Seventh, Ippolito, and now Alessandro were all dead. No male descendant of the eldest branch of the Medici family remained. Neither the Strocci, Guicciardini, Ridolfi, nor any other family in Florence felt themselves capable of assuming the place which had been taken by the, the Medici. While the reigning Pope, Paul III, had no particular interest in Florentine affairs, so that there seemed no reason why Florence should not reinstate her republic, and as those in charge of the fortresses were ready to agree to it, every thing appeared to point to this course it was however not adopted the council called the forty eight still nominally existed though under alessandro it had no power and whilst its leading members were discussing the situation and before anything definite had been decided upon there appeared in florence from the district of mugello an almost unknown youth of seventeen cosimo son of giovanni della bandenere accompanied by one or two attendants failing lorenzino himself who had fled and made no claim to the rule this youth was supposing a republic was not going to be set up rightfully heir to the succession while from one point of view his claim might be considered superior to any which could be put forward on behalf of lorenzino in that his mother being a granddaughter of lorenzo the magnificent both branches of the medici united in him this youth by his artful assumption of a humble demeanour but the little that was known of him seemed to indicate that he was not likely to take a prominent part in affairs of state and by his promises that if he were appointed to the rule all power should remain in the hands of the council induced the chief senators to accept him as his head of state we are told that he concealed his ambition under so humble and submissive demeanour as to provoke the contempt of his friends the four principal senators guicciardini strozzi valori and acciajolli were completely taken in and chosen with the idea that he was a youth of little character whose interests chiefly centred in shooting and field sports and that he would be a non-entity and would leave them to rule the country accordingly he was elected as chief of state it being definitely laid down that all power was to rest with the council a base relief for showing this episode is to be seen on the pedestal of the equestrian statue of cosimo the first and the piazza della signoria 
and very faithfully reproduces an unassuming attitude, which was adopted by Cosimo. Thus did Francesco Gocciardini, Filippo Strozzi, Pacchio Valori, and Niccolò Acciagiolli, in order to obtain their own personal ends, deliver over their country to an iron-handed tyrant, Guicciardini, the chief of them, mainly so acting because he had hoped that Cosimo would marry his daughter Isabetta, and that he, Guicciardini, would rule Florence while the young head of the state amused himself. They all had a bitter cause, in a very short time, to repent their action. Simultaneously with this election, a decree was, at Cosimo's request, passed by the council, putting the whole of Lorenzino's branch out of the succession in consequence of his murder of Alessandro, Cosimo pointing out that this was advisable in order to make his position unimpeachable. No sooner, however, was Cosimo installed as chief of the state than he threw off the mask which he had worn. He cast all these counsellors aside, assumed absolute authority, and showed himself in his true colours as an arbitrary tyrant who intended to rule by fear. He soon became the most dreaded man in Florence. Of course, such an entire reversal of all that had been contemplated was bound to issue in a struggle. Before many months were over, Cosimo's tyrannical actions had driven a large number of citizens into voluntary exile, including Filippo Strozzi and Bacchio Valori. And by the end of the summer 1537, these Fuoluos had ensembled an army to dethrone him, for which purpose they had also gained the help of a considerable body of French troops. The main portion of these forces consisted of 4,000 infantry and 300 cavalry, commanded by Filippo Strozzi's eldest son, Piero Strozzi, already a distinguished soldier. Meanwhile, Cosimo had also got together a force, and by representing himself as the successor of the Emperor's vassal Alessandro, had obtained the assistance of the imperial troops in Tuscany. His whole force was under the command of Alessandro Vitelli. The battle to decide the fate of Tuscany was fought at Monte Muerio, which is now overly forgotten place, near Prato, on the 1st August, 1537. It resulted in Vitelli's gaining a victory, which saved Cosimo, and delivered all his opponents into his hands. Vitelli's success was chiefly due to a fortunate accident. The body of troops attacked by him were, in reality, only the advanced guard of the enemy's force, their main body under Piero Strozzi being away at a distance in the mountains. But with the body defeated by Vitelli were Filippo Strozzi, Bacchio Valori, and all the principal men of the party opposed to Cosimo, all of whom were captured. The main body of Piero Strozzi only heard of the defeat of the troops at Monte Muello with the capture of all the leaders, when the battle was over, and was too late to do anything. And Piero Strozzi had no course but to retire. The column, which stands in the Piazza Sant'Trinita, surrounded by a fine figure of justice, was erected by Cosimo to commemorate the victory of Montemuello, which gave him his throne. Of all the buildings in Florence, one possesses a more solemn interest than any of them. Interest of the same kind as attaches to the Tower of London, namely the gloomy citadel of the Bargello. 
terrible have been the scenes which its courtyard the place of execution and surrounding cells have witnessed piteous the cries with which its torture chamber now the armory which is the only obliette in florence has resounded heartbreaking the grief endured in the open loggia of looking the courtyard where so many bitter wrongs have had their cruel ending none can climb its picturesque staircase or traverse its halls insensible to the tragic memories which cling round this ancient fortress of podesta of florence where so many who were notable have taken their last look on life and the victories of montemuelo added many sad memories which attached to the bargalello for cosimo who had set up a despotism no less severe than that of the kings of england and france of that time and to be consigned to the bargello was apt to be fatal to the person concerned as to be committed to the tower or to the bastille the prisoners taken at montemuello were very numerous and of high rank for there were scarcely one of the leading families of florence which had not some member among them or a florentine student at bologna or padua who had not joined filippo strozzi and baccio valoardi in this attempt many of them were quite young and not a few were cosimo's personal friends but they received no mercy for in cosimo that quality was non-existent the cells of the bargello were crowded with prisoners of distinction and when the bargello could hold no more the remainder were sent to the forteza the prisoners were executed in batches day after day while the halls rang the cries of the tortured not one was pardoned all were in turn first tortured then executed Bazio valori and his son the young albizzi were among those put to death at the borgello filippo strozzi confined in irony in the forteza to build which he had provided the funds was either put to death here or committed suicide to escape further torture his body being found in his cell transfixed with the sword thus ended the rich handsome and accomplished courtier and banker filippo strozzi the husband of clarice de medici and friend of popes and kings to whom only seven years before cosimo's mother had written that humble petition on behalf of cosimo and herself for time in which to pay debt cosimo confiscated the strozzi palace in the via tornabuoni and the whole of filippo strozzi's possessions piedlo il gottoso seventy years before had contrived to put down an armed rebellion against himself without the sacrifice of a single life cosimo the first seemed anxious to create the greatest contrast possible for of all the enemies who fell into his hands he did not spare a single life no wonder that maria salviati looking with horror on these proceedings of her son which she was powerless to prevent shut herself in deepest seclusion at the villa of castello cosimo was in fact a most unusual character neither his mother nor any of those around him to the age of seventeen were not the least prepared for the action which he then suddenly took the bold stroke which he seized upon the rule of florence astounded maria salviati and was as great a revelation of character to her as to every one else how completely he had contrived to hide his real nature from all those who knew him as a boy is shown by the case of filippo strozzi who though he had been on intimate terms with him and his mother while they resided at trebia 
was nonetheless as much taken in as other senators. Cosimo is perhaps the only instance of record of a boy hitherto occupying an obscure position, giving up to sport and a country life, and thought to have little capacity, and suddenly casting aside every boyish haste, undertaking the arduous labors of government, seizing the rule of his country from her wisest and ablest men, and slaughtering wholesale her lady citizens. But although Cosimo thus showed himself a cruel and merciless tyrant, in his subsequent history he manifested extraordinary abilities, which results for which his country had every reason to be grateful. It is indeed little short of marvellous how one who, silent and taciturn by nature, had in his youth been considered dull, timid, and wanting in character, yet developed the capacity to raise Tuscany to the highest pitch of political importance and general well-being which she ever reached. Tuscany, which ever since the time of Lorenzo the Magnificent, under the successive male administration of Cedarini Lorenzo, Duke of Urbino, Pasarini, the Republican government of 1527 to 1530, and Alessandro, had over 40 years possessed little or no political importance in Italy, was by Cosimo I raised to a higher position in this respect among the states of Italy than she had occupied even in the time of lorenzo the magnificent the glory of the leadership in art and learning was no longer hers the joy and brightness of the renaissance were forever passed away overwhelmed in the wars for which for more than a generation had raged over italy but in so far as the remaining factors of political influence military strength and commercial progress were concerned. Cosimo I raised Tuscany, not merely to her former level, but beyond it, so much so that she became under him the only state of first-class importance in Italy. Cosimo, Pater, Patria, and Lorenzo the Significant had gloried in advancing the boundaries of the state, but under Cosimo I, Tuscany was almost doubled in size, while at the same time the conditions in regard to the administration of justice and the general advancement of the country were changed from these customary in the Middle Ages to those thought necessary in modern times. And Cosimo did all this by himself. For his principle was to avoid taking any counsellors, and throughout his life those whom he employed to assist him were nothing more than secretaries. None were given a sufficient power of initiative for the names of obtained any record in history. They were invariably men of a humble station of, in life, and always chosen from other parts of the country than Florence. As soon as Cosimo had, uh, by the victory of Montemurlo and the execution of all who had opposed him, firmly secured his power, he set about arrangements for that gradual advancement of his position, which he had set before him. As yet he had merely been elected by the Florentines as head of their state, so that his first step was to endow her to obtain formal recognition of his position by the emperor, representing himself as willing to be the emperor's vassal and ready to promote his cause. In every way against the French interests in Italy, he obtained what he sought, the emperor issuing a diploma which conferred on Cosimo all the authority formerly borne and exercised by Duke Alessandro. And though the diploma did not categorically confer on Cosimo the title of Duke, the latter from this time forth always signed himself Duca di Fiorenza, to which no exception was taken by the emperor. In this connection it is interesting to notice that in the rooms lately reopened on the upper floor of the Palazzo Vecchio, 
over the 16th century fireplace. In Cosimo's room, his title is seen to be inscribed as Cosimo's Fleuria Dux II, showing that at this time in his life, previous to his obtaining the status of Grand Duke, making him Cosimo I, he called himself a Dux II, the second Duke of Florence, the first being Alessandro. Cosimo's next step was to sit about arrangements for marriage, such as would contribute to the strength of his position. He first endowed strenuously to get the emperor to give him his daughter Margaret, Alessandro's young widow. But this Charles I absolutely refused to do, while at the same time insisting on Cosimo's making over to Margaret a very large portion of the Medici property, much to Cosimo's indignation. This first matrimonial project having failed, the latter turned elsewhere, and in 1539 it succeeded in arranging a marriage for himself with Eleanor, the only child of Don Pedro di Toledo, Marquis of Villa Francais and the viceroy of Naples, the most capable and trusted of all the emperor's lieutenants, who ruled the kingdom of Naples from 1532 to his death in 1553. Eleanor di Toledo was escorted to Florence by Don Pedro himself, and they were met by Cosimo at the villa of Poggio Acciano, 15 miles from Florence. The viceroy of Naples and his suit were lodged during the stay in Florence in the monastery of Santa Maria Novella. And after many festivities, Cosimo and Eleonora were married with much ceremony in the church of San Lorenzo, he being then twenty and she seventeen. Eleonora was very rich, and her wealth, together with the political influence which Cosimo gained by becoming the son-in-law of the viceroy of Naples, made a considerable difference in his position. The portrait of Eleonora by Bronzino on the wall of one of the rooms in the Palazzo Vecchio shows her as she was at about the age of twenty. Two or three years later, after her marriage, she has a fine, broad forehead and a pleasing face. End of section 23 Recording by Bill